Prelude The plain of Gehenna was a bleak and oppressive realm, hostile to mortal life. It was a world built upon a vast, unending mountainside, sloping steeply always, never reaching a bottom or a summit. Gouts of steam erupted from the mountainside, and rivers of lava flowed across it, sizzling through long cataracts, collecting in bubbling pools. Such was the domain of Behal, murderous god of death. A seething, angry god, Behal thrived on bloody, violent acts. He grew in strength as his worshippers spread across the worlds, slaying in his horrible name. Behal sought vengeance. A minion of the god had been killed nearly one mortal year ago, but an eye blinked to the god. Kasgaroth was neither Bahal's most powerful servant nor his most favored, but he was slain by a mortal, and the man who dared strike a minion of Bahal's might as well strike at the god himself. The bloodlust of the god began as a simple hatred, a desire to see this mortal and those who aided the man slain. Behal anticipated their deaths with grisly pleasure. But the man was a prince, and he was the beloved of a druid. His woman carried her own power, and she served a goddess who was foreign, and thus hateful to Behal. And so Behal's need for vengeance evolved and grew into something far more terrible than any plot for murder. The prince was a leader of his land, and the druid was a caretaker of that land. It seemed fitting to Bahal that not only the mortals, but their land itself, should die. The god had a powerful tool for wreaking this vengeance. Bahal's minion, Kasgaroth, though slain, was not entirely gone. One fragment of the beast, its heart, remained, clutched desperately by one of its former servants. Behal took careful note of the heart of Kasgaroth. He would have a use for it soon. Yes, he decided, the land of these mortals would become a land of death, a nation ruled by the dead, over the dead. No living thing would mar it. Thus was dealt the vengeance of Behal. Enter! The assassin looked around sharply, but could not see the source of the hissing voice. Nevertheless, the stone wall before him slipped open, revealing a corridor even blacker than the surrounding night. Muttering a curse, the assassin entered and disappeared into inky darkness. In his silk shirt and trousers, he slipped along without a whisper. His soft leather boots gliding silently over the smooth stone floor. All around him, the sprawling vastness of Ker Kaladir lay dark and slumbering. The assassin walked cautiously into one of the castle's towers. He saw blackness, a deep and unnatural gloom. Then he heard a soft snapping of fingers, and the darkness dissipated. But it did not exactly grow light, the effect was more a relief of blackness. Faint rays of moonlight spilled through narrow windows high in the walls, and he could vaguely make out the council. The seven sat around a long, U-shaped table. They faced the assassin, their table open before him like the jaws of some beast. Deep, cowled hoods concealed the faces. The assassin looked up at them and clamped his teeth together. He could scarcely repress a shudder of revulsion. The one in the center he knew was Sindri. The master of the wizards confirmed his identity, his gentle voice belying the terrible powers at his command. You were careless about that task in Moray. King Dinegal's daughter survived long enough to provide a description of your men. The assassin sniffed loudly through his broad nose. The guards were more numerous than you led me to expect. 
We had to kill several dozen of them, and the nursemaid hid the baby in an attic. It took us hours to dig out the little brat. I lost two good men, and the mission was a success. The Dinegal line is ended, as I ended the royal line of Snowdown for you last year. The assassin punctuated his statement with a low, inhuman growl. I do not expect such sloppiness for the coin I am paying," said the great wizard quietly. "Even your mother, the orc, could have done better." The insult was too much. A dagger flashed from the assassin's sleeve. Faster than the eye could follow, it flicked toward the wizard's unarmored breast. The others gasped in surprise, flinching at the sudden attack. But Sindri merely raised a finger and quietly spoke a word. Instantly, only a foot from its target, the dagger was transformed. In its place, a large bat fluttered upward, turning to lunge at the assassin's throat. Another dagger flashed, but this one remained in the assassin's hand. He casually spitted the bat upon the thin blade and flicked the carcass to the tabletop before Sindri. He could sense Sindri's eyes upon him, boring from the depths of his hood. For a moment, the room remained frozen, the wizards intent upon their leader. The assassin stood stock still before the table. The black wizard gestured casually, and the dead bat instantly disappeared. A smooth, amused chuckle emerged from the dark hood. And the tension in the room slowly drained away. Now, Rasfalo, continued the wizard, his voice as pleasant as ever. You will soon be free to return to Kalimshan. However, one more king upon the moonshades threatens the dominance of our liege. You will take your band to Care Corwell. The prince of that realm is something of a local hero, and he is a menace to our ambitions. The cleric Hobarth has warned us that we must act quickly, for the prince has a beloved who is equally dangerous. You are to kill them, and the king as well. The fee will be twice your usual. Thrice, if you can return the prince's sword to Care Caladir. Above all else, this prince must die. Chapter One: A Druid of Mirlock Vale. Let's go swimming now, can't we, Robin? It's so hot, and we've been working so hard. You mean I've been working so hard," said the young woman, pausing to push a sweat-soaked strand of black hair back from her face. "All you've done is get in the way." Her companion, a two-foot-long orange dragon that buzzed like a hummingbird around her, turned his scaly snout away in momentary indignation. "Besides, Newt," Robin continued. I've got to sort out this tangle of vines before we do anything else. They seem to grow thicker every day. I don't know how Jen attended this entire grove by herself. Once again, she pried the vines away from the trunk with a heavy stick, grasping one and pulling it free from the ground. She tossed the vine onto a pile of its fellows, destined for an evening fire. Why do you have to sort these stupid old vines anyway? The dragon sulked. Let them grow the way they want to, and let us go swimming the way we want to. I've told you a hundred times, Newt. This is the sacred grove of the great druid of Gwyneth, and she is training me in the ways of our order. Part of my training is to obey her instructions and to aid in caring for the grove. The explanation sounded a little hollow, even to Robin, who had, for nearly a year, dutifully followed the instructions of her aunt and tutor, Jenna Moonsinger. 
Today was not the first time the great druid had rested peacefully in the shady comfort of the cottage, while her erstwhile student toiled away in the summer heat. Still, Robin was a devout pupil. She paused and drew a deep breath, relaxing as she exhaled. She repeated the process as her teacher had shown her, and soon she felt the annoyance pass away. Robin turned again to the thick vines that threatened to strangle the trunk of an ancient oak. She even felt guilty about her doubts. Jenna always works so hard, she reminded herself. She certainly deserves the rest. Robin's job was near the periphery of the enchanted area that was the great druid's grove. Near her were the tall hedges that bordered much of the grove, and she was surrounded by massive oaks. Closer to the heart of the grove sprawled a wondrous garden and its placid pond, and within these areas stood Jenna's simple cottage. Behind the cottage stood the grove's dominant physical feature, and also its spiritual heart, the moon well. The deep pool was surrounded by a ring of tall stone columns covered in bright green moss. The tops of several pairs of pillars were capped with stone cross pieces raised by the earth power of great druids in ages past. It was to learn the secrets of this earth power that Robin studied her craft so diligently. She had proven, both to herself and to her teacher, that she had the innate talent to perform druid magic. This was the legacy of the mother she had never known. Inherited power was one thing. It was another matter to learn the skills and discipline necessary to control that power. Robin pulled on a thick root, bending it away from the trunk until it snapped free. She tossed it onto the pile and grasped another tendril with a hand that had grown strong and calloused during her training. That vine, too, came reluctantly away from the oak tree, but it required most of her strength to pull against the tension of the plant. Well, I'll help, too, if that's what it'll take to get done with this. Here, I'll pull on this one and you grab that. No, cried Robin, but before she could stop him, the little dragon had seized a loose end of vine and pulled it with a strength that belied his small size. The vine she had so carefully untangled burst free and instantly twisted back around the tree trunk. The springing mass of vines caught the fairy dragon in their coils, pinning him against the tree. A short, wriggling stretch of red tail and a tiny clawed foot stuck from the tangle of vines. That serves you right, she chided him as she began to pull the vines from the tree once again. You should pay attention to what you're doing. Newt finally forced his head from the tangle and shook it quickly. That's the last time I try to help you. He huffed as he crawled free. Flexing his gossamer wings, he buzzed into the air and hovered before her. Why don't you just use your magic on these vines and be done with the job? He asked, eyeing the tree belligerently. The tending of the grove is a matter for a druid's hands and heart, replied Robin, reciting one of her lessons. The grove is the source of her magic and thus cannot be maintained with it or the magic would lose its potency. I should think it would be very boring to do all these studies and silly jobs day after day, forever and ever. Don't you miss Tristan? And don't you ever want to go home? Robin caught her breath sharply, for the questions were painful ones. She had come to the Vale nearly a year before, and had had no contact with her previous home. Jenna insisted that such diligence was the only way Robin could properly develop her skills. She thought carefully before answering, more for her own benefit than Newt's. I miss him very much. More each day, it seems. 
and I want to be with him. Perhaps someday I will be. But for now I must learn what I can of the order of the Druids, find out for myself if I am destined to serve as my mother did and my aunt does, as a Druid of the Isles. This is something I have to do, and if Jenna tells me that the only way I will learn is by performing mundane tasks around her grove, then so be it. Of course, Newt said nonchalantly. Tristan's probably got plenty to do at Care Corwell anyway. Festivals and hunts, all those pretty country lasses and barmaids. I don't imagine for a minute that a prince of the Fafolk would waste his hot summer afternoon in a cool alehouse, of course. But just supposing he... Oh, shut up! exclaimed Robin, more harshly than she intended. Newt had an uncanny ability to aggravate her. She did miss Tristan, but she reminded herself she was doing the right thing by following in the footsteps of the mother she had never known, the mother that had left her a book and a staff as proof of her druidic legacy. Wasn't she? She remembered the sense of awe and wonder with which she had opened her mother's book. Only a year ago. It had been given to her by her stepfather, King Kendrick of Corwell, Tristan's father. Through its pages, Robin had begun to understand the nature of the work she was capable of doing. She saw that she had the power to serve the goddess, Earth Mother, and to use druidic magic to maintain the balance of nature in the islands that were her home. Now, she recalled the smooth ashwood staff, plain and unadorned, that had nonetheless become her most treasured possession. Crafted by her mother's own hands, it was both a receptacle and a tool for the earth power of druidic magic. Not only had it saved her life, but it had been instrumental in rescuing the kingdom itself from the terror of the Dark Walker. Now it stayed safely within the great druid's cottage, awaiting her need. Wistfully, she wondered about her mother, as she did so often. Her aunt Jenna had described her to Robin in such detail that she now seemed completely familiar. Sometimes Robin felt as though she had indeed known her mother. As always, a great sadness washed over her, at the thought that she would never truly know the woman who had brought her into the world. A sudden sound, the snapping of a dry twig, cracked through her thoughts, and Robin froze. She knew every creature that visited the grove, and none of them would make such a careless noise. Even Grunt, the cantankerous brown bear who lived with them in the grove, moved his bulk silently among the plants. The cracking was repeated, and Robin located its source in a clump of bushes behind her. A sharp prickle of fear ran along her spine, and she reached for the stout stick, leaning against a nearby stump. Slowly, she turned. The bushes rustled, indicating that a large creature was moving toward her. Suddenly, they parted to reveal the staggering figure of a man. At least she thought it was a man. The shaggy, matted hair and beard, the filthy, spindly limbs, and the dazed, sunken eyes looked more beastly than human. The creature shuffled forward like an ape, clad only in a tattered rag tied with a crude belt. But a sound croaked from an unmistakably human throat as the figure collapsed on the ground at her feet. The boat's slim prow slipped through the black waters of Corwell Firth. The boat blended perfectly into the moonless night, as did the eight cloaked figures within. Each of them used a narrow paddle to move the craft away from a huge galleon that sat quietly in Corwell Harbor. The port was silent, for the hour was past midnight. No splashing disturbed the boat's graceful movement, 
as it glided slowly toward the overhanging protection of a high pier. Here, six paddles were withdrawn into the boat, while the remaining two pushed the narrow craft carefully between the pilings. The shadowy figures lashed the boat to the pilings. One after another, they sprang to the pier and slipped quietly onto shore. The figures moved carefully up the street of Corwell Town, darting from building to building with perfect stealth. The leader of the group, taller and stockier than the rest, paused to let the others pass while he watched for any sign of danger. A silken black mask concealed the face of each of them, but this one pulled his aside to peer more effectively through the darkness. While manlike, he was not a man. A broad nose with wide, flared nostrils spread across his face, and his teeth were gleaming and sharp. Quickly, he pulled his mask into place and slipped after his band. Tristan Kendrick, Prince of Corwell, was a little drunk. Perhaps more than a little, he decided, as a swelling of nausea rose within his stomach. His head hurt and he wanted to go to bed, all of which made this argument seem that much more unpleasant. You don't act like a prince. You don't look like a prince. You'll never be fit to be a king of the folk. His father's harsh voice boomed behind him and cut through Tristan's weariness. The prince whirled to face the king. A year ago, I routed an army of Northmen from these very walls. He growled, resisting the urge to shout. I fought the beast that stood within our courtyard. Father, I even found the sword of Simric Hugh. Tristan gestured at the mighty weapon, hanging in its place of honor above the hearth, crossed with his father's favorite boar spear. The sword was a treasured relic of his people and had been missing for centuries, until he and his friends had discovered it in the depths of a furball glare. All deeds very fine and heroic and dramatic, the king sneered. You've enjoyed the adulation of the ladies and the drinks of the aleman on those merits. But there is more to being a king than heroism. What do you know of our law, of the administration of this realm? Could you sit in judgment over shepherds who argued about a shared pasture, or fishermen who quarreled over rights to a birth? Until you change this, you are not fit to rule. You know the customs. You can only be granted the kingship if a majority of the lords think you capable. I doubt they would. Were the vote taken tomorrow? Tristan clenched his hands into fists, and for a moment he was so angry he could scarcely keep from striking his father. He walked away in frustration, finally flopping heavily into the largest chair in the study. Already the fog of alcohol was dissipating. But his father would not abandon the attack. It's amazing that the houndmaster even got you home he said scornfully. And where is Dareth now? Probably in bed. But leave Dareth out of this. He's my friend, and I will not allow you to insult him. Ever since Robin left to study with her aunt, you've been acting like a brooding puppy one minute and a drunken buffoon the next. I love her. She's gone, and nothing seems to matter except the next time I can see her face. By the goddess, I miss her. I don't even know if she'll ever come back. What if she decides to spend her life in the woods, tending some moonwell of the veil? The king stalked around the chair to face his son, and the prince forced himself to meet his father's gaze. And what if she does? That is her privilege, and perhaps her responsibility. But you wouldn't know about that, would you? Responsibility has never... 
Father, I have decided to go to Mirlock Vale and visit Robin. I will leave as soon as I can prepare. Tristan interrupted bluntly. He had contemplated the idea several days earlier, but had not had the courage to tell the king. At least, he thought, this argument had given him that fortitude. That is exactly what I mean. You... Perhaps you're right about me, Tristan interrupted, leaning back to look at his father. After the adventures of last summer, the thought of spending my days cooped up. Suddenly, the door to the study crashed inward with a wood-splintering slam. Tristan saw his father's eyes focus on the door, and then the king pushed wildly at the back of Tristan's chair. The prince heard several clicks and felt some sort of missile whir past his head before his chair crashed backward onto the floor. The wind exploded from his lungs, and a cold shock of panic washed over him, driving the last vestiges of alcohol from his mind. Instantly, Tristan rolled from the chair, watching a silver dagger flash over his head from where he lay on the floor. He saw his father pluck a slender dart from his own shoulder, then pick up a wooden chair to block the attack of a charging black figure. Tristan sprang to his feet in time to meet another black figure face to face. The face was covered by a terrifying black mask, and the body was cloaked all over in black silk. But Tristan's eyes focused on the gleaming dagger that seemed to reach forward, questing for his blood. Desperately, the prince looked around for a weapon, at the same time remembering his sword hanging ten feet away. A low table separated him from the hearth. Tristan fainted a lunge at his attacker and then dropped prone to roll under the table and spring to his feet. The attacker leaped over the table at the same time and his dagger cut a bloody nick in the prince's ear. Tristan drew the weapon and continued the motion through a full turn, driving the point deep into the attacker's chest before the intruder could strike again. Tristan saw his father stumble backward as another black-cloaked figure burst through the door. Behind that one were several others. The prince kicked a chair into the path of his new attacker, slowing him enough that he could pull the king's boar spear from its place above the mantle. Father! He cried, tossing the stout weapon sideways across the room. Tristan leaped over the chair he had toppled, certain that the figure before him, armed with two daggers, was no match for the gleaming sword of Simric But one of those daggers clashed into his blade, nearly knocking it from his hand. Only by stumbling backward did the prince prevent the weapons from driving into his bowels. As it was, a dagger cut a burning streak across his abdomen. Even more frightening than the nearly fatal blow was the deep, rumbling growl that emerged from behind the silken mask. Although the other attackers had seemed human, the one before him was stockier and smellier than a man. The creature attacked with savage intensity, forcing Tristan back against the fireplace with a dazzling series of blows. Each slash and thrust was accompanied by a bestial snarl. The prince found himself desperately wanting a look behind the black mask, to assure himself that this creature was indeed flesh and blood, and not some demon conjured from a drunken nightmare. Grimacing, Tristan drove his sword against the foe, struggling to gain room to maneuver. Once again, the intruder forced him off balance with lightning-fast cuts and lunges. The prince whirled away from the hearth, catching his breath, as he saw his father driving the boar spear into the chest of the other attacker. The king fell on top of the enemy, and the pair lay motionless on the floor. Tristan's attacker surprised him by suddenly dropping to the floor. In a flash, the prince remembered the men at the door, and in the same instant, 
he fell prone, sensing the whirring passage of deadly missiles over his head. Then Tristan scrambled to his feet and sprang toward the foe. At the same time, he heard a scream of pain from the doorway. Apparently, the growling attacker was equally startled, for his masked face turned to the door in surprise. The prince almost caught the creature with the point of his sword, but he looked back at the last minute and sprang to his feet with cat-like speed. Even so, the tip of Tristan's blade struck a glancing blow against the thing's head, tearing the silken mask away in the process. The prince stared for a second at the snarling face. The creature looked a cross between a man and a beast. His body and features were human-like, but his widespread maw was studded with fangs, and his close-set eyes looked hellishly intense and bloodshot. Another cry of pain shrieked from the doorway, accompanied now by growls. The prince saw one of the attackers there stagger into the room, a huge hound biting his neck in a deadly vice. He caught a glimpse of a flashing scimitar, driving a third bowman against the wall. Dareth! The loyal hound master skilled at combat and stealth must have heard the disturbance. With his blade helping, Tristan thought, the fighting odds looked more favorable. Dareth leaped into the room, past the great dog that was just raising his head from the gored body. Abruptly, Dareth froze, his darkly handsome features gaping in shock. Razfallow, he finally said, his voice tight. Tristan's foe had also paused at the sight of the hound master. So, callous shite, this is where you have run to, he snarled. You did not expect to hide from me forever, did you? I don't need to hide any more, muttered Dareth, advancing slowly in a crouch, especially from a killer of children. The monster chuckled, and then, before Tristan could react, he flicked one of his daggers straight at Dareth's heart. The silver scimitar moved very slightly, however, to knock the weapon harmlessly to the ground. Razfallow obviously sensed that the battle was lost. Before Tristan could react, he sprang to the window, thirty feet above the courtyard. He turned once to stare at the prince, hate spilling almost palpably from those crimson eyes, and then he leaped into the darkness. Guards! shouted the prince, racing to the window. Intruder in the courtyard! Take him alive! Already the black figure had disappeared into the night. But the cry of alarm was taken up throughout the castle. Turning, Tristan saw Dareth gently cradling the king's head. The great moorhound Canthus stood next to him, gently nuzzling the still form. The only wound upon Tristan's father was the little pinprick, barely bleeding in his shoulder. Nevertheless, the hound master looked at the prince with deep pain and shock in his eyes. The king of Corwell is dead. Like all of the gods, Bahal communicated his will to his worshippers via his clerics, priests, priestesses, holy or unholy people. These clerics drew their strength from their gods and many were capable of feats of magic rivaling those of the mightiest wizards. As a powerful god, Bahal numbered a great many clerics among his faithful. It so happened that one of the most powerful of these was on the moonshays. This one would serve his purpose now. Bahal decided, slowly upon a scheme. It would entertain him, and it could enhance his status among all of the gods of the realms. It was a complex plan, but he had numerous willing hands to aid him. To start, he would send the cleric of the Moonshays a dream. He could regard it as a prophecy or a command. 
In any event, it would be the will of Behal. The cleric, Behal knew, would obey. Chapter 2 The Council of Corwell Lengthening shadows extended the towers of Caer Caladir into needle-like spires that reached ominously across the city of Caladir, and beyond to the waters of Whitefish Bay. Evening brought an end to the bustle and barter of vigorous trade that characterized this, the largest city among the lands of the Fafolk. Night came with its own forms of barter, Sale of the Jinyak weed imported freely from Kalimshan, or even in the darkest of alleys, the trading of young slaves from Amth or Tether. The wizard moved among these alleys, intimately familiar with them. Eventually, after night had fallen completely, he stepped down a stairway into a low cellar, ignoring a slumbering old man who reeked of cheap wine. He pushed through a certain curtain that masked one wall of the cellar and entered a wide, round room. The chamber was illuminated by great pots of hot coals that gave the place a hellishly red glow and kept it uncomfortably warm. A huge skull sat upon an altar in the center of the room. Carved from white marble, it was perhaps four times the size of a human head. Red streaks, which could only have been fresh blood, ran from the eyes of the skull across its cheekbones in a garish caricature of tears. A man stood before this skull, his back to the wizard. The thick robes and cowled hood of the cleric could not conceal his immense size. Slowly, the man turned. Praises to Behal he chanted. Hail the Lord of Death, replied the wizard, in a smooth, incongruously pleasant voice. Have you acted upon my prophecy yet? inquired the huge man, stepping away from the altar with a reverent bow to the skull. Indeed, Hobarth, replied the wizard, I am certain that Raz Fallow and his team will eliminate them shortly. There is more to be done. The woman will not be found at Care Corwell. No matter. I will send Raz Fallow to the farthest corner of the realms if need be. No. Hobart's voice was strong, and he stepped aggressively toward the wizard. I must get her myself. Behal desires her blood to feed his altar. Where is she? Behal has shown me, and only me, where she can be found. I will go after her. And why should the god desire this woman's blood to flow from his sockets? Perhaps Behal desires the victim to be a druid. There are none closer than Gwyneth any more, thanks to you and your counsel. Sindri chuckled wryly. As I recall, you and your god had a hand in the elimination of the druids from Aleron. Now, the Fafolk of Caladir lack any central spiritual guidance. They are ripe to your persuasive efforts. Indeed, agreed Hobarth with a bow to the altar. I wish you success. The earth power of these druids can be vexing, though no match for your own might. Mine is but the strength of Behal, said the cleric. Of course, how thoughtless of me. The wizard turned away so that his companion could not see the thin smile of amusement curling his lips. Clerics, and their idiotic faith. I shall leave tomorrow. This druid will not see the rising of the next full moon. It's like they became invisible, reported Randolph, the young captain of the Castle Guard Company. The bearded warrior, not yet thirty, 
could not keep his voice from choking with frustration. They disappeared into thin air. We killed five, said Tristan. How many could have escaped? There must have been at least two more, insisted the guard, angrily clenching the hilt of his sword. I found three of my men dead in the courtyard or on the wall. One had his throat cut, the other two were stabbed in the back. Quite a proficient band, Tristan muttered bitterly. But what did they want? Why, my father never... His voice choked, and he did not continue. The guard said nothing. He and the prince stood quietly in the shambles of the king's study. Together they looked out the broken window into the courtyard, watching Dawn's slow arrival. In the next room, the king's body lay upon his bed, respectfully placed there by Friar Nolan, the cleric of Corwell Town. King Kendrick would be given a funeral befitting a leader of the Fafolk before being laid to rest in the royal barrow. With growing grief, Tristan tried to accept his father's death. The knowledge did not seem to remain with him. For a time the truth would recede, and then, unexpectedly, would stab at Tristan with greater and greater force. Sometimes the pain was nearly unbearable. "'Where's Dareth?' he finally asked, trying hard to pull himself together. "'He was leading the search,' replied Randolph. Tristan turned to look at the door to his father's room. The captain of the guard started wearily toward the door. Tristan heard the door shut, and then he looked outside again. A whirlwind of thoughts assaulted him. He struggled with guilt and uncertainty. Why had his last moments with his father been angry ones? And what would happen to him, to the kingdom? Now that his father was gone, Tristan began to realize how much he had depended on him. A brooding sense of loneliness threatened to overwhelm him, and he thought wistfully of Robin, so far away. He longed for her presence more desperately than ever. Impatiently, he paced the floor, wishing Dareth would return. Finally, he flopped into a chair and stared into the long dead coals in the fireplace. Practical thoughts pushed through his emotional storm. Messengers had already been dispatched to the cantrip lords of Corwell. These lords would arrive post-haste, and a council to determine the future of Corwell would convene. A new king would be selected. The thought of the pudgy Lord Coart, or the greedy Lord Ponswain, sitting in his father's place, revolted Tristan. Of all the petty leaders of the lands of Corwell, the prince could think of none worthy to sit upon the royal throne, to be his lord. It's my father's place, he thought. Just my father's. Or maybe now. Maybe my own. Angrily, he sprang to his feet, stalking to the window as he realized how dramatically his own feelings had changed in the last few hours. Looking into the orange dawn, Tristan faced the truth that, hours earlier, he had argued vehemently against. He wanted, very much, to be the next king of Corwell. Robin gasped as she knelt beside the frail figure. An unfocused fear prevented her from touching him. As she finally reached forward to turn the man onto his back, his eyes squinted against the sky. He gibbered something that was not even vaguely speech, and she saw that his tongue was swollen and cracked. She quickly grabbed the nearby water flask, pouring a few drops between the man's chapped lips. Don't touch him, Newt warned. He looks dangerous. I don't trust him. For the first time, Robin noticed that the little dragon had dived for cover under a pile of leaves when the stranger arrived. Buried up to the eyeballs, he stared watchfully at the pair of humans. Oh, 
hush, she chastised, pouring more water into the man's gaping mouth. He coughed and choked spasmatically, but eagerly licked the droplets from his lips, straining to raise his head for more. Robin gently moved his head back to the grass, offering him another splash of water. Slowly, the tension seemed to drain from his body, and he closed his eyes. His breathing slowed from frantic panting to a steadier rhythm. After a moment, it seemed that he had fallen asleep. She wished she knew how to aid him. He seemed so frail and weak. At the same time, something about him frightened her. "'Who are you?' she whispered, examining the man. His skin was cracked and dry, as if it had been exposed to extended periods of savage weather. His hair and beard were thin but long. Branches and thorns had tangled them into mats. His fingernails were filthy and worn all the way to the skin. Did he find food by scratching at the ground for roots and grubs? Robin wondered. His only garment was a leather cloak that barely covered his nakedness. A crude fur belt stretched around his waist to hold the cloak. His thin brown hair and beard were long and matted with burrs. But it was his eyes that drew her attention and frightened her. They stared fiercely one moment then darted frantically about like a madman's, driven by some mysterious combination of fear and pain. Robin noticed that the man sprawled at an odd angle, with his hips raised slightly off the ground as if he lay upon a sharp rock. She tried gently to move him, and she discovered that he had a small pouch tied to his belt, concealed by his buttocks beneath the ragged cloak. It was a filthy object, Barely worthy of notice, yet she found her eyes drawn to it, compelled to look at the pouch, and frightened by that compulsion at the same time. Carefully she reached for it, trying to pull the pouch from beneath the man. Her strong fingers felt a hard object, like a fist-sized stone. As soon as she touched it, however, the man sat up, opening his eyes wide. Never had the woman seen such stark panic before. The man screamed, and his voice shocked her ears. It was a piercing, monstrous sound, reminding her of some hulking reptile ready to strike. But then he scuttled away from her like a crab, clutching the pouch to his breast. Robin jumped up at the same time, stunned at the man's reaction. But then she held her hands up and gestured that she would not touch the stranger's possession. But what could this man be carrying that was of such incredible value? Come with me, she said quietly. I'll take you to a place where you can rest and eat. Slowly Robin reached for the man's arm, helping him stagger to his feet. He was very weak, swaying drunkenly. He certainly would have fallen if not for Robin's supporting arms. He weighed little, however, and she had no difficulty holding him upright. Newt crept out of the leaves and buzzed warily behind. Carefully she led him through the grove among the broad oak boles. They approached a vast tangle of brush beside the ring of stone arches that marked the moon well. As Robin approached the clump, its thickly intertwined branches parted silently, creating a rounded arch that was slightly higher than her head, and revealing the tangle as a ring of brush, not a solid clump. Within the ring, she could see the tiny building that was the great druid's cottage. With its thatched roof and vine-covered walls, it looked like it had sprouted from the ground itself. Robin stopped abruptly, remembering that her teacher was taking a well-deserved nap. She decided to tell Jenna about the stranger after she awakened. For now, she could tend to the man herself. Come this way, she said, changing course, through these trees. 
she led him between sheltering aspens into a shaded area of lush grasses and soft flowers. You can rest in the bower. She helped the man into the meadow, leaning against a sturdy aspen to rest. A sudden growl erupted behind her, and she whirled, nearly dropping the stranger, to see a small mountain of brown fur rise from the grass. A huge creature snarled and bared its white fangs in annoyance. The man cried out in fright and shrank against the tree trunk. His eyes nearly popped from his head at the sight of the huge bear. Grunt, stop it, Robin scolded, waving a hand at the animal. Shame on you. The bear growled again but settled to all four feet and shambled across the meadow, disappearing into the aspens on the other side. I'm sorry, she explained, laying a hand upon the man's trembling arm. He's very grumpy when he's awakened suddenly. Just ignore him. He wouldn't hurt you. Besides, the animals are forbidden to attack other creatures within the grove. You're safe here. She doubted that the stranger understood her, but he seemed soothed by her tone, for he clung tightly to her arm and allowed her to lead him farther into the bower. The bower was actually a grassy meadow, "'surrounded and covered by a converging tangle of trees. "'It was small, for they kept no animals, "'and only used it for those periods "'when some injured creature of the wild "'needed the grove as a haven while recovering from wounds. "'She helped the man, who seemed to grow weaker with every step, "'to a bed of lush grasses. "'Lowering him gently to the ground, "'she offered him more water. "'Gradually, his trembling subsided, and finally he slept. Even in unconsciousness, however, he clutched the tattered pouch and its rock-like contents tightly to his chest. She rose silently when his breathing became deep and even, flipping through the curtain of aspens to leave him to his rest. There she found Newt, perched suspiciously upon a low branch, waiting for her. Now can we go swimming? he asked. They were Kalashites, reported Dareth. At least they learned their trade in Kalimshan at the Academy of Stealth. The Kalashite's brown face was taut with anger, and his black eyes blazed. How can you be sure? asked the prince. He shook his head, trying to clear away the grogginess of his short sleep. Suddenly, he remembered his father's body in the next room, but he clenched his jaw to stifle any display of emotion. Inwardly, he wanted to shout his grief at the heavens, to cry aloud for vengeance. Dareth had awakened him after what seemed like scant moments of sleep, although he could now see the sun outside the window. They're garments for one thing, Dareth continued. The prince knew that his friend had studied at the Academy of Stealth, but Dareth rarely spoke of those experiences. It was not, Tristan sensed, something the Houndmaster was proud of. The assassins of the Pasha school always wear the finest weave of Amnish silk. This silk. He held up a piece of cloth "'torn from one of the slain attackers. "'And these little crossbows are a favored weapon of the Pasha's elite. "'Smeared with poison, they are absolutely deadly within fifty feet.' "'Dareth paused. "'I'm sorry. "'It's a miracle that they didn't get you as well. "'Then there was Raz Fallow.' "'The Kalashite paused for a moment.' I studied under him when I was at the academy. That was when I was young, but strong and quick. The skills taught at the academy, I thought, would see me to a life of luxury and ease. But those skills, stealthy murder, theft, betrayal, they come with their own cost. And Raz Vallow made those costs clear to me. He is one of the deadliest assassins in the realms. 
Eventually I made him angry. The most convenient solution was for me to leave Kalimshan. And so I did. Obviously, he remembers, remarked the prince. I gave him good cause to, muttered Dareth. But despite Tristan's curious look, he would not elaborate. What is he? A half-orc. His mother was a full-blooded orc. It's a sore spot with him. As if a person might not notice, muttered the prince. Finally, we found two guards atop the palisade, slain from a single stab wound. Here. Dareth bent his head forward, gesturing with a finger at the base of his neck. I know of no other assassins in the world who use such a tactic for surreptitious slaying. The Pasha of Kalimshan sent assassins to Corwell? asked the prince. Perhaps he could find a focus for his anger. Probably not. Although they were trained in Kalimshan, they were paid with these. Dareth held out a pair of gold coins, stamped with the outline of a crenellated castle on one side. The prince reached for the coins and flipped them over. On the back was a familiar silhouette. Care Caladir? They were paid with the coin of the High King? So it would seem. Dareth nodded soberly. It was careless of one of them to carry his coin with him. Perhaps he did not trust his fellows. Now he has no use for the coin, and its presence on his body tells us much. What is the relationship of the High King to the rulers of the Fafolk, such as your father? The title High King is more an honorific than anything else. Not since Simracu has there truly been a king that united the Fafolk under one leader. Now he wears the crown of the Isles to signify his authority. That was the gold crown forged for Q himself, but has little real authority, except over the kingdom of Caladir. In Moray, Snowdown, and here in Corwell, we pay little attention. But what does that honorific mean? In name, he is the lord of the kings of Corwell, Moray, and Snowdown. The High King is, in fact, the king of Caladir. The largest kingdom of the Fafolk. Though the other kings, including my father, owe fealty to him, there is no power behind the title. The current king, Carathal, has brought much trade to Caladir from the nations on the Sword Coast. He has even hired a council of mages from Waterdeep and beyond to advise him. Still, he has been no more dynamic than any of the others in providing strong leadership or bringing the nations of the Fafolk together. Tristan paused. He and his father had discussed this more than once. Because the Fafolk had no single strong leader, the Northmen had been able to conquer many of their lands, one by one. We cannot bring ourselves to unite against them. Tristan reflected, even when they bring all of their nations together against one kingdom. But he still could not follow Dareth's argument. Perhaps he knew that your father had no ambitions, conceded Dareth. But perhaps your father was not the target of this assassin. It may be that he was simply an unfortunate victim. The real target could be one that the High King does not know to be a loyal vassal, the one most responsible for the great victory of last year. Me? Tristan was shocked. Of course, that is just a guess, admitted Dareth. But your father was no threat to the High King. Maybe you were. But what could be gained by slaying me? The king has enemies by virtue of his position. Who knows how many petty cantriv lords will be arriving here to fight for my father's position. One of them could have done this. I 
think that is unlikely, argued the hound master. For one thing, the graduates of the Academy of Stealth do not work cheaply. I doubt whether one of the Cantrive lords could have afforded them. Perhaps they were hired by the High King, or at least by some wealthy individual of Caladir, Tristan said. I cannot accept the idea that I was the target. Still, he recalled his father pushing over his chair, and the dart that followed. Very well, Gareth shrugged. But have a care for your back nonetheless. I shall. The coming Council of Lords gives me enough cause for nervousness in any event. The Major Lords of Corwell will ride here upon hearing of the news of my father's death. After the funeral feast, they will select a new king. What do you plan? asked the Hound Master. I plan to be the one selected. The silver of a moon cast little light over the vast wilderness of Mirlock Vale. It did not penetrate the thick canopy of aspen leaves, and thus the confines of the bower remained pitch black. The shriveled figure there twisted and sat up, breathing heavily. He had slept all afternoon and now felt strong enough to move. With exaggerated stealth, he reached a claw-like hand into his tattered pouch, pulling forth a black rock. It was curved with smooth surfaces, like a stone sculpture of a heart. Some of its facets were pure, deep black, and others seemed even darker. It absorbed light and radiated a faint heat. Deep within its center, it throbbed with a deep, evil cadence that few could hear, but those that heard it, heard it most profoundly. Nervously peering into the woods surrounding him, he hunched over and clasped the object to his breast. Rabbits and squirrels shifted uneasily throughout the woods as some nameless disturbance penetrated their rest. The flowers in the garden closed their petals. In the pond, the lilies shivered and shifted away from the sinister presences, until all of the blossoms had gathered against the far shore like a nervous flock of sheep. Suddenly, a cackle of glee passed the man's lips, and he jumped in fright. Panicked, he jerked his head about, straining to hear if he had been detected. Carefully, he wrapped the object in its filthy pouch and lay down again upon the bed of grasses. Within the cottage, two hundred feet away, Jenna thrashed in her sleep, apparently caught in the throes of a nightmare. And Robin sat up suddenly, drenched with sweat, for she had just awakened from a numbing nightmare of her own. She had dreamed of the king, her stepfather, laid upon his funeral bier. Surrounding him, descending slowly, was an unspeakable menacing black mist. She could not return to sleep for the rest of the night. To good King Kendrick, may the goddess reward him. Lord Pontswain raised his mug, allowing foam to spill onto the broad tabletop. The Council of Lords was meeting in Ker Corwell's Great Hall, for the royal study was not large enough to accommodate the gathered throng. The lords represented the villages and towns of the small kingdom, from tiny highland communities to thriving fishing cantrips. They sat drinking dark ale in toast to their deceased sovereign. All thirty-one of Corwell's cantrip lords had gathered at the castle to decide upon the future ruler of the kingdom. Tristan, as host, sat at the head of the table. Dareth sat to his right, while Randolph, in his role as captain of the castle guard, stood at the nearby door. Opposite Tristan, two score feet away, sat Friar Nolan, the cleric of the new gods who had won over some of the folk of Corwell. 
Most of the Fafolk still held the Earth Mother Goddess to be the supreme deity. But as a rule, her representatives, the Druids, shunned human politics, and thus none were present. Lord Galric lurched to his feet, splashing half the contents of his mug into the lap of the scowling Lord Coart, who sat beside him. As usual, Galric was drunk, and Tristan suppressed a smile. At least one of his rivals was ill-prepared to debate him. "'King Kendrick!' shouted Galric. "'A splendid ruler and a fine figure of a man! "'Hear, hear!' The course of agreements was followed by more slurping swallows around the table. Tristan examined the other lords, trying to determine who was most likely to offer him a challenge. Nearby sat Lord Coart and Lord Dynat. Neither had acquitted himself well during the war, and Tristan hoped this fact would be enough to mark them as unfit to rule. He knew them both to be ambitious, however, and the two lords were close friends. He had to beware of a potential coalition. Farther down the table, Lord Galric's head was already dropping onto his chest. Galric ruled over a highland cantrip that had amassed considerable wealth from the mining of copper, iron, and silver. In any event, the lord was now too drunk to make a case for himself. Beyond Lord Galric sat Lord Ponswain. He was a smooth, handsome man with curling brown hair that flowed past his shoulders and a firm, crackling voice that commanded attention. He had a sharp wit, and the cutting edge of his voice often left one wondering whether he had been complimented or insulted. The prince noticed that Ponswain's mug remained full. The lord spent more time sizing up the others at the table than he did in joining the toasting. Ponswain ruled a large and wealthy cantrip to the southwest of Corwell. Tristan knew him to be very ambitious and judged him the most significant rival at the table. The others, such as Lord Fergus of King's Bay and Lord Macshay of Cantor of Macshehan, ruled small fiefdoms that were still recovering from the war. Tristan judged these lords as council members to be honest and reasonable men, open to persuasion by the best candidate. For a moment, the prince thought again of the meeting's purpose. His father had been buried the night before, and he was about to make a case for himself to succeed the king. He could feel his palms beginning to sweat. His mug, like Ponswain, sat before him, barely touched. "'My lords,' he began, so softly that the group was forced to quiet in order to hear him. I thank you all for attending this most significant council. Your presence at the funeral last night, as well, is appreciated. My father served as king for twenty-seven years. With one notable exception, these were years of peace and prosperity. Trading vessels called regularly here and at King's Bay. Taxes have remained low, practically non-existent for those with little means to pay. I think you will all agree that he allowed you to rule your fiefdoms with little interference. When our neighbors in Moray suffered the misfortune of an invasion of Northmen, King Kendrick and the forces of Corwell were decisive in defeating the invasion. And last summer, when our own kingdom felt the brunt of such an invasion, he rallied the cantrips to ultimate victory. Tristan didn't want to overstate his father's role in that conflict, for he knew that his own contribution gave him his best claim to the throne. In that campaign, where the stalwart lords Coart and Dynat fought beside my own company, the Fafolk of Corwell drove off not only an army of Northmen, but supernatural horsemen. We triumphed with the aid of this potent sword. He gestured to the sword of Simmer Q. Over the beast that the Northmen called their master. 
the prince paused, willing each of the lords to recall the dark walker war. Many are the wounds that remain with us to this day, suffered in that struggle. Galric, whose canter was ravaged by the hungry wolf pack, Fergus and Macshay, their homes burned by the invading Northmen. Corwell itself held by the narrowest of margins. While others of us, such as Pontswain, were more fortunate, not only were they spared the destruction of their homes, but they did not suffer the deaths of their people in combat. He paused again, allowing the facts to sink in. Before Tristan could continue, however, Lord Pontswain rose smoothly to his feet, smiling politely around the table before nodding quickly at the prince. My prince, he began. The pause was long enough that none could miss its significance. Your gracious hospitality and entertainment is greatly appreciated. It is time, however, that we arrived at the true purpose of this council. Leave us, please, to attend to the man's task of selecting the next king of Corwell. Ponswain turned back to the lords, his gesture emphasizing the prince's dismissal. Tristan had been prepared for a maneuver of some kind, but the bluntness of it took him by surprise. He found his voice a second later. My lord. He mimicked Ponswain's pause perfectly. I have earned the right to attend this council as much as any other man here. Perhaps more than some, if such earnings is measured in bloodshed for the kingdom. He saw the lords who had suffered during the war nodding in mute agreement as attention turned back to Ponsway. Now, now, lad. Ponsway's patronizing tone gave Tristan his opening. Where do you earn the right to condescend? He growled. The laws of the Fafolk provide that my fitness to rule will be judged alongside yours, old man. And may it be that it will be judged superior to yours. In a brief minute, the field of candidates for the kingship had been narrowed to two. Both men understood this and sized each other up for a moment before proceeding. None would deny, began Ponswain, that under the guidance of your father, you made some remarkable contributions to the realm. But... Your father is gone now. Which is why we are here, Tristan interrupted flatly. I stood without my father upon Freeman's Down, where my troops stopped an army of Northmen, numbering four times our own. I found the sword of Simmer Q without my father, returning that weapon to the Fafolk after it had been lost for centuries. My father lay wounded within these walls when I faced the beast in the courtyard and drove it from the castle. And it was also without my father that I pursued and slayed the beast in mortal combat. And since that time, you have wasted your time drinking and carousing and not done a single thing to better yourself, accused Ponswain. Several of the lords turned to regard the prince somewhat critically, and he paused. It had not occurred to Tristan that his reputation would have reached these men. Perhaps I have enjoyed myself, Tristan finally conceded. But it was at my own expense. I have not been collecting and hoarding a fortune by overtaxing the peasants of Corwell. Now several lords regarded Ponswain accusingly, for it was well known that Lord Ponswain was a harsh taxer and miserly with his expenses. My experience as the administrator of a cantrip has given me an opportunity to prepare for the kingship. 
My cantrip has been prosperous beyond the norm. Because you stood behind your stone walls while war ravaged the cantrips of your neighbors and countrymen. That accusation is not true, Ponswain returned, and I'm glad you've given me the opportunity to respond. During the Dark Walker War, my troops diligently patrolled the southern shore of Corwell Firth. I myself rode at their head as we combed the moors looking for northmen or wolves or any kind of enemy. Ponswain's voice quavered with outrage. Am I to be blamed because the invaders did not challenge my lands? Several of the lords looked convinced, while others such as Fergus and Dinat, scowled in obvious disgust. In any event, concluded Lord Ponswain, your immaturity leaves little option for this council. Our king must be a man of steadiness, intelligence, and responsibility. I am clearly your better in those respects. Perhaps said Friar Nolan, speaking for the first time. And perhaps not. The cleric stood, and all of the lords waited patiently for him to speak. Though most of them did not actively worship the new gods of the devout cleric, Friar Nolan was regarded by them all with respect and a little awe. After all, his potent healing magic had benefited more than one of them. It seems to me that you are all in too much of a hurry to make a decision. You have a ruler above yourselves, above even your king. Turn to him for guidance in this most critical decision. Allow the high king to determine which of these men shall become your king. I cannot object strongly enough, growled Ponswain. Fergus leaped to his feet, a smile lifting his broad mustache. I, for one, like the friar's suggestion. Let the high king choose between them. Indeed, chorused Coart. Let the high king decide. A chorus of assents rumbled from the lords, and Tristan and Ponswain exchanged a sudden, challenging look. The prince looked back to the lords, unable to read the emotion in Ponswain's dark, confident gaze. I shall journey to Caer Caladir to petition the king for the throne of Corwell, Tristan said calmly. And I shall accompany you and win that approval, boasted the lord. Decided, mumbled Galric lurching drunkenly to his feet and raising his mug. Let the High King choose! Once again, the Council of Seven sat around their U-shaped table. Seven candles illuminated the large circular chamber. Its bleak stone walls were covered in several places by plush tapestries. Abstract designs with crimson streaks of color flowing like blood across the velvet. Sindri sat at the base of the yew. His voice, pleasant and conversational as always, floated through the chamber. He spoke to the wizard, sitting at his right. Alexi, I sense reluctance as you hear our plans. We could be mistaken in using the assassin so readily. I fear he is not to be trusted. That fat cleric could be using us to further his own ends. The one called Alexi answered. How dare you challenge the decision of our master? Interrupted the wizard seated to Sindri's left. His sharp voice emerged from a black robe. He looked identical to all of the others present, except that he allowed himself the conceit of a small diamond brooch upon his shoulder. His fingers, nervously drumming the tabletop, glittered with a sparkling array of diamond rings. Now, Cryphon, countered Sindri, 
please keep the discussion on a genteel level. The master of the seven smiled benignly. Of course, none present could see the smile within the folds of Sindri's robe, but they all felt it. Very well, replied Cryphon calmly. I ask my colleague if the threat to our liege, the High King, should be ignored. Of course not, Alexei explained. But our only evidence of threat comes from the prophecies of this cleric of Behal. A very powerful cleric of a very powerful god, added Doric. The woman sat to Cryphon's left. Her face, like the others, was hidden within her hood, but her voice was filled with cool arrogance. Her unnaturally long fingers tapped nervously upon the tabletop. True. But I feel that we should, through our own methods, determine the veracity of his claims. Do you think that I am a fool? Sindri asked. Of course I have checked, using far more accurate means than that wretch of a cleric can hope to employ. For now that cleric, and yes, even his awesome deity, serve our purposes. If Sindri noticed the shudders of nervousness that passed among the members of his council, he gave no indication. The master of the mages continued, as if talking to recalcitrant children. The significant kings and lords of the Fafolk have been eliminated or neutralized. The way grows clear for our liege to rule all of the moonshays. Yes, master, said Alexei quietly. I am silence. Sindri's single word came like music to their ears, but bound their lips like the ironclad order that it was. The master gestured, and the seven knew that the door to their chamber had been opened. Soon they heard the whisper of soft leather boots moving down the black corridor, and then three men entered the room, standing awkwardly at the open end of the table. Actually, only two of them were men. The third was manlike, but stood taller than his companions. His arms were long and his face grotesque. Nervously licking his lips, he revealed wicked fangs. Well, Razfalo, what is the word from Corwell? Sindri's question was a formality, and no doubt the assassin knew it. The wizard's powerful scrying mirror had shown him the results of the mission as it had happened. We failed, master. The king sacrificed himself to save the prince. Then the prince's bodyguard, a graduate of the academy and former student of mine, intervened. I lost five of my finest. This is what I think of your finest. Sindri's voice carried no trace of threat, but his left and right forefingers gestured at the men standing to either side of Razfalo. Spellbound, each instantly grabbed his throat and gasped. Choking, they staggered to their knees and then flopped to the floor. Twisting in agony, their faces growing slowly black, they died over a period of several minutes. Razfalo watched the executions impassively. Finally, the assassin turned toward Sindri. You only live because I have further need of you, explained the wizard. Serve me well, and you may be granted the right to live out your miserable life. What is it, teacher? Why did you call? Robin clasped a hand to her mouth as she saw Jenna's haggard face staring at her from the depths of her bed. Pain! gasped Jenna Moonsinger, collapsing into her soft quilt. Her eyes darted past Robin, as if she feared that some apparition might appear in the doorway. 
Can I help you? Tell me what you need. Leave me, girl. Go now. Jenna's voice was sharp, more harsh than Robin had ever heard before. Confused and frightened, she stumbled from the cottage and banged the door shut. She saw the man, the stranger she still called him, watering the roses as she had requested. Robin quickly turned away from him and went around the cottage. She felt a need to be alone. She heard a loud snuffle as she passed through the hedge that magically parted before her, and Grunt rose to his four feet. Absently, she scratched his broad head while she wondered about her teacher's strange malady. Jenna had been taciturn and unpleasant recently, and her health seemed to grow worse every day. Grunt suddenly rubbed against her anxious for more attention and knocked her to the ground. Damn it, you clumsy oaf! She shouted, and then winced as she saw the deep hurt in his eyes. I'm sorry. It's not you. I shouldn't treat you so. Mollified, the bear nuzzled in for more scratching, and she absently complied. Her mind drifted to Tristan. She had been thinking of him a lot lately. Often she daydreamed about his sudden arrival at the grove. She pictured him galloping from the woods on his great stallion Avalon. She liked to imagine his joy upon seeing her and the crushing kiss he'd greet her with. She felt certain that something was terribly wrong. She feared that the king was indeed dead. She would have gone except for the demands of Jenna's illness, for the great druid desperately needed her help now. Half hoping, she turned to the forest beyond the grove, as if she expected to see the approach of the white charger and its handsome rider. But there were only green leaves swaying easily in the breeze. The goddess Earth Mother was a deity unlike the hall in every respect. While his interests spanned planes and universes, hers were focused only upon the Moonshe Islands. While he thrived upon death, she prospered from growth and life. Behal relished chaos and disorder, while the Earth Mother desired only the proper balance of all things. The islands had been her body, her life, since time began. But the power of the goddess was waning, for only through her druids could her body survive and prosper. The coming of the Northmen in centuries past had driven the druids from many parts of the isles. And a challenge from another source, upon the large island of Alarone, had gradually removed that land from her. She did not know what had happened to the druids of Alarone, only that their lives had been snuffed out, one by one, as if some ravaging cancer had spread across the land. Her islands of Snowdown and Moray, small and lightly populated, still held to the tenets of her ancient faith. Their druids were devout, but simple people, the demands of their land slight and easily met. Only upon Gwyneth were her druids still truly strong. She sensed in some godlike way that she would need all of that strength if she was going to survive. Chapter 3 Black Wizard the vast underground passage reverberated with soft echoes as hundreds of dark small bodies moved stealthily through the cavern. No light broke the inky blackness, but the figures moved quickly and easily, avoiding each upthrusting stalgamite and carefully bypassing each sheer precipice that led to depths of the earth thousands of feet, even miles below them. Are your troops in position? My time is precious, remarked Sindri smoothly. The black wizard was concealed as usual beneath his robe, but his posture and tone conveyed boredom. You will receive your payment, 
barked one of the little figures standing irritably beside the mage. He came only to the man's waist. His dark and swarthy face scowled at the passing file of similar creatures. If your magic is as mighty as you claim. Daydak, king of the dark dwarves, the Dugar, glared a challenge at the mage. He was not used to hearing compliments. Sindri waved a finger, whispering a soft word. Daydak, the cave salamander, froze in panic. His reptilian eyes bulged up at the wizard. Sindri gestured again, and the dark dwarf stood once again beside him, looking considerably chastened. "'See that you do not question my magic again,' said the sorcerer, very softly. Daydak nodded quickly. "'As we agreed, my army will guard the underworld approaches to Ker Kaladir. We will let nothing in or out, and when you call us, we will be there to serve you.' "'Very good.' The wizard smiled from the depths of his robe. Now let us see to this attack. My troops are almost in position, pleaded the dwarf. A few moments more, please. Sindri looked with disinterest at the short, stocky column of fighters. Each was dark-skinned and bristled with hair and beard. Their bowed legs carried them roughly but steadily. Finely crafted armor of metal or leather protected their chests, and their arms were banded in steel. The deep gnomes, Svervneblin, were the blood enemies of the Dugar. The vast underground community below them contained valuable gold and iron deposits, prime fungus-growing caverns, and good water supply. It would be a fine addition to the Dugar holdings. And two... The slaying of the Sverb Neblin would be grand sport for the malicious, merciless Dugar. Sindri enjoyed the prospect of the coming fight, for his magic would ensure the victory, and the Dugar would then join the forces waiting to move on the sorcerer's command. The Scarlet Guard and the Dugar had potent armies, and one more force, now waiting quietly under the sea, would soon join those legions. We are ready, said Daydok. Follow me. The dark dwarf king led Sindri through a narrow cave mouth onto a high promontory still underground. They looked over a vast network of caverns, the realm of the Sferp Neblin. Huge stone pillars connected the floor to the ceiling, some five hundred feet overhead. Many gems studded these pillars, casting a soft yellow light over the scene. Below them, the round-roofed stone huts of the deep gnomes clustered against the cavern walls. The gnomes bustled about their community, busy as always. Potters, jewelers, bakers, farmers, smiths all plied their trades, bartering constantly, for such is the way of the gnomes. They were a slight, wiry people, smaller than the Dugar and much less malicious. Beyond the village stretched the vast fungus forests where the gnomes grew their food. A placid stream wound through the huge fungi, bridged in several places by neat stone spans. The scene throughout the caverns was one of peace, but that peace was ending. Syriax Pungis Wissach! Near! Sindri whispered the words to his first spell, holding his fingers before him. A soft hissing surrounded him, and a long tendril of yellow gas flowed from each of his fingertips. The gas expanded into a huge yellow mass of air sinking from the promontory toward the bustling village below. The gas seeped through the doors and windows, slinking around the deep gnomes as they sat or slept or worked. And where it struck, it killed. A hundred gnome folk were startled by the yellow silent death and died before they could cry a warning. 
The gas flowed onward, seeping through the streets, flowing from the dead to the living. One old gnome, tottering up the street, his gray beard reaching nearly to the ground, saw the horror and cried a single word. Flee! Then the gas crept around him, and he died upon the tiny street. With the alarm, gnomes poured from the buildings that had yet to be struck by the killing cloud. Hundreds of the creatures fled to the fields, through the vast fungus plants to the bridges over the placid stream. And as they crossed the bridges, males, females, and young, they were met by the poised weapons of Daydox Dugar. Sindri saw a group of gnomes, perhaps a hundred, break away from the rest and flee toward a narrow cavern beyond the fungi. The sorcerer whispered a word and immediately disappeared from the promontory. In the same instant, he arrived at the mouth of the cavern, certain to be a secret escape route. He cast another spell some distance into the cavern and watched as the gnomes raced into the passage. Suddenly, they stopped, their escape blocked by a solid wall of iron that extended from the top to the bottom of the secret tunnel and from wall to wall. They turned as a mass to race for the entrance again, but the black wizard now stood there, waiting implacably for the gnome's moments of maximum terror. Blitzeth Dorax Zuth! Sindri's next spell sent crackling bolts of lightning sizzling into the walls and ceilings of the narrow cave. Great chunks of rock broke free, crushing the trapped gnomes. More and more stone fell in a thunderous cloud of dust and debris, sending a cloud of dust drifting into the vast caverns where the massacre was now complete. Sindri smiled slightly, satisfied that his task was done. The dark dwarves had gained their food and water sources and their mining tunnels. Their senseless bloodlust had been satisfied. Indeed, the dark dwarves had gained all that they currently desired. And the black wizard had gained the Dugars themselves. The feasting had ended, and the lords had gone, except for Fergus and Ponswain. Tristan met with them along with Dareth and Randolph, after the council. Fires burned low in the hearths, and a chorus of snores arose from various corners of the hall. They had finalized the details of their journey. Dareth would accompany the prince and Lord Ponswain to Ker Caladir. There they would each meet with the High King and plead their case for the kingship of Corwell. They agreed to abide by the king's decision. "'Very well,' said Ponswain. "'How do we get there?' "'I was hoping to accompany Lord Fergus to King's Bay, "'riding the length of Corwill Road.' "'Tristan looked at the other lord, "'who watched the discussion impassively. "'Can you furnish us with a boat "'to carry us across the Strait of Alarone? "'Fergus nodded, his handlebar mustache bouncing.' It shall be my pleasure. Very well. Tristan stood, followed by the others. We shall leave for King's Bay at first light. Dareth and Tristan went to their quarters and gathered their belongings for the journey. Dareth carried his scimitar at his waist and concealed a pair of long knives in the sleeves of his cloak. Tristan wore the sword of Simmer Q and carried a bow and quiver of arrows slung over his saddle. They slept little that night, but dawn quickly called them from their restless beds. They went immediately to the stables, where Dareth selected his mount, a chestnut gelding, and Tristan saddled Avalon, the mighty stallion that had served him so nobly during the Darkwalker War. Lord Fergus and his son were already prepared, and even Ponswain arrived soon afterward. The young lord was dressed in a shining suit of plate mail and rode a proud charger of midnight black. In addition to his sword, Ponswain carried a long wooden lance. The only other member of the party was Tristan's prized moorhound, Canthus. 
the great dog stood half as high as his master and weighed every bit as much. He was a keen hunter and steadfast companion who had received his training from Dareth. Fergus waited astride a great dappled mare, standing in the courtyard at first light. His son, Sean, rode a small stallion of the same colors. The young horse skittered nervously away from Avalon as Tristan, Dareth, and Canthus emerged from the stables. The great war horse ignored the other stallion, moving into an easy trot as Tristan preceded the others from the castle gate. Canthus loped beside him as he gave the stallion his head. They cantered down the winding approach to the castle and turned toward the west upon Corwell Road. They would follow this, the kingdom's one highway, across Corwell to the eastern port of King's Bay. For most of the first morning they rode in easy silence, slowing their mounts to a walk after a short stretch. Fergus traveled beside the prince, trailing the rest of the party. Eventually, the genial lord cleared his throat awkwardly. "'You know, prince, I am reminded of tales I've heard of the early days of the Fafolk upon Gwyneth and the other Moonshay Islands. Gwyneth, as you and I well know, was the grandest of the isles back then. In the days before Caladir, I mean.' Fergus cast a glance at Tristan to be sure that he was listening. Satisfied, he continued, his great mustache bobbing up and down with each word. I was not actually present at Freeman's Down last summer. I did arrive at the castle in time to witness the siege and the rout of the Northmen. Those were the grandest sights I've ever beheld. It made me proud to be a lord of the Fafolk, and I cannot help thinking that it was you who brought those victories about. Lord Fergus turned to meet Tristan's gaze squarely. What I'm trying to say is that perhaps we're seeing a bit of that old glory return to Gwyneth now. You will be our king, and your reign will be good for Gwyneth and for all the Fafolk, and I'll be the prouder for having served you, Fergus concluded. He cleared his throat again and looked awkwardly across the moor, away from Tristan. For a moment, Tristan said nothing, but his face burned with excitement and joy. He felt as though he had truly been born to be king of the Fafolk. Silently, he vowed to bring about a return to the days of Gwyneth's glory. Your words are heartening, my lord. It will be a comfort to know that I leave the kingdom in the hands of men and women such as yourself. They passed through several cantribs, but most of the land was devoted to sparse stony pastures or small tilled fields. Small farms dotted the landscape every mile or two, but the road was empty of other travelers. They talked little for the rest of the day. Tristan looked occasionally at Ponswain, riding beside Sean before them. The Lord spoke constantly, gesturing broadly. The thought of his boasting made Tristan sick with disgust. But unwilling to let Ponswain dampen his excitement, he forced his mind to brighter thoughts. Robin. Where was she now? What was she doing? Did she think of him often? The familiar sense of longing returned. He missed her so. He felt guilty that he had not gone to tell her of his father's death. After all, King Kendrick had been her stepfather, the only parent she had ever known. But, he reminded himself, it probably would have taken weeks to find the grove of the great druid, if he could have found it at all. Previously, that difficulty had piqued his sense of adventure. Now his mission prevented him from taking the time for such a search. Selfishly, futilely, he wished that she had somehow sensed his anguish and come to join him. The journey to Kings Bay was normally a four- or five-day ride, but a sense of urgency pushed the little party over the distance in three. I would provide you with accommodations in my own lodge, 
explained Fergus, as they rode into the fishing cantrip. But you will find the rooms at the Silver Salmon much more comfortable. There also we should find Roger. Roger? Dareth inquired. He's the fisherman I'll send to Alarone with you. Very reliable fella. And he can keep his mouth shut. With luck, you'll be crossing the strait by tomorrow morning. The cleric hated the sea. He hated the thick, fishy stench of the salty air. He hated the sound of water sloshing along the hull and splashing constantly against the planks. He even hated the monotonous sight of the sea, stretching away to infinity in all directions, featureless, yet full of inscrutable detail. But most of all, he hated the motion of the sea, the sickening swaying, rising and falling cadence that churned his stomach into jelly and threatened to tear his mind to pieces. For the hundredth time, he cursed the calling that had compelled him to serve upon these islands, where the only expeditious means of travel involved sailing. Not that he questioned the wishes of the hall, the cleric hastily reminded himself, and whoever else happened to be listening to his thoughts. If Bahal wanted Hobarth to journey to Gwyneth and return with the fresh blood of this young druid, then the cleric would do so without hesitation. And besides, he consoled himself. The journey was practically over. Even as he looked over the low gunwale for the thousandth time, he saw the sun setting over Corwell's easternmost port, King's Bay. Finally, Hobarth thought, I will get a decent bed below me, one that does not move with every breath of wind. Perhaps, he mused further, I might even be able to charm some young barmaid into making a decent bed still nicer. The huge cleric stroked the fleshy folds of his neck, pleasantly intrigued by the thought. His tiny eyes gleamed from between low, sinister brows and bloated cheeks. Several large warts, punishments from the hall for a moment when the cleric had been less than devout, marred his nose. His appearance was altogether grotesque, but this was no obstacle when it came to wooing the young ladies. A simply cast minor spell would blind the lasses to his appearance and smell, creating admiration and eagerness where previously had existed fear and revulsion. Finally, the boat reached the dock. Hitching up his only possession, the small pouch at his belt, he stalked from the craft without a word to the simple fisherman who had carried him from Alarone. Hobarth was certain that the wretch had enjoyed watching his agony. Kings Bay was a smaller town than most communities of Caladir. The many cottages were roofed with round domes of straw instead of the wooden shingles that were common across the strait. The town was well lighted by lamps and torches, however, and numerous inns beckoned the traveler with cheerful music and the aromas of succulent roasts. Hobarth selected one called the Silver Salmon, he planned to drink and eat before he sought a maid, but his plans vanished as he walked through the door. Sitting by the fire, leaning casually back in his chair and talking to a pair of men, was an image he had only seen in the vision sent from the hall. The prophecy had been so vivid that he could not mistake the identity of the man across the room. It was the prince of Corwell. His presence here could only mean that Sindri's assassins had failed. The inn was not very crowded, so Hobarth had no difficulty finding a table near the prince. He sat with his back to Tristan and quietly ordered a mug of ale from a passing barmaid. Nursing the dark, foamy drink, the cleric strained to hear the conversation occurring five feet away. It's settled then said one man. We'll sail with the dawn. Aye, grunted another, an older man. 
if the weather of this past day holds will. The rest of the phrase was drowned out by laughter from the bar as the barmaid slapped an adventurous patron to the uproarious amusement of the man's companions. No need for that. He heard the old man sang when the laughter had died down. The lucky duckling's a small boat, and it won't take but a minute to store your gear. You can't miss her. She's berthed at the nearest quay. Fergus, can you see to our horses until we return? It will be my pleasure. Very well, said the first speaker. I'm going to catch what sleep I can. See you in the morning. Myself as well, said a third man. Hobarth saw from the corner of his eye that this speaker was swarthy, perhaps a Kalashite. He also noticed a great dog climb to its feet and follow the two men up the stairs. Hobarth shuddered. For next to the sea, he hated dogs above all else. He had been considering following the men to their room and finishing the task of the assassins, but the presence of the dog changed that plan. His magic would probably kill the prince before the flea-bitten creature would react. But the thought of those long fangs, lusting for his flesh, sent shivers up and down Hobarth's spine. But a new plan occurred to him, even as he discarded the old one. Quickly, Hobarth drained his mug and walked from the inn back toward the harbor. The lucky duckling was easy to find. I fear your luck has run out, duckling, he murmured, chuckling at his private joke. After checking to see that no one was near, he sat upon the edge of the pier and began casting a spell of decay. Within a minute, he was finished, though the boat showed no outward signs of damage. Still, Hobarth knew as he pushed himself to his feet, the lucky duckling would never make it to the neighboring island of Alarone. He would assure the little boat's doom with an additional spell in the morning. For now, he lumbered back to the inn. He tried to remember what the barmaid had looked like. I shape, grunted the man, shuffling forward to reach for the thick hedge. Robin looked up in surprise, as this was the first intelligible statement the fellow had made in the past four days. Grateful, she stepped backward. Help yourself, she offered, leaning against a tree to catch her breath. Keep an eye he doesn't take your job, warned Newt. The dragon blue today instead of orange was perched on the branches atop the hedge. He watched the humans dourly. The day had been strenuous, as strenuous as all of the days since the stranger had arrived at the grove. They stood at one of the great curving walls of mistletoe that marked the far limits of Jenna's grove, perhaps five hundred yards from the cottage and the moon well. The hedges served as bastions against unwarranted intrusion, for their tightly woven branches bristled with sharp thorns. Mistletoe itself was a plant potent in druidic magic, and thus served doubly to protect the domain of its mistress. But the hedges required constant care during periods of rain, and this had been a wet summer. If not tended by someone, they would choke off all access and aggress to the grove. Robin's hands, beneath her leather gloves, were scratched and torn. Her arms were leaden with weariness for she had been swinging a sickle all morning in an effort to drive the hedges back into their proper dimensions. The stranger took the sickle from her, holding it as if he had used the tool all his life. Slowly but smoothly, he began to slice at the overgrowth, striking it back with clean cuts. Robin was surprised by his apparent skill. For the first time, she noticed that he was improving under her care. His bony frame had filled out slightly, and he could stand and walk without shaking. Now he was even working. 
For a minute, she thought about running to tell Jenna of her success, but quickly decided not to. The great druid had been cantankerous for the past few days, complaining of a stiffness in her bones and throbbing headaches. She had spent most of her time in bed, complaining to Robin whenever the young druid was around. Consequently, Robin avoided the cottage as much as possible. This was not difficult, because the tasks she had to do would remain doubled as long as Jenna was. His work's not too bad for a mushroom head, commented Newt in a stage whisper. He had taken to calling the stranger unflattering names out of jealousy. Robin suspected, for now she no longer attended entirely to the little dragon. Stop it, she chided. He seems to be growing much stronger. All he needed was a little shelter and decent food. Maybe he's strong enough to walk away from here, grumbled Newt. And it'll be none too soon, I might add. Why don't you go take a bath in the fens if you can't be a little more polite? The stranger paused and turned to see if Robin was watching. When he met her gaze, his face split into a wide grin, and he nodded enthusiastically before turning back to the task. For several minutes, he chopped and trimmed, until the druid noticed that his strike was less sure. I'll take over again, she offered, reaching for the sickle. The stranger suddenly whirled, his face twisting into a beastly snarl as his eyes darted wildly about. He appeared to stare right through her, but then he relaxed and smiled, meeting her gaze boldly. He handed the tool over and then stood near as she continued the job. Stand back, she warned. I don't want to hit you. Obediently, he stepped away, but he still stared at her like an affectionate puppy. She could feel his unwavering gaze following her every motion and found the sensation distinctly uncomfortable. Good, good! He cackled, cheerfully watching the hedge take shape. Who are you, anyway? Robin stopped working and stared at the stranger. She had not troubled about his identity when he was not talking, but now that he spoke, she wanted a name to call him by. I... The man's voice was puzzled and unsure. Suddenly his eyes widened in fear, and he scuttled away from her. He crouched, his body wired with tension, as if he were about to flee. Or attack. For a moment she felt very frightened of this stranger, and very vulnerable. With an angry shrug she tried to ignore the feeling. Instead, though, she was deeply disturbed by his fear. What could lie in his background that made him so frightened of companionship, of revealing his identity? He stared at her again as she went back to work. But now his eyes followed her body less like a puppy and more like a hungry wolf. Robin shivered involuntarily, and she clutched the sickle tightly as she turned to the mistletoe. Hobarth, cleric of Bahal, stood upon a low hill just outside of Cantrip Kings Bay. He had a clear view of the bay itself and of the wide grey sea stretching to the east. Somewhere out there, he knew, the sun had risen, but a low-lying bank of clouds concealed the dawn from those on shore. A half-dozen fishing vessels dotted the waters of the bay, moving toward deep water. There, salmon dashed in great numbers between the islands of Gwyneth and Alarone, and these fishermen made a fair living. But one boat, Hobarth knew, had put to sea not to catch fish, but to deliver Tristan Kendrick dangerously close to Hobarth's and Sindri's domain. Or at least attempt to deliver, the cleric gloated. He meditated for a long time, sitting perfectly still with his eyes closed and his body upright. 
Gradually he felt the presence of his deity, and Bihal answered the summons of his faithful follower. The spell he needed to cast was one of his most potent. It called for the direct might of his god, Bihal, and allowed the cleric to control the very substances of the world around him. Bihal eagerly powered the spell, for in fact he watched Hobarth's mission with more than slight interest. Magic flowed through the cleric's body and into the air. Slowly, but mightily, he marshaled clouds heavy with water vapor, coaxing them from the highlands and forcing them out to sea. The force of his magic pushed and prodded the air, and gradually a breeze flowed from the shore. The breeze would become a wind, and then a storm, if the cleric could maintain his spell. And Hobarth knew that he could. Canthus settled comfortably into the bow of the lucky duckling, while Dareth helped Roger trim the lone sail. Ponswain relaxed easily against the gunwale, staring at the water. He had removed his armor, wrapping it with their weapons in oil skins and storing the package in the hull. Fine offshore breeze, Roger commented. If it holds, we'll cross the strait in two days. Tristan had been skeptical of the old seaman's abilities when they had first met, for Roger must have seen at least six decades. His build was slight, and his permanently stooped shoulders enhanced his look of frailty. His face was leathery, creased by hundreds of lines, and he did not have a tooth left in his mouth. After seeing the easy confidence with which he guided the lucky duckling, however, the prince felt considerably reassured. They soon passed the mouth of King's Bay and entered the Strait of Alarone. For a moment, he looked over his shoulder at Gwyneth. As the island of his birth fell away behind them, he felt that he should feel excitement and anticipation. But instead, he wrestled with the feeling that he might never see his homeland again. I won't think of that, he told himself, or of Robin, or a father. He peered resolutely over the bow. It was time to look before him again. He watched the keen, albeit weathered, bow of the duckling slice through the brine, and enjoyed the sight of the wake foaming out to either side. He turned to see it spreading apart like a feathery trail behind the boat, and saw that Gwyneth was practically out of sight. Dareth was relaxing in the bottom of the hull, his eyes closed and his head pillowed on a coil of rope. I hope the old fool can keep us on a straight course, said Ponswain, coming over to join him. Of course he can, Tristan retorted, annoyed. It must be nice to have such faith in people, said the Lord, with a sidelong glance at the prince. Shaking his head in amusement, Ponswain settled into the hull to sleep. Tristan continued to watch the rolling waves, but gradually the experience became less pleasant. He began to feel his stomach heave upward every time the boat climbed a wave, and then threatened to lurch into his throat as they sliced down the other side. He began to dread the crest of each wave, his discomfort growing more acute. His footing grew shaky, and the strength seemed to drain from his arms as he tried to brace himself. First time at sea? Roger cackled the question from the back of the boat. Tristan could only manage a mute nod, for his jaws were tightly clenched. This is nothing, laughed the fisherman. It get lots worse in the middle of the strait. This remark pushed the prince over the brink of self-control, and he hung his head over the side sending the remains of his breakfast to the fish. At least Ponswain and Dareth are still asleep, he thought, nauseated. He clung to the side of the boat 
as the constant motion of the waves seemed to grow more pronounced. The long day seemed endless, and his condition worsened as the wind picked up. The lucky duckling seemed to fly from one wave top to the next, and the prince noticed that the waves themselves were growing considerably higher than they had been at the start of the journey. Best trim the sail, grunted Roger to Dareth as the latter arose to look around. Sea's getting higher than I expected. Dareth loosened a line, pulling the boom higher up the mast so that the amount of sail exposed to the wind was reduced dramatically. Tristan felt the boat slow beneath him and could sense more control returning to the fishermen. The wind still tugged fiercely at the exposed canvas, but Roger was able to guide the little vessel carefully over the huge swells. In spite of his nausea, Tristan could not keep his eyes from the sea as it swirled around him. The waves were climbing higher than the sides of the boat. He swallowed hard, certain that soon one would smash into the hull, flood the craft, and end the journey for all of them. But Roger was a skilled pilot, and the lucky duckling rode the waters like a carriage along a hilly patch. She lurched occasionally, but never faltered. Somehow Ponswain had managed to sleep through the growing storm. Now he awoke suddenly and stumbled to his feet to look aghast at the rising sea. "'What kind of sailor are you?' he shouted at Roger. "'Can't you read a simple change in the weather?' Tristan wanted to object, but feared that if he unclenched his jaw, he would again be overwhelmed by nausea. Dareth climbed to his feet and stepped to the Lord's side. "'Let the man sail, you pompous fool!' he growled. "'How dare you insult!' Ponswain's hand reached for the sword hilt that would normally be at his belt, forgetting that he was unarmed. Dareth stepped in closer. There is something unnatural about this storm, and if you weren't so eager to blame someone, you'd recognize it yourself. Ponswain seemed to pale slightly as the black eyes of the Kalashite bored into his own. Finally, he turned with a shrug and looked back at the sea. Dareth settled back to rest, and Roger sailed on as though nothing had happened. By late afternoon, however, Tristan sensed that even the seasoned fisherman was worried. The swells had continued to grow, and they had trimmed the sail until it was no larger than a baby's blanket. "'Tain't natural,' groused the old man. "'The weather's failing like this. It'll be a long knife if it'll settle down some.' For a few minutes toward dusk, it seemed that the lucky duckling would live up to her name. The wind faded, and the seas grew marginally calmer. But as the surrounding seas turned from a dull gray to a deep black with the onset of nightfall, the gusts of wind swept forward again, carrying the little fishing boat with them. Now the seas rolled six feet high and continued to grow. Canthus paced anxiously beside the prince as he darted from side to side of the boat, looking into the water, for he knew not what. When the moorhound began to whimper, Tristan stopped to scratch the dog's broad head. Roger grasped the tiller firmly, while Dareth raised the sail almost entirely. He left just enough for the sailor to retain steerage of the boat, but even so the little craft whipped forward recklessly. A huge wall of black water rolled up to the stern of the ship and thundered past, sending a torrent of spray over the transom and leaving the duckling awash, holding more than a foot of water. Bail! cried Roger, indicating a large bucket with a nod of his head. Tristan saw that the surging tiller nearly lifted the sailor off the hull with the force of the storm. Desperately, he knelt, noticing absently that he no longer felt sick. 
Ponswain knelt beside him, heaving full buckets over the side. Tristan had to admit, grudgingly, that the Lord worked diligently and with great strength. Of course, he no doubt realized that his own life was at stake. Pitching bucketfuls of water over the side, they bailed frantically, but water seemed to pour over the gunwales faster than they could scoop it out. Tristan filled another bucket, but suddenly gagged as a surprising stench assailed his nostrils. Gasping, he dropped the bucket and staggered backward. Maggots spilled from the container to slither about the hull. He struggled to voice his shock, but no sound emerged. More maggots seethed from the hull of the boat, and he felt the wood grow spongy beneath his feet. The sickly white creatures, creeping from the ducklings' very planks, seemed to fill the boat. The horrible smell of rotting flesh rose from the hull with the maggots. Sorcery! cried the prince, finding his voice. What black magic is this? growled Ponswain. The lord was not so much terrified as enraged. You have brought this upon us! He finished, shaking his fist at Tristan. The prince shook his head dumbly and then watched as Roger screamed, staring in horror at the death of his boat. The hull creaked as the center of the boat rose, while the bow and stern dipped below the rolling waves. A black wall of water crushed the transom, covering Roger as he screamed. As the water receded, Tristan saw the tiller banging loosely. There was no sign of the sailor. Dareth scrambled past him, and Tristan saw his companion lunging to grasp an oilskin bundle. The prince vaguely remembered that the package contained their weapons. The sword of Simmer Q. The hull lurched apart, and the bundle of weaponry slipped into the black water and sank. Dareth dove after it, disappearing into the storm. Abruptly, Tristan's muscles broke free from the paralysis that gripped him, and he ducked to the side to avoid the falling mast. He scrambled into the stern of the boat, which remained just underneath the surface. He tried to see Dareth, and heard Canthus bark somewhere close, but the Kalashite and the dog were invisible in the darkness. Dareth suddenly popped to the surface in the wave trough, and Tristan could see that his hands were empty. Then the crest of the wave smashed against the wreck, and the remaining piece of the lucky duckling disintegrated. The young prince struggled for air, thrashing desperately against the press of the thundering sea. All he could find was an infinity of black, choking water. Kralex Hero Zuthar. Short, dexterous fingers stroked the surface of a mirror. A soft luminescence seemed to flow from the glass. The wizard spoke quietly, as if by his tone he wished to soothe a nervous cat. But the words were the dire commands of magic. The luminescence grew cloudy, and gradually the outline of a room appeared in the mirror. Sindri walked slowly around the council chamber, his concentration focused entirely upon the tall mirror. One of the blood-red tapestries had been pulled back to reveal the glass. Its gold frame seemed to catch and amplify the light from within. The wizard stared into the mirror and saw the great hall of Care Corwell, as he had seen for many days in a row. The hall was vacant, save an old cook gathering dirty platters from the large tables. Zuthak Ali. The picture moved, as if the viewer had passed from the hall and had begun to climb the stairs inside the castle. For several minutes, the image meandered from room to room, passing freely through closed doors. Care Corwell seemed quiet, almost abandoned. Sindri felt a flash of annoyance, but he blinked it away. Self-control, he reminded himself, 
was all important. He thought of the cleric Hobarth with smug satisfaction, blindly faithful to his violent god. That fat buffoon would sacrifice his own life if his awful master demanded it. And how pitiful were his clerical powers, mused Sindri, when compared to the awesome might of wizardry. Such reliance upon gods, Sindri believed without question, was the way of fools and weaklings. The image moved from the keep to the outer wall, and here he found a pair of guards standing listlessly at their posts. One, a young man, asked the other a question. The wizard smiled slightly as he heard the words. His smile broadened as he heard the other guard reply. He now knew all that he required. The Prince of Corwell was on his way to Caladir. With growing interest, Bihal watched the drama unfold upon the moonshays. As his will focused upon the islands, he found the heart of Kazgaroth still clutched faithfully by its servant. It was time, decided Bihal, that the heart be given to one who could make better use of it. That one drew closer to it with each passing hour, and this closeness brought the god's desire to a fever pitch. Hobarth would take the heart, would use it for the tasks it was capable of, in the hands of a powerful cleric. Hobarth would gain his tool, and Bahal would recover the very soul of his lost minion. This thought was immensely pleasing to him. And so Bahal set in motion the things that would send the heart from the one who carried it to the one who would wield it. All he needed to do was take a man— already driven mad by the close throbbing of the heart, and make him irrevocably insane. The throbbing grew louder and deeper. Chapter 4 Care Allison His Highness High King Reginald Carathal, sovereign of Caladir and monarch of all the lands of the Fafolk, had a most annoying problem. To wit, a large pimple gleamed insolently from his cheek, resisting the king's most arduous attempts to remove it. Pouting, his majesty turned from the mirror, his long curls flouncing, and marched across the bedchamber. The plush carpeting sank underfoot, thwarting his attempts to stomp noisily. He stepped around a huge canopied bed, stalking alongside a wall that was hung in a fortune of silk curtains. In annoyance, he realized that he now stood before an even larger mirror, the one that hung above his dressing table. Blast it all! he cried, picking up a small vial of rare calashite cologne. He hurtled the container at the mirror, smashing both before turning to stalk across the room again. Is there a problem, your majesty? The smooth voice came from the wizard. How dare you enter my chamber without knocking? The king huffed, squinting angrily at Sindri. I was about to knock when I heard a disturbance. Fearing for his majesty's safety, I hastened to your side. The wizard's voice, as always, soothed and comforted the king. He felt his annoyance vanish as Sindri stepped forward. The mage's dark robe was open, revealing a soft cotton gown embroidered with gold. His hood lay back upon his shoulders, and his blonde, curly hair framed a cherubic smile in a wide, almost childlike face. His hand reached forward to pat the royal shoulder. Well, the king said, what did you want to see me about? I fear, your highness, that I bring grave news. It is with reluctance that Tell me, you fiend! Do not play games with bad news! 
The king merely hopped up and down in his anxiety. He licked his lips nervously. Sindri sighed, his reluctance obvious. It seems that the usurper is on his way to care Kaladir. What? The high king squeaked. But you promised me. You need not fear him, said Sindri, looking straight into the king's eyes. He did not add, yet, though it was on his mind. Slowly, the monarch calmed down. Our first attempt to punish him for his treachery met with small success, explained the wizard, pursing his lips. The gesture was a very strong one for Sindri. Nevertheless, I feel certain that we can still deal with him easily. But what should I do? You must tell me. The king's words tumbled out, and the wizard could tell that he was losing what little control was left him. My sources tell me that he is on his way even as we speak. He must land soon at one of the ports of Alarone. It would be a simple matter to arrest him as he steps ashore. All you need to do, sire, is declare him an outlaw. Yes, of course, that I shall do. Why, he is an outlaw, isn't he? He seeks to pretend a claim to my throne. I shall have him hanged. Very good, your majesty. We can put a detachment in every port. He will be arrested the moment he steps ashore. King Carathal turned, a frown of worry creasing his brow. But how do I know that my orders will be carried out? The prince is a popular hero. Can I trust the loyalty of my own men to arrest him? It is not for just this reason that you retain the services of your brigades. Troops that answer to you alone? The king paled slightly, but appeared to consider the idea. Yes, I could use the guard. I pay them too much as it is. Perhaps it's time I gave them a task. He slowly warmed to the idea. But how do I know they're trustworthy? The Scarlet Guard will follow your orders, said Sindri reassuringly. I brought them to you expressly so that you would have soldiers you could trust implicitly. But the people won't like it, replied the king. Those ogres, especially, make everyone so nervous. In truth, the ogres made the king himself very nervous, which was why he had not used them yet, though he had been paying them for more than two years. At least the Northmen had not bothered Kaladir in the interim. But now he considered using them against one of his own subjects, and this did not seem right. He knew that his people resented his employment of mercenary troops when the fighters of the Fafolk were perfectly capable warriors. Why had he let the wizard convince him to hire them? The people are your subjects, argued Sindri. His voice took on a hardened edge. Will you let them rule the kingdom? I tell you, the guards are your best troops. So you claimed, said the king, when you persuaded me to hire them. Sindri lowered his head modestly. The monarch could not see the gloating light in his eyes. And the lords grow restless, whined the king. They all owe fealty to me, but they don't act like it. I don't trust any of them. They would turn against me at the drop of a hat like that banded O'Rourke in Dernal Forest. That rebel could serve as an example for other traitorous scum. You hold his sister in your dungeon. Why do you not use her as an example? Show what will happen to those who resist your will. King Carathal turned away. 
He did not like to be reminded of the way he had usurped Lord Roark's land. Nor was he completely comfortable with the idea of using the young woman as a lever to obtain his ends. If only O'Roark knew me, he whined. He and his outlaws would see that I have only the best interests of the kingdom at heart. Do not underestimate the extent of the problem, said Sindri calmly. But come, your highness, what of this prince? Will you do as I suggest? Very well, sighed King Carathal. I shall declare the Prince of Corwell an outlaw. The Scarlet Guard will meet him as he lands. They will arrest the usurper and bring him to me in chains. Water pounded and crashed about Tristan, choking him and pressing him down. He kicked and flailed but could not find the surface. He felt his consciousness slipping away, though he struggled even more desperately to swim. He barely felt the vice-like jaws close over his arm, jerking him roughly through the sea. For a second, his face broke free from the black water, and he gulped a great lungful of air. Then he became conscious of the teeth that were sinking through his flesh. Thrashing upward, struggling for more air, the prince felt the grip on his arm slacken. But then he was grabbed by the collar and pulled backward helplessly. Miraculously, his face remained out of the water. He felt a solid object strike him in the back, and he twisted around to catch a long section of planking. The lucky duckling, he thought. As he did so, the grip on his collar broke free, and he turned to find himself face to face with his panting moorhound. Canthus thrashed beside him, finally forcing his forelegs over the plank. Thanks, old dog. He choked, wrapping an arm around the broad neck. You almost ripped my arm off, didn't you, buddy? The presence of the hound warmed his heart, but did little for his hopes. I fear you have only postponed the inevitable, he added, after he had recovered his breath. Dareth! He shouted suddenly. Where was the houndmaster? The bleak, despairing realization crept over him. His friend had drowned, along with Roger and Ponswain. But he couldn't bring himself to believe that the man's cocky self-assurance, his casual energy, had been snuffed out. By the goddess, no! He cried aloud. The feeling that he was doomed would not go away, and he had to grit his teeth and shake his head to dissuade himself from releasing the plank and sinking into oblivion. Through the remainder of the long night, the young man and his dog bobbed, barely alive, across the heaving surface of the strait. Tristan lost consciousness once, only to awaken as Canthus dragged him back to the plank. Frightened and shivering, he nevertheless remained alert after that. He groped to understand the death of the lucky duckling. Black sorcery had killed her, he felt certain. But how? And by whose hand? Over and over again he vowed vengeance against the force that had sought to destroy him. Gradually, his anger began to sustain him. I'm not going to die, he told himself. I'm too mad to die. Gradually, he noticed that the waves grew smaller, and the wind died away almost completely. The swells lessened. Though the crests of the waves still loomed six or eight feet higher than the troughs, they seemed to carry him up and down with an easy and unthreatening rhythm. No longer did they curl over at the top, thundering down to crush anything below them. The horizon lightened to a dull gray, and he peered around for any sight of land or sail or even debris. 
Visibility was still very poor, and he could make out no features beyond the rolling swells. Tristan! He heard the voice as if from a great distance away, and he was certain that he imagined it. Tristan! It repeated. Over here! Now he squinted intently across the gray surface, wondering if he was losing his mind. There! He saw a flash of brightness over the crest of a wave. Dareth! He croaked. He finally saw his friend, and Ponswain too, bobbing across the rolling summit of a wave. The Kalashite was soon kicking toward him, buoyed by an air-filled wineskin and a loose bundle of wood, and dragging a sodden Ponswain behind him. "'Are you injured?' asked Dareth. "'I don't think so. How about you?' "'Just wet and cold.' The Kalashite somehow found the strength to grin. Ponswain's formerly graceful locks hung like a wet blanket across his face. He looked barely alive, and he did not acknowledge the prince's presence. I grunted Tristan, and I've lost the sword of Simmercu. The goddess alone knows how far it is to land from here, or what such land would be. Still, the seas are calming, and it'll be daylight soon. We may even sight to sail. But Dareth didn't look as cheerful as he sounded. Ponswain coughed weakly and struggled to raise himself. His efforts sent the makeshift raft rolling, and everyone scrambled to regain their handholds. Be careful, snapped the prince, as the lord gave him a baleful glare. This is your fault. If you hadn't let that old fool take us in his rot-ridden craft, this would not have happened. That man gave his life for us. Doesn't that mean anything to you? He met the fate he deserved for his incompetence. He failed, and that's all that matters, said Ponswain. But as twilight gave way to dawn and the clouds broke apart, the men saw no sign of anything except the rolling sea. They could tell which direction was east, for there the sun became a rosy glow against the horizon, finally breaking free from the sea to begin its climb into the sky. But that knowledge did them little good, for they had no idea which direction to look for land. What's that? Dareth asked suddenly. Everyone fell silent because they all heard it. A faint rumble seemed to arise from the sea itself. The sound was almost inaudible, but was so deep and powerful that they felt it as much as a vibration in their bones as a sound in their ears. The sound grew in volume and strength until they heard a noise like crashing thunder rolling constantly. The water itself seemed to shake. Suddenly, the surface of the sea turned to foam a scarce hundred yards away from them. Water frothed upward and then rolled away, creating a steady wave that forced them backward. A crenellated parapet, like the top of a tower, burst through the surface and sent spray and waves crashing away from it. Another, and then a third, exploded from the sea, thrusting skyward like gigantic lances. And then the foaming water spilled away to reveal a vast surface of smooth stone. A glowing rosy hue shone from a wall as the thing caught the rays of the morning sun. More walls and a gate, and more towers continued to rise for a minute, until the vast object came to rest, seeming to sit upon the surface of the sea. Tristan, Dareth, and Ponswain, bobbing in the water and gaping in awe, stared at the most magnificent castle that they had ever seen. It stood motionless, vast 
and imposing, like a monument to some forgotten air of grandness. Water spilled down its vast sides, thinning into a soft mist that floated around them. Tendrils of seaweed hung from the crenellated parapet, draping across the sides. The whole structure was oddly silent, as if mere sound could not convey the grandness of its arrival, nor the majesty of its appearance. And, too, there was warmth flowing from the edifice. Not a physical warmth, but a spiritual sense of power and majesty. Each of them felt this magical emanation as both welcoming and foreboding. The castle remained, and they knew they had no choice but to enter. Here, lady, wood! Smiling broadly, the man dumped a huge pile of twigs and dried wood at Robin's feet. Thank you, Acorn, she replied, warily meeting his gaze. She had taken to calling the man after the seed of the oak tree, for he could not remember any name of his own. The name seemed to suit him. His nature was childlike, but Robin sensed that he harbored a deep inner strength. She wanted to nurture that strength, to see him grow. At the same time, she was still a little afraid of him. You did very well, she added, embarrassed by the way he beamed at the praise. Now, if you will fetch some water so I can rinse these linens, we can take a rest. Eagerly, Acorn scrambled toward the silver ribbon of bubbling water that ran through Jenna's grove, only to pause and return sheepishly. Forget buckets, he explained, chuckling over and over as if it were some great joke. As the days had passed, the scraggly stranger had grown more lucid and helpful. He was stronger than an average man, and had skills that were useful in tending the grove. All of which were very helpful, Robin thought with a twinge of worry, for Jenna's illness had grown suddenly worse. She had spent the past few days in bed, tossing deliriously in the depths of a fever, barely rational, Newt had not spent much time in the grove either. He had taken long excursions throughout the Vale, even visiting the Fens occasionally. Today, he had gone off to seek Grunt's company, almost certainly to annoy the old bear. Grunt had a notoriously short temper, and Newt delighted in driving the animal into a rage with his sudden spells of invisibility. Robin thought again about Acorn. He was friendly and almost pathetically grateful for any praise she gave him. But more and more, the man raised shudders of uneasiness within her. One minute, he seemed harmless, and the next minute, she was afraid of him. But she did not know why. Here, lady, hear water! Proudly, Acorn returned with two sloshing buckets. He set them down at Robin's feet as she thanked him, bobbing his head up and down eagerly. She quickly rinsed the light blankets and hung them to dry. Well-practiced motions as Jenna's sweaty fever necessitated frequent linen changes. She tried to ignore the feeling that Acorn's eyes were boring into her back as she stretched to reach the clothesline. Come along now she said as he followed at her heels. Why don't we go and sit by the pond? I have some carrots and apples that we can have for lunch. They walked across Jenna's garden, a lush field of wild flowers and herbs. In the center of the garden was a broad pond with a grassy island at its heart. In places, the sandy bottom of the pond was smooth, perfect for swimming. Elsewhere, Lily pads spread across the surface, home to myriad frogs and turtles. Great white swans swam regally among them. Robin thought again, as she beheld the scene, that it must be the most beautiful place in the world. As they approached the pond, the water swirled momentarily, and then the smooth bridge of sand rose to the surface. 
She took no notice of the phenomenon, so accustomed to the ways of the grove was she. But Acorn hesitated. Come on, she encouraged, stepping onto the firm bridge. Reluctantly, he followed her to the island while she selected a smooth place for their lunch. She sat comfortably on the soft bank, stretching her legs over the water and kicking her feet to relieve her taut muscles. Acorn settled slowly, almost reverently, beside her. She noticed uneasily that the look on his face was no longer one of innocence. Instead, he looked as though he struggled to conceal some secret thought. Here, she said to cover her nervousness, have an apple. Acorn took the fruit and chomped greedily into it, ignoring the pieces that scattered in his beard or sprayed into the air. In seconds, he had finished and reached forward to snatch another from the basket on Robin's lap. She ate absently, suddenly aware of Acorn's closeness. She felt uncomfortable but didn't want to offend him by moving away. Turning to look at him, she was startled to see him staring intently at her face. His eyes were clear, but they seemed to burn with a frightening intensity. Lady, you like me? My friend? Still, that burning gaze. Yes, Acorn. Of course I like you. Haven't I? I mean you. He cut her off awkwardly. Lady, you are my lady. Suddenly, his hand reached out to clasp her thigh. He leaned quickly forward to force her backward onto the ground, his mouth seeking hers. No! Get off me! She screamed, pushing against him and rolling to the side. Mine! He cried, scrambling forward on all fours to lunge at her before she could stand. She punched him in the face, but he still tackled her, his eyes gleaming madly. He pinned her to the ground and grasped a handful of her gown. Terror galvanized Robin, and once again she twisted free. But this time, he ripped half her garment away. He paused, staring stupidly, and in that split second she recalled a piece of her training. A fast, simple spell. Stop! The command was a physical attack, slamming into the crazed man and holding him in place, poised to leap. Slowly, the light of madness died in his eyes. She stared at him in hatred and anger. She wanted to strike him or kick him to somehow cause him pain. But something... Perhaps it was pity for his degraded state stayed her hand. She was shaking with fright and tension and rage, and she didn't even want to look at him again. Gasping, she gathered her gown about her and stumbled toward the cottage, leaving him bound by the spell. Come on! Tristan was propelling himself toward the castle, even before Dareth spoke too surprised to wonder if the grand structure was illusion or reality. Canthus and Ponswain swam beside them, their weariness forgotten. Soon the men and the dog reached the foot of the massive, smoothly hewn wall. The shining pink surface rose straight into the air above them and seemed to continue underwater, as far as they could see. Rosy quartz! muttered the Kalashite. There'll be no climbing in here. Where? began the prince, dismayed at the thought of succor so close at hand, yet possibly unreachable. Let's try the gate, suggested Dareth, swimming easily along the base of the wall. Ponswain followed, while Tristan and Canthus sputtered and splashed in the rear. The Kalashite reached the gate first. The prince watched him rise slowly from the water, pulling him gradually up the wall. With a supple swing, the Kalashite carried himself over the gate and out of Tristan's sight. 
Tristan heard nothing for a few seconds, but then the portal began to drop with a steady creaking. In a moment, he could see his friend operating the smooth iron winch that patiently fed Chain to the lowering gate. In another moment, Tristan, Ponswain, and Campus had pulled themselves onto the flattened entryway and squirmed quickly into the castle proper. Is it real? asked the lord. I don't know, replied the prince, unconsciously whispering. A sense of awe possessed him. The rosy stonework of the castle was bathed in a pale mist shot through by slanting rays of early morning sunlight. The place was mystical yet somehow welcoming. This place is amazing, commented Dareth, looking around at the high balconies, ornate columns, and sweeping stairways that surrounded the small courtyard before them. What is it? I remember a legend I heard once. I was just a child, so I can't vouch for the details. Ponswain said slowly, his voice unusually subdued. It was about a young queen, bride of Q. I think her name was Allison. The king erected a mighty castle full of wondrous towers and lofty balconies for her as his wedding gift. But she died soon after they were married. This was why Q did not leave an heir. The king was so distraught by her death, Ponswain continued, that he ordered the castle to become her tomb. It stood upon a tiny island between Gwyneth and Alarone, and, with the aid of the great druids of all the isles, he commanded the castle to sink below the waves, forever hiding and preserving the resting place of his beloved. The very stone feels sacred, said Dareth, like a shrine. Legends tell of fishermen and sailors occasionally sighting a castle here in the strait, but none have been verified. I don't recall hearing about it happening during my lifetime. Conswain still spoke with quiet reverence. How do you know so much about this? "'asked the prince, surprised at Pontswain's knowledge. "'I listen to the bards,' said the lord simply. "'That's fascinating. "'I've only heard vague stories about a castle in the sea. "'Never the details.' "'What good will it do us?' snapped Pontswain. "'If the legends are true, "'the castle will stay here for a few hours and then sink.' We'll be right back in the water. Let's find something to float on, then, suggested Dareth, pragmatically turning to look around them. Shallow pools of water covered most of the surface, and strands of seaweed lay everywhere. Here and there a fish lay still, gills widespread, or flopped out its last strength on the hard stones. Across the courtyard, a mist-enshrouded stairway rose toward a balcony or entryway. The fog parted enough to give them a look at a pair of huge doors. Let's check inside, suggested the Kalashite. We might find something we can use as a raft. Or a weapon. They reached the balcony and saw a pair of huge doors made of solid oak, strapped with gleaming bronze and uncorroded by their immersion in the brine. We might as well try these first, muttered the Kalashite, looking pessimistically at the massive portals. A whirling blur of green was Tristan's first warning of attack. A savage shape slashed outward from the shadow of one of the columns. Look out! cried the prince, bounding backward. Dareth dove forward and somersaulted out of the creature's path. Tristan saw that the attacker was a human-like creature covered with green scales. 
wide gills gaped like wounds in its neck. And on the top of its head, trailing in a line down its backbone, was an array of barbed spikes. Wide, white eyes hung open like some ghastly blinding affliction. But the creature leaped after Dareth as if it could see very well. Its wide mouth gaped, displaying row after row of needle-like teeth. Webbed hands, studded with long, curving claws, sought the flesh of the calashite, while similar feet slapped across the wet stone. It wore only an oiled belt, and several silver bracelets lined its arms. Carrying a spear-like weapon, it moved haltingly, as if unaccustomed to movement outside of the sea. A second monster moved forward on the heels of its companion, but Campus lunged at this one and carried it to the floor. Clawed, webbed, hands sank into the moorhound's flanks, but Campus's white fangs drove toward the throat of the thing. The first attacker whirled around, turning suddenly to strike at Tristan with a long trident. The three-pronged fork nearly cut the prince's chest, but at the last moment, Ponswain darted forward. The trident caught the lord on the temple, and Ponswain crashed like a stone to the ground. Tristan stared into the monster's face, the least human aspect of its appearance. It was a fish face. The blank eyes and gaping maw belonged upon no other animal. Canthus yelped as his opponent succeeded in pushing the dog to the side. But then the moorhound growled and lunged into the attack. The pair rolled several times across the wet stones, neither gaining a clear advantage. The monster attacking the two men darted forward aggressively, flicking its trident first at one, then the other. His weariness forgotten, the prince crouched to face the monster. We'll do it same as we got the Northmen. He panted to Dareth. The Kalishite remembered that battle well. Ready, he answered quickly. Tristan darted to the side and the trident followed him. At the same time, Dareth dove and rolled. The creature swung his weapon back, but it passed cleanly over the Kalishite, who came out of his roll to smash his head into the creature's midriff. Tristan dashed at the monster, and now both of its opponents were closer than the dangerous end of the weapon. The prince seized the wooden haft and wrested the trident from the creature's grip as Dareth tackled it. Dareth lay across the monster's abdomen as its claws dug into his back. Tristan dropped his knees upon the thing's chest and then brought the heft of the trident down heavily, upon its neck. He heard the cracking of bone. The monster's eyes bulged briefly outward before it stiffened and died. The prince leaped to his feet, ready to run to the aid of his dog, but Canthus arose from the body of the other fishman and shook himself. His wounds did not look too deep. Ponswain? Tristan asked, kneeling beside the motionless lord. He saw that the man was breathing, but his eyes were closed. A deep purple bruise spread across his temple and cheek. What happened? Dareth asked, joining Tristan. He saved my life. At least, he took a blow intended for me. Perhaps I underestimated him. More likely, he didn't think it through before he acted, suggested the Kalashite. What were those things? Tristan asked, after determining that Dareth was not hurt seriously either. I've never seen them before, but I've heard about creatures like them called Sahuagin. They're supposed to live under water. Sometimes they come out to raid ships or land. They're very bloodthirsty. You won't get any argument out of me. Though the fight had drained him physically, Tristan began to feel more confident than he had since they had taken to the water. At least we're armed now, mused Dareth, 
picking up the trident of the second Sahuagin. They gently moved Ponswain into a small alcove in the wall of the keep, out of sight from the main courtyard. They could do no more for him at the moment. The keep, then, the prince suggested. They stepped forward and each grasped one of the huge bronze rings hanging from the doors. To their amazement, each of the heavy portals swung smoothly open. Before them, they saw a long hall with scattered pools of water on the stone floor and several pairs of doors along either wall. Then they fell. With the first shock, Tristan thought that the castle had begun to sink again. But he quickly saw that only he, Dareth, and Canthus were falling, not the entire castle. They plummeted down a wide shaft, a trap that had been triggered when they opened the doors to the keep, Tristan realized. Abruptly, they smashed into a pool of cold water, hitting the surface with stunning force. Tristan felt the trident slip from his hands as he struggled to reach the surface. Dareth and Canthus quickly surfaced beside him, Dareth still holding his trident. Gasping and choking, it was all Tristan could do to simply stay afloat. That was stupid, coughed the Kalashite. I should have seen that from a mile away. Damn my carelessness. Let's find a way out of here, said the prince. And don't blame yourself, I didn't notice anything either. They were in a small cavern, about thirty feet across. The smooth walls were far too steep to climb, and offered no doors or other passages. I'd say we've been caught, growled the Kalashite. Far from Jehenna, there existed a region of peace and healing a land where the god grows mightier from acts of virtue and kindness, not murder. This deity, like Behal, had worshippers through the realms and all the other planes of the universe as well. Her name was Chanti, goddess of agriculture and growth. She was the patron of all things whole and healthy. Chanti had great concentrations of power in many lands, places where her clerics preached the doctrine of her faith to all. These lands, without exception, benefited from her benign nature. And in other places, where Chanti was not all-powerful or even universally known, she sent her missionaries to bring the words and acts of her faith. One of these places was the Moonshays. Chapter 5 The Dead Queen The black water seemed to penetrate Tristan's flesh with freezing numbness. His arms grew leaden from the constant motion of treading water. He knew that he would die in this castle, for there seemed to be no way out of the trap. Dim rays of sunlight filtered down the long shaft, which opened into the ceiling of the chamber. The ceiling was a dome made of rough-hewn stone all the way to the water, where it surrounded the prisoners. For the twentieth time, Dareth took a breath and dove. The prince watched his companion's feet drive him down, and Tristan floated anxiously, counting the seconds. Surely no man could hold his breath for that long. But the Kalashite eventually returned to the surface with an explosive splash floating on his back for a moment as he recovered his breath. A feeble shake of his head answered Tristan's question. Nothing, he finally gasped. It's solid rock all the way around and deeper than I can dive. Save your strength, said the prince, acutely aware of the ebbing of his own endurance. The great dog, Canthus, swam in circles, and Tristan knew that the moorhound could not remain afloat for long. "'Get over to the side,' suggested Dareth, propelling himself to the stone wall with easy strokes. "'If you can find something to hold on to, you won't get quite so tired.' 
Numbly, Tristan did as he was told, finding a few rough niches in the rock wall that were sufficient to give him fingertip holds. At least he could keep his head out of the water without exerting himself. We can't die here. Dareth suddenly swore. We won't, said Tristan. Suddenly, his foot slipped into a hole in the wall, and he felt a tug of current clamp around it. Forcefully, he pushed himself away, breaking free to gasp several lungfuls of air. There's a hole in the wall, he finally managed to choke out. I felt a current pulling my foot in. The Kalashite shot past Tristan, swimming like a seal, and instantly dove to investigate the spot. He remained submerged for a full minute before slipping to the surface. It's an outlet, he said, grinning weakly. I've widened it some. In a few more minutes, we'll have a way out. Dareth rested against the wall for a moment, while Canthus swam between them, seeming to sense their hope. "'Where does the outlet go?' Tristan asked. "'It could be way under the surface.' "'No. The water flows from this room into that area, so the water level in there must be lower than it is in here.' "'What if it's a water-filled pipe?' challenged Tristan. Then we'll all drown, and no one will ever know what happened to us, said the Kalashite simply. Dareth dove once again, and this time Tristan counted the seconds, stopping only after he reached one hundred. Still, his companion didn't surface. The prince moved closer, certain that the Kalashite was in serious trouble. Finally, Dareth splashed to the surface, drawing in large gulps of air. "'It's ready,' he said. "'I couldn't see any light on the far side, but I could hear splashing. "'That probably means there's an airspace. "'Shall we try it?' "'Naturally,' Tristan said. "'I'll go first. "'Good,' said the Kalashite. "'I'll send Canthus through after you. "'Try to keep track of him if you can.' See you on the other side, said the prince. Wishing he had spent more time learning to swim, he dove toward the hole, surprised at how large it had grown. The water-saturated stone must have been considerably eroded, for Dareth had kicked a large amount of it away. The current swept Tristan through, and only his hands, held out before him, deflected his head from a solid stone wall. The current swept him down through a narrow bottleneck and into a chute that was full of foaming water. He slid downward, but the sides of the chute were gentle, and he quickly scrambled out of the water, coming to a stop upon a slopping slab of rock. The water rushed by a few feet down the slope. The prince barely had time to notice the dim illumination in this tunnel. It seemed to come from above him before he saw Canthus bobbing madly. "'Here, dog!' he cried, slipping into the water to seize the panicked moorhound by his broad neck. Twisting desperately against the force of the current, he wrestled the dog onto shore a dozen feet farther down the chute from his original stopping place. Dareth soon burst from the tight underground passage and crawled nimbly from the water to sit beside them. Somehow, he had managed to carry the trident with him through the twisting tunnel. Not bad, he remarked. Now where to from here? Up, said the prince. He pointed to the shaft he had examined in the last few minutes. It was the source of the light that seeped into the tunnel and sloped upward at a relatively shallow angle. I'll bet that leads to the keep. Indeed, nodded the Kalashite, and the water from our trap is not the whole source of this stream. See how the water flows from farther into the castle? Dareth gestured beyond the passageway they had emerged from, and Tristan saw the underground stream merging far into the subterranean darkness. Hist! 
Dareth whispered, quickly gesturing up the slope of the chute. They stared downstream, and gradually, Tristan saw movement against the water. A column of creatures was slowly moving upstream. The band drew closer, and Tristan recognized the Sahuagin. They moved menacingly upstream in the shallow chute, arcing through the water like salmon returning to the spawning pools. Several of the sea creatures stood before the rest, keenly peering about the tunnel while the others swam past. Then another group would take up the guard, farther upstream, while the last dove into the water and splashed ahead. The creatures, Tristan counted at least two dozen, slid past them about forty feet away. The light from the tunnel was at its most intense against the water nearest them, so they hoped that the Sahuagin lookouts would be blinded to their presence in the shadows. One of the leering fish men took up the watch at the very foot of the slope where they hid. Its bulbous eyes seemed to see into every niche and cranny as it slowly pivoted its broad head. Its gaze passed the trio and then swung back. For a long moment, they peered into the darkness around them. Then the eyes passed to the front of the column, and the Sahuagin leaped in with its fellows. Soon the band of monsters had moved out of sight. Let's go, the prince finally whispered, and they crawled from their hiding hole. Crouching, they moved along the slope toward the mouth of the shaft leading upward. I'll go first, whispered Tristan. Dareth was by far the better climber, and the Kalashite, at the rear, would have a better chance of catching the prince or the hound if either should slip. Tristan leaned forward into the shaft, which was about four feet in diameter, and seemed to climb at an angle halfway between horizontal and vertical. The rock inside was slick but rough, and he was able to pull himself along using awkward handholds. Bracing his knees, he forced his torso upward and found higher handholds. He neared the top after several minutes, his knees bruised and his fingernails cracked. Suddenly, his hand slipped from a wet knob of rock, and he started to slide back down the pipe. He arched his back instinctively and wedged himself to a stop with his back against the top of the shaft and his hands and knees against the bottom. The rough rocks slashed his skin and salt stung his wounds, but he did not lose much of his hard-earned height. Pausing a moment to regain his breath, he inched his way upward again and finally crawled out the top of the shaft. Tristan lay perfectly still upon the floor of a corridor. Solid iron doors lined one wall, and the surfaces of the walls were rough-hewn. The corridor was well lighted, for high above him were several narrow windows. In another minute, Canthus lunged from the shaft, closely followed by Dareth. They all rested briefly, while the two men looked for possible avenues of escape. That way? suggested the Kalashite, looking to the right. It seems to go up, agreed Tristan. They got to their feet and slowly moved up the corridor. The iron door stood in the left wall, spaced about thirty feet apart. No sound came from any of the rooms. Draped in seaweed, the first door was pocked with rust. Let me test that, suggested the prince. He stepped forward and selected a pair of bars that seemed the most corroded. Gripping one in each hand, he flexed the muscles of his broad shoulders, clenching his teeth with the effort. Slowly, the two bars spread apart until one of them broke off at its base. The resulting opening was just wide enough for them to squeeze through. Nice work, Dareth whispered. With his trident extended before him, he stepped over to the door to the outside and looked through one of the cracks. 
He blinked in pain as the bright light assaulted his eyes, but soon he could make out enough detail to see where they were. That's the courtyard, he said softly. We're not far from the doors we were trying to open when we fell into the trap. That door, he pointed to the other exit from the guard room, seems to lead into the rest of the keep. The Kalashite led the way again, this time with Canthus at his side, and they squeezed through the narrow entrance without pushing the door farther open. It'll squeak for sure, he explained. They entered a chamber that was illuminated by sunlight streaming in through narrow windows set high in the wall. Tall columns lined the vast room, supporting heavy wooden beams that seemed somehow to have escaped the corrosive effects of their long submergence. A wide hallway opened into the far side of the room, leading into the depths of the castle, while a smaller opening branched to the left. This must have been a grand ballroom or receiving hall, said Tristan, unconsciously whispering. Never in his life had he seen such an awesome sight. Should we check on Pont Swain? asked Dareth, suddenly remembering their unconscious companion. Tristan shrugged. He's as safe as we are. Suddenly, the floor rumbled slightly beneath them, and the prince's heart leaped. Was the castle about to sink? But the rumbling ceased, and the castle did not seem to be moving. We've got to get out of here soon, said Tristan. I haven't seen anything we could use as a boat or even a raft, said Dareth. There's a lot more to this castle, it seems. Maybe we can find something in here. Tristan started across the vast hall, peering around the heavy columns that lined two of the walls. Canthus accompanied him, while Dareth checked the other side toward the wide hallway. The prince approached the narrow corridor to the left. There's a stairway over here, called Dareth, his loud whisper carrying easily through the hall. See anything? Not yet. Tristan paused before the narrow corridor. He could hardly keep himself from entering it immediately. He was vaguely aware of Dareth investigating the stairway. And then Tristan was in the hallway, walking away from the great hall. He had not consciously decided to do so, yet he knew that he was going the right direction. Dareth was suddenly forgotten as he picked up his pace, hurrying toward his unknown but beckoning destination. He stepped under a narrow stone arch and walked down another short corridor. Canthus followed, silently vigilant. Before him stood a similar arch, and beyond that was a well-illuminated room. The light seemed softer than the sunlight that streamed into the windows of the castle, however. Intrigued, Tristan passed under the second arch to find himself in a round room. Its ceiling was a dome inlaid with gold, and its walls bore carvings of startling complexity, depicting woodland scenes and pastoral farmlands. The detailed etchings had remained clean and sharp, even after centuries underwater. But the dominant feature of the room was in its center, where a long glass case rested upon a solid, almost altar-like base. Cool white light emerged from the top of the case. Its sides were masked by plush purple curtains that hung inside the glass, Tristan moved forward, all danger forgotten. Stumbling slightly at the nearly hypnotic sight, he reached the side of the case and looked in, and almost cried out in sadness. 
The case itself seemed to glow with a soft, unearthly radiance. Tristan saw a young, frail woman. Her delicate face was impossibly beautiful, and long golden tresses spread from her head, cushioning her. She was dressed in a plain gown, embroidered very faintly with gold thread. Her skin was so light as to be translucent. Her eyes were closed, and she lay perfectly still, as she must have lain for centuries. So beautiful, thought Tristan, and so long dead. Then she moved. Dareth sprang up a long flight of stairs. A feeling of urgency gripped him, but nowhere did he see anything that would serve them as a raft. He knew Tristan still searched the great hall, but he didn't dare risk calling to his friend. The stairs ended in a long balcony, with hallways running into the distance to either side. He saw several open doorways that led to the balcony, and he looked quickly into each room as he jogged toward the right-hand hallway. This upper floor was well illuminated by narrow windows, though the interiors of the room were rather dark. Still, he saw nothing but wreckage in each chamber. The doors had apparently long since rotted away, and likewise any furniture that they had contained was now nothing but damp rot. He heard a sound in one room as he ran past, and he thought that he might have seen a flash of movement. Dareth immediately flattened himself against the wall outside of that room, holding his trident poised to strike. His alertness was rewarded as another of the Sahu again bounded through the doorway, its dead fish eyes blinking warily down the corridor. Before it could react, Dareth thrust his weapon savagely at the monster's throat. The Sahuagin's gills flared in rage, but the middle point of the weapon caught it squarely in the neck. The Kalashite pressed it remorselessly across the hall as the monster's webbed hands grasped at the shaft of the trident. It started to twist away, but then the wall opposite the doorway stopped its retreat. Dareth felt the tip of the weapon puncture the thing's scaly skin. Red, oily fish blood spurted from its neck as the monster slowly slumped to the ground. It flopped reflexively several times and then lay still. Dareth looked cautiously around but saw no other signs of movement. Quickly, he turned and continued his rapid journey down the corridor. For a minute, he jogged past rooms like those he had seen earlier. But then he stopped. His instincts had apparently been correct, for he now stood before a solid, varnished door of heavy oak. A silver key plate, untarnished by the sea, seemed to beckon his tools. With another look around, Dareth knelt before the door and pulled a thin probe from his belt. Placing his ear next to the silver plate, he carefully pushed and poked with the stiff wire. One minute later, he was rewarded by a sharp click. He pushed on the door and it swung smoothly open. The room within was dry and it contained more treasure than he had ever seen in his life. Crystal lanterns lit the room in a silky white glow. Golden and silver plates were stacked on the floor, and jeweled candelabra awaited their waxen charges, scintillating in the magical illumination. Several crowns lay on the floor, each studded with more gems than the Kalashite had ever seen. A scattering of gold coins lay like a carpet across the floor, and bits of leather, crystal and shining metal, suggested even more treasures buried in the coins. His eyes were drawn to a weapon, and his jaw dropped as he recognized his own scimitar. 
It can't be, he told himself, but the weapon was unmistakable. He noticed a sword next to it and picked it up, fairly certain that it was Ponswain's weapon. Though he looked for the sword of Simmer Q, there was no sign of Tristan's blade in the room. He casually kicked aside some of the coins and discovered a pair of soft gloves that looked like they were the right size. On impulse, the Kalashite put down the sword and pulled on the gloves. They immediately lightened in color until they exactly matched the hue of his skin. Each fingertip even had an artificial fingernail. Someone would have to look very closely to see that he wore anything upon his hands. They were smooth and warm and quite comfortable. Then he noticed another piece of leather, nearly buried by the coins, and he pulled free a smooth, tightly sewn sack. He saw another just like it and picked that one up too. With luck, their flotation problem would be solved by these. Gathering his belongings, he left the room. The door locked behind him. With a sense of profound wonder, Tristan watched the woman rise. She sat up slowly, and for the first time the prince realized that the glass case had no top. She opened her eyes, and though her skin was pale as death, her eyes were deep brown, rich and loving. Then she smiled, and Tristan's knees buckled from the beauty of her face. Unwittingly, he knelt before her, forced to drop his eyes in wonder. My lady, he gasped. She studied him curiously, extending her hand and then speaking quietly. My husband, have you come for me? But then her voice trailed off and she stared at the prince for a full minute. When she spoke again, her voice was more confident. Rise, my prince, and step forward. Her voice was even more lovely than her smile. Dumbly, Tristan rose and moved hesitantly to the side of the case. This shall be yours again until you find its true bearer. She held forth an object that had been by her side. Tristan's senses returned as he saw the object that she extended toward him, hilt first. She offered him the sword of Simmer Q, the sword that had been lost when his boat sank. How she came to hold the weapon, the prince did not try to guess, but he took it reverently and kneeled of his own will. You are Queen Allison, he guessed. I do not know why you have performed for me this great miracle, but my sword shall be yours to command for the rest of my days. For a moment, her exquisite face looked sad. Alas, but I am far beyond the need for swords. This tomb is all the protection I will ever need. She sighed and Tristan's heart nearly broke. But you shall have need of that sword, and very soon, she continued. Which is why, of course, I returned it to you. You did lose it, didn't you? Yes, forever I thought. Do not say that. You cannot have any idea how long forever is. The rebuke was in words only, for her tone was still gentle. You are here for a reason, Prince, and I shall tell you what that reason is, so you may leave. You haven't much time, you know. As Tristan nodded, she continued. You have a destiny laid upon you, Prince Tristan Kendrick of Corwell, and it is mine to tell you what that destiny is. That is why, of course, 
your sword was returned. Her voice grew solemn and serious. The realms of the Fafok are to be united again, as they were by my husband, Simmer Q. They are to be united in your time and in your presence. Now, this is the destiny I shall lay upon you. You are to find the next High King of the Fafok, the one who will rule our people into a new age. You are to find him, and your sword shall become his. Tristan's heart pounded at her words. To see the Fafok united again under a strong High King, to find the one who would be that High King. He proudly gripped the sword of Simracu and raised his head to meet the eyes of the dead queen, though he still knelt before her. This I shall do, my lady, for the rest of my life, if need be. But tell me, how shall I know this king? You shall know him with your heart, but you may better find him by knowing these things. His name shall be Simric, and he will bear that sword. His destiny will carry him many places. He shall fly above the earth, even as he delves into depths. Wind and fire, earth and sea, all shall fight for him. When it is time for him to claim his throne. She finished speaking and appeared to grow very tired. Tristan sprang to his feet, only to see her lie again in the case. Her body reposed in the internal stillness of death. The mustering of the Scarlet Guard was a thing spectacular in sound and sight, fearful to behold. The citizens of Caladir scurried into the nearest buildings as the king's mercenaries assembled in the heart of the town. Each of the four brigades of the guard gathered in its own quarter of the city and then marched toward the great open square that stood below the towering majesty of Ker Caladir. All the towers of the castle streamed with pennants proclaiming the proud emblem of each of the dozen companies in the force. First, three brigades of human mercenaries, battle-hardened soldiers, marched in tight formation into the square standing at attention around three of the four sides. Each member of these brigades, composed of three companies each, wore a cloak of blazing scarlet and a tall helmet plumed with crimson feathers. Their weapons were clean and gleamed in the midday sun. Fierce, implacable warriors, these human mercenaries were feared along the length of the Sword Coast. No crime was too heinous, no murderous or rapine task too hateful for the Scarlet Guard to take on. But none of these three brigades could match, in might or in terror, the reputation of the fourth brigade. King Carathal stood upon the rampart of Ker Caladir with his close adviser, the wizard Sindri, beside him. His pulse raced at the spectacle before him. Oh, I say, this is simply splendid. They look so... His majesty groped for the right word. So... military. Indeed, sire, nodded the sorcerer. Sindri was pleased at the sight as well, but did not reveal his emotions quite as openly as did his master. Hmm, isn't there supposed to be one more? King Carathal was busy recounting the troops before them. I believe the Ogre Brigade is arriving soon, Your Majesty. The ground shook underfoot as the tromp of heavy footsteps pounded the street. There was no sign of any citizen of Caladir now, as there was no mistaking the source of that mighty cadence. The Ogre Brigade marched as a long column into the square, thumping steadily to the place of honor before the castle. The Ogres stood at attention, but it was obvious that they were not particularly skilled at this, 
though they excelled at shuffling, spitting, grunting, and nose-picking. Each of the great brutes stood at least eight feet tall, with crooked trunk-like legs and a stocky, stooping body. Their faces were bestial, with long foreheads that sloped down to beady, glaring eyes. Broad noses flared upward, revealing wide nostrils and even wider mouths. Wicked tusks extended from the corners of those mouths. These brutal monsters came from every corner of the realms, gathered and disciplined, barely by the good pay of their human commanders. And in truth, ogres were well suited to the needs of the guard. Huge, fearless fighters, they could crush any band of humans that dared to stand before them, and would as easily spit a child upon a spear as an opposing swordsman. The ogres relished the tasks of the guard, for killing and mayhem were their most basic desires. The missions of the brigade gave them an opportunity to do both. Somehow, I never realized that there were quite so many of them, said the king hesitantly. They really make up quite a force, don't they? Indeed, your majesty, they are an army mightier than any upon the moonshays, and they will do your bidding alone. The wizard smirked a little as he said it. We had better send them off, hadn't we? blurted the king. You do think they'll catch him, don't you? I'm certain they will, sire. The Prince of Corwell shall have a very short visit to Alarone. A very short visit, indeed. Teacher, I'm frightened. Robin spoke quietly, not certain that Jenna was awake. The great druid lay muffled in a down quilt, though the day was warm. Her steady breathing was her only sign of life. It's Acorn, Robin continued, pulling her shawl more tightly across her shoulders at the vivid memories. As far as she knew, the stranger was still spellbound, standing stupidly beside the pond. Nevertheless, she had latched the door of the cottage when she entered, for she knew that the spell would eventually lose its potency. Jenna's eyes flickered open, and she turned to gaze intently at her pupil. Her gray hair pulled back from her face, emphasized her severe expression. She struggled to sit up, and Robin helped her, placing pillows behind her back. Evil, she hissed. She stared at Robin, but it seemed to her that the great druid actually looked right through her. He is evil, she said again. It was the most articulate statement she had made in many days. Acorn, Robin said. But I thought, oh, Jenna, what should I do? Help me. This time, the older woman looked at her niece with an intensity that made Robin squirm. Jenna coughed once, a dry, rasping sound, before she spoke again. You must kill him. Behal watched the heart of Kasgaroth carefully, feeling its thrumming power. The shred of the beast had begun its work. Soon, now, the task would be complete. He took note of the feeble earth magic of the druid and sneered. Her strength and the might of her dying goddess could not hope to stand against him, as he had demonstrated upon Alarone. There he had commanded his cleric to destroy the druids. Hobarth had used the ambitious wizard to help, even convincing Sindri that the plan was the sorcerer's own idea. One by one, the druids of Alarone had died, drawn out by Hobarth's power, slain by magic or the cold steel of the assassin's blade. 
Their mutilated bodies had been used to pollute and defile the moon wells from which they drew so much of their power. That power was now broken forever. The next to fall would be the druids of Gwyneth, the keepers of Mirlock Vale. Chapter 6 Alaron The sound of Canthus barking savagely brought Tristan back to his senses. Immediately, he felt the tremors in the floor below him. He staggered forward, turning to run like a drunk from Queen Allison's tomb, as the marble surface heaved and rocked. He charged down the short corridor and into the great hall beyond. Canthus bounded before him, racing for a great double door leading to the courtyard. Dareth had just reached the door. Tristan saw that he now carried a sword. All I could find, he gasped as Tristan ran to his side, helping to pull open the huge portal. His eyes widened at the sight of the sword of Simmer-Q, girded again at the prince's side. But the Kalashite said nothing. The castle shook once more, sending them stumbling. The door creaked open stubbornly. Tristan was about to run through the door when Dareth's voice halted him. Wait! The Kalashite probed the flagstones before them with his trident. The iron barbs clunked against the surface several times, and Tristan was startled by a sudden click. Two sections of floor gave way, swinging freely inward to reveal a long, dark shaft. Uneasily, the prince stepped back. Same kind of trap. The Kalashite smiled ruefully. He stepped nimbly along the side of the pit. The prince jumped after him and made it through the door with no difficulty. They found Pont Swain where they had left him. The lord was sitting up rubbing the bruised side of his face. "'Where did you go?' he demanded. "'Leaving me to—' "'Shut up!' barked the prince, then looked a bit sheepish. "'Um, thanks, you know, for helping me out in there.' The lord looked surprised but offered no argument. Instead, he climbed unsteadily to his feet. The castle was beginning to sink— Already water was pouring through the gate. They had left the outer portal down after entering, and the seawater now rushed into the courtyard through the wide opening. They stood upon the balcony outside the keep, five steps up from the courtyard itself, and watched the water slowly climb the stairs. "'There's no way we can fight the current through the gate,' said Dareth. We might as well wait until it comes over the walls and hope that we can float out. Here, fill this with air, said Dareth, handing each of them a leather sack. This is how we'll float. Skeptically, Tristan took the bag and blew a lungful of air into it. The bag barely puffed out. Again and again he breathed enough air to fill the bag several times over. It has a leak, he said, looking quickly at the rising water. Dareth blew into his bag. That's what I thought at first, but they are holding all the air we've blown into them. How? said Tristan, looking at the limp sack. These are magical bags. I found them in the castle treasure room. They will hold a lot more than their size would indicate. Now keep blowing. Still doubtful, they nonetheless continued, trying to inflate the bags. Slowly, Tristan's began to grow, and finally it was reasonably firm. Dareth took a length of twine from his belt pouch and lashed the three sacks together tightening the line about the mouths of the bags. In another minute, the water had reached the level of the balcony. Soon they stood waist-deep in water. 
The bags rose beside them as the water lifted them off the ground, and Tristan was surprised at how buoyant they were. Soon the men were carried from their feet, but they floated easily into the courtyard. They were even able to support Canthus with their makeshift floats. The water inside the courtyard was within six feet of the top of the wall, when seawater poured over the ramparts. Crushing waves now roiled around them, threatening to tear the bags from their grip. Desperately holding on, Tristan tried to see if Canthus was still with them, but he lost sight of everything but the bag under his hands and the water. As more of the sea poured into the courtyard, the surface slowly calmed and Tristan was relieved to see that Canthus, Dareth, and Ponswain were still hanging on. In no time, they were floating easily again. Still no sign of a sail, said Dareth. I guess this puts us about where we were this morning. Not exactly, said Tristan. I've got the sword of Simmer Q again. He debated telling them of the prophecy of the dead queen but a look at Ponswain's suspicious face told him he should not. Perhaps later he would tell Dareth. Master, we must discuss a problem. Must we discuss it now, Cryphon? I am very tired. His Majesty was most petulant today. Sindri turned from the mirror to regard Cryphon. The master of the council had been gazing at an undersea setting. Cryphon watched the greenish image of a pale, luminescent city slowly fade from sight. He saw several fish-like figures, carrying weapons, drift lazily past the mirror before the picture disappeared. It could have the gravest consequences for us all, master. Cryphon spoke in a rush. Alexei! has been disloyal. You would condemn a brother wizard, Cryphon. I am surprised at you. The charge is justified. He tried to convince Dork that you have been manipulated by the cleric. Fortunately, she spoke to me immediately after the discussion. I wasted no time in seeking you. Are you certain of this? Is Dork telling the truth? Cryphon nodded vigorously. I placed her under a charm spell as she spoke, and she told me the truth. She would have babbled all night if I hadn't finally put her to sleep. Sindri tapped his chin in thought. You have done well, he said at last. I fear our comrade Alexei is lost to us. We can but see that his loss causes us no damage. Is Rasfalo the solution? No, Cryphon. I have other plans for the assassin, but we can afford to be patient in the matter of Alexei. We shall wait. He will do nothing for some time. Alexei is not a man of action. But our time will come. When the cleric returns from his mission to Gwyneth, he will find Alexei waiting for him, ready to offer his blood as the tears of Behal. Robin walked hesitantly toward the pond. She had replaced her torn gown with a leather jerkin. I can't kill him, she repeated to herself. For once, her teacher had asked her to do something that she could not reconcile with her faith. Or was this some kind of test? Did Jenna seek to examine her devotion to the goddess? Her obedience? I don't care, she told herself angrily. I can't kill him. But neither could she allow Acorn to remain in the grove. No other possibility even entered her mind. The man's look of stark madness, his clutching, greedy hand stuck vividly in her memory and sent a shiver down her spine. Fortunately, her druid spell had been able to stop him. She made up her mind to expel him from the grove, sending him away with a command never to return. 
It was not what her teacher had commanded her to do, but she could not bring herself to slay him. Evil, Jenna had called him. And he was. Still, Robin felt that he was not entirely responsible for his actions. She crossed the garden and moved among the great oaks, nearing the pond. As she passed the place where she had been tearing up the vines weeks earlier, she noticed that the stout stick she had used to pry the vines now lay beside the sturdy trunk. Feeling vaguely uneasy, she picked it up. She wished for Tristan's presence with a sudden, surprising intensity. The prince, she knew, would have had no difficulty in forcing Jenna's order. She emerged from the oaks, expecting to see Acorn still frozen upon the river bank, but the stranger was gone. Her uneasiness grew into worry as she stepped from between the huge trees. She moved carefully along the grassy bank, looking at the ground for signs of his departure. The river bank here was a narrow strip of field, bordered by the river on one side and thick undergrowth on the other. The river was about forty feet wide and three feet deep. Its crystalline waters, racing over colorful stones, formed the southern border of the great druid's grove. Suddenly, she heard movement in the undergrowth and whirled to see Acorn lunging toward her with a crazed gleam in his eyes. He cackled unintelligibly as he moved far faster than his feeble appearance suggested possible. She lifted the stick and chanted the single word again. Stop! Acorn did stop, but not from any effect of her spell. Instead, the madman stomped his feet and howled with laughter. Then he became very quiet, peering at Robin with intense concentration. His look was the most frightening thing she had ever seen. When he began to mumble words that sounded like spell casting, her fright turned to sheer terror. Her mouth fell open, but Acorn couldn't cast spells. Or could he? What did his words mean? And then she understood that he commanded druidic magic, as upon Acorn's final word, a buzzing swarm of insects hummed from his hand to cluster about her on the river bank. Robin felt a fiery stinger lash into her cheek as more of the creatures landed upon her, seeking every patch of exposed skin. The sound of the swarm was a droning so loud that it seemed certain to drive her mad. She suppressed an urge to scream. She dared not open her mouth. Instead, she turned to run awkwardly to the stream. Her eyes were tightly shut as she flung herself headlong into the cool water. She forced herself to stay underwater, swimming downstream for as long as she could hold her breath. When she finally burst to the surface, she saw that the mass of insects was gradually swarming across the river out of the great druid's grove. The pain from her stings slowly subsided, but her skin still burned. A small portion of the swarm broke toward her as she emerged from the water, but she cast a simple spell of protection, making a rapid gesture about herself. The wasps stormed forward angrily, but then buzzed in a circle around her, unable to close through the magical barrier she had raised against them. Acorn was already looking for her, giggling and staggering along the river bank. Robin splashed toward shore, hoping to get out of the water before he reached her. The feeble-minded wild man paused again, and again Robin felt that intense concentration that could only mean he was preparing to cast a spell. Crawling onto the river bank, soaking wet and gasping, she felt very vulnerable. She grabbed a root to pull herself up, and suddenly it squirmed in her grasp. The end of the root lashed upward, growing eyes and long fangs. 
she jerked back just before the undoubtedly venomous spellcast snake struck. The snake's fangs embedded themselves in the soft loam as she snatched her hand away. More snakes slithered toward her from a tangle that had, before Acorn's spell, contained only dry sticks. She sensed the serpents closing in from all sides. She paused, pulling a tiny sprig of mistletoe from her belt, and chanted a few words very softly as she crushed the plant to dust. She felt the oar surround her, and she knew that she had become completely invisible to the snakes and to all other animals of the natural world. The creatures writhed past, and her stomach knotted as she saw several forked tongues flick forth to seek her. The madman still saw the young druid before him, but he also saw that the snakes could not find her. His carefully marshaled discipline that self-control that had allowed him to recall powers he had long kept buried, began to crumble under the frustration of the thwarted attacks. Abruptly, he howled in rage and charged toward Robin, his fingers outstretched, clutching for her throat. His howl gave way to an equally inarticulate cackle as he reached her. Robin saw the man charge, and she seized a stout stick with both hands. Raising it high, she swung it like an axe at the madman. She had never hit anything so hard in her life. She felt the shock of his broken neck travel through the stick to her wrists and arms. He dropped without a sound, his head drooping grotesquely over his right shoulder. Robin's whole body shook, she staggered backward and sat down heavily, feeling sick. Acorn's eyes stared at her from his unnaturally bent head, and she watched them slowly grow dull. But the power of the goddess had flowed through her and from her, and her own strength had not been expended. Her shaking stopped, and she walked over to the body. Acorn was unquestionably dead. His skin was already pale, and his head lay at that absurd angle. Still she knelt, and listened for breathing, felt for a pulse. He was dead. Then she noticed his pouch. She had forgotten about the tattered wrap and its treasured contents in the time Acorn had been with her. But now she vividly recalled his fear when she had reached for it. Robin reached for the ragged sack again and pulled the drawstring free. She hefted the thing, which seemed to contain a fist-sized rock. Turning it upside down, she shook it. A black rock fell beside her knee. It was rounded and smooth, oddly shaped. It looked like a carving of a vaguely human heart that some craftsman had rendered from a piece of hard coal. It lay several inches from her, but she felt its warmth even through her leather breeches. The rock was surprisingly large for its weight. Its density was more like soft pine than stone. She tried to look away from the stone and found that she could not. Reluctantly, yet at the same time feeling a tingling excitement, she reached for it. Her fingers finally reached the smooth ebony surface, and her world exploded into black. Newt meandered through the pines, thoroughly bored. He buzzed around looking for something, anything to catch his interest. The air in the woods was thick and heavy, and lethargy contributed to his boredom. His path took him back to the grove, but he was in no particular hurry. Without an urgent reason, the fairy dragon could not possibly travel in a straight line, and so his arrival could be anywhere from hours to days away. He reached the shore of a broad pond, hovering silently with a steady fluttering of his gossamer wings. Slowly, he settled onto a wide pine bow, looking around the shore. 
Such watering places, the dragon had discovered, were likely to yield his quarry. Indeed, he soon saw a tiny fawn staring into the clear water on the other side of the pond. Instantly, Newt crouched, his tail arrowing straight behind him. When he was quite certain of achieving surprise, he acted. He cast a simple illusion spell upon the reflection of the young deer. The unfortunate creature found itself looking at a purple-furred, fang-toothed horror that appeared to lunge out of the water, gaping maw extended. With a sharp squeal of terror, the fawn tumbled backward in a rolling bundle of gangly legs. Hee-hee-hee! <laughs> Newt squealed as the little creature finally stumbled to its feet and sprinted awkwardly into the woods. I can't stand it! he shrieked. He nearly lost his grip as he slipped to hang below the branch, supporting himself with his two left legs. Tears clouded his vision as he scrambled back atop the bow. Oh, but that was marvelous! He boasted to the forest at large. Nothing like a good joke to move a day along. He decided that he must share this wonderful story with Robin. She would cluck disapprovingly at his prank. She always did when a cute and helpless animal was involved. But Newt suspected that, deep down, she would be amused. And he simply had to tell somebody. Springing into the air, the fairy dragon beat his wings so hard that they hummed. He zipped like an arrow across the pond and darted into the forest of the far side. Weaving among the treetops, he raced toward Jenna's grove. But when he reached the stream at the southern edge of the grove, he slowed. Something did not look right. Newt gasped when he saw the bodies on the ground and quickly buzzed down to light upon Robin's back. With relief, he felt her breathing beneath him, albeit slowly. The man he saw with little surprise and no regret was dead. Oh, Robin, wake up, he pleaded, leaping to the ground and gently nudging her shoulder. Please, it's me, Newt. What should I do? He shook his tiny head frantically, looking around for some answer to his question, when he spied the black rock at Robin's side. Something about the stone seemed unnatural, repulsive. His nimble brain quickly connected the rock to his friend's unconsciousness. Grasping the offending stone in both his forepaws, he leaped into the air. With the most strenuous thrumming of his wings, he climbed, feeling like a lumbering condor. Slowly he flew across the stream, away from the grove of the great druid. After he had gone a mile or so, he dropped the stone in the woods and raced back to Robin's side. With a relief, he saw that she had already begun to stir. A sail! Tristan, a sail! The prince jerked from his slumber. He raised his head from the air bladder and shook it to clear the cobwebs. Blinking the salt water from his eyes, he followed Dareth's pointing finger. I see it! It's coming right toward us! Things are starting to look up grinned the Kalashite. Call them, croaked Ponswain, hope lighting his eyes. Too far, said Dareth, but they're coming right at us. The little vessel indeed skipped closer. It had a single mast with a sail colored in a broad rainbow pattern. The prow was high, so they could not see the interior of the craft. As it neared them, however, they heard strains of a song sung in a clear female voice. I knew a merry widow, to her neighbors quite demure, but all the lads that saw her said, the lady's far from pure. Now I can't say the lads are right, but I can't say they're wrong, and I know that merry widow couldn't. And what's this? 
The song was abruptly interrupted as a beaming, weather-beaten face peered suddenly over the bow at them. Three drowned rats and some flotsam! Tristan's greeting died in his mouth. So astonished was he by the question and answer. The speaker was a stout woman, perhaps forty years of age. Her round face was split by a smile as wide as the sea. A garish hat, festooned with grapes and apples and huge flowers, sat astride her head, sagging nearly to her shoulders. "'Well, come aboard before I sail on by,' she cried, suddenly ducking out of sight. But then a rope snaked into the air, splashing into the water between them, and each of them grabbed it as the boat passed only a few feet away. Tristan saw that it was a craft about twenty-five feet long, low of beam, but with sleek lines and an eager seaworthy look. They hauled on the rope as the boat's lone occupant hoisted the sail, and the slim craft drifted slowly to a stop. The woman had a lute strung across her back, and an assortment of canvas bags had been thrown into the hull. She reached down with a large red hand and pulled Tristan from the water. The prince no sooner flopped into the bottom of the boat than Canthus, Ponswain, and then Dareth fell in beside him. "'The name's Tavish,' said their hostess, standing with her hands upon her hips as she scrutinized her passengers. She was shorter than Tristan, though she certainly weighed as much. Her face was pretty in a solid farm-wife sort of way. It was impossible not to be cheered while in the range of that beaming smile. Her face grew thoughtful as she took in the sword at Tristan's side. Self-consciously, he looked at the plain leather hilt, the worn scabbard that had rotted away to reveal some of the glistening silver blade and its ancient runes. Tavish looked back to his face. "'And judging by your weapon,' she said, "'I'm guessing that you'll be the Prince of Corwell.'" Hobarth moved at a steady plod through the meadows and forests of Mirlock Vale. He was impervious to the beauty around him, interested only in drawing closer to the grove of the great druid. There, his god had told him, he would find the young druid, and Bahal was never wrong. It never occurred to the huge cleric that he would have any difficulty removing Robin from the care of her teacher. Hobarth had used his powers against druids before, and their feeble nature magic had proven to be no match for the aroused might of Bahal. Indeed, when allied with the Council of Seven, the power of Bahal had been sufficient to drive the druids from Alaron. True, these woods seemed more eternal than the forests that still remained upon Alarone. But he shrugged off the notion that druid magic was a force to be reckoned with. He began to sense the nearness of his destination, and with it a powerful arcane calling. Something was in the woods to his side. It radiated a sense of cool evil that the cleric found very pleasant, even exhilarating. He stopped for a moment, looking curiously into the brush. Whatever it was, the source of the calling struck a highly responsive chord in the cleric's breast. He was unable to ignore it. Hobarth thrashed his way into the clump of bushes, pushing brambles and briars aside. He could tell that he neared the source of the calling, but that only made his desire to reach it stronger. Suddenly he saw it, lying at the foot of a dead oak tree. A glistening black rock lay upon the ground. It attracted him strangely. Hobart stepped forward and picked up the object. It felt very warm and smooth in his hand, as if it belonged there. Amused, the cleric hefted the object, tossing it from one hand to the other and back. Smiling, he turned back toward the grove 
and continued his march. Hobarth was not attuned to nature, and took no notice of the fact that all the plant life within fifteen feet of the stone was withered and dead. In another hour, he arrived at the bank of a small stream. Somehow, he knew that this was the border to the great druid's grove. As he stepped into the stream, intending to wade across it, a sudden blow smashed his body and knocked him back to the shore. Springing to his feet, the cleric peered around, seeking his assailant. But he saw nothing. More slowly, he reached forward and touched the invisible barrier he had struck. It seemed to run along the shore of the stream and was solid as iron. Cursing, he considered this evidence of druidic might. He watched a small bird dart across the stream and saw that it was unaffected by the barrier. But when Hobarth reached forward, the invisible wall stopped him cold. He chanted a short phrase and magic suffused his body. He rose slowly from the ground and floated twenty feet up in the air to discover that the curtain of protection extended up at least that high. He did not want to go higher, for that would have carried him above the treetops, and he did not wish to be observed. Frustrated, Hobarth lowered himself to the ground and stalked along the shore of the stream. He was not used to being thwarted, and rage built within him. This crude, druidic protection was certainly a nuisance. He wondered if a truly stunning display of Behal's power might blow it away, but he decided to postpone experimentation. Such a spell would surely call attention to himself. He heard voices before him. Quickly he dropped into the underbrush and carefully moved forward using the shadows of the woods to advance around a bend in the stream. There before him he saw his quarry. The druid he sought knelt beside the stream, splashing water into her face. One of the pesky little dragons common to the moonshades was with her, hovering about like a worried nursemaid. Elated, Hobarth considered his options, and as he did... His elation faded. How was he to get her out of the grove when he could not enter it? He considered and discarded several simple options. He could not expect to charm the woman from the grove with magic. The druid, he sensed, would be very resistant to his spells upon the sacred ground of her teacher's grove. And he, or rather Bahal, wanted her alive. Her blood must come fresh to the altar of his god. Thus, he could not use a baneful spell to kill her and another to lift her body out. No, he would need to use a more subtle tactic. Hobarth absently stroked the black rock in his hand. His beady eyes gleamed from within their deep pouches of fat as he looked around for a suggestion. Then he saw the body behind the druid, and an idea slowly formed in his brain. Yes, he smiled to himself. That body will do quite nicely. Praying reverently to his god, Hobarth concentrated on the corpse in the field. The young druid's back was to the body, and she once again knelt to splash her face. And then the sinister might of Behal or was it the potent evil of the black rock, flowed from the cleric, unnoticed by Robin, to the still form. She was still kneeling as the body began to move. So you want to see the big city, said Tavish, chuckling. Yes, explained Tristan, sticking to the story he had developed. I've never even seen the island of Alarone. They say it's rather unlike Gwyneth. Has more farms and people. And the city of Caladir and Caer Caladir itself. I want to see the most splendid palace of the Fofolk. For a moment, 
Tavish almost looked sad. They are splendid works indeed, but there is a way of looking at the splendor of your own kingdom. The untamed forests, the rocky highlands that make the wonders of Caladir pale by comparison. I prefer the earthiness of Corwell myself. Do you travel the isles much? asked Dareth. Why, yes, didn't I tell you I'm a bard? No, you didn't, replied the prince. He was not surprised. Indeed, I am. Not that I've visited Corwell recently. It's been a decade or more, I should say. I've spent a lot of time on Moray recently. Now there's a sad story. What do you mean by that? asked the prince. The king and several of his loyal lords have all been murdered in the past year. No one seems to know who's behind it. There's no lord trying to step into the vacancy, and who would want to? Indeed, said Ponswain. Moray has always seemed a bleak and barren land, nothing but sheep and tundra. But the lord sneaked a sideways glance of alarm at Tristan. The prince felt a cold knife snake into his bowels at the news. There's a lot more to it than that, said the bard firmly. But now the land is without a leader, and the mystery is without an answer. It makes for lots of suspicions and arguments. Tavish paused, looking them over. The tales out of Snowdown are no better, she continued. The king disappeared on a hunting trip and has not been heard from since. No one's in charge. The whole kingdom's in an uproar. Tristan digested the information with heightened interest. Moray was another of the lands of the Pafolk, nominally under the rule of the High King. And there, as on Corwell, the king had been slain by mysterious assassins, while the last king of the Fafolk, save the High King himself, was missing from Snowdown. I'm on my way back home to Alarone, continued Tavish, though the prospect doesn't bring the joy it once did. Why not? Tavish sighed. There, too, are troubles. The High King seems to fret about a thousand imagined challenges to his throne. Who would imagine that such a warrior would come to wear the crown of the Isles? More than one good and true lord has been locked in the royal dungeon, his lands confiscated simply because the king imagined some cause to fear him. The bard steered silently for a while as the companions ate and rested. Tristan felt strength seeping back into his weary muscles, but his mind remained agitated. Tavish's information, coupled with the prophecy, created strong doubts in his mind about the High King. When they reached Care Caladir itself, what could they say to a man who feared treachery from every quarter? Land! cried Dareth, spotting a stretch of green on the eastern horizon. Take a look at our own fellows, laughed Tavish. We'll be lashed to the dock by nightfall. The prince's mood of foreboding vanished. It can't be too soon for me, he remarked with a true sigh of relief. I recommend the diving dolphin, fine food, good drink, and wonderful music. I'll be there myself, you know. The men laughed and promised to see the bard at the inn. By this time they were passing the breakwater, and Tristan stood in the prow, eager to get his first look at the island of Alarone. The land was green and pastoral, dotted with white farms and neat stone fences. The town of Llewellyn was the biggest community Tristan had ever seen. His first impression was of all-encompassing whiteness. Stone walls, plastered buildings, wooden houses, all were painted white. Tavish told him that the town was home to nearly 5,000 people. 
The sense of wonder remained with him as they glided up to a smooth stone quay. Tavish sprang to the shore, pulling the vessel tightly against the stout wooden bumpers. The passengers climbed out and looked around, trying hard not to stare. Tristan was embarrassed by his lack of traveling experience. Everything seemed so new. The dockside at Llewellyn consisted of a large park-like area of grass surrounded by a multitude of shops. Cool alehouses quickly awakened Tristan's thirst. He saw vendors of apples, cherries, and more exotic fruits hawking their wares. Hot meat sizzled on a small grill in one place. He saw beads and baubles, crystal goblets and steel weapons on display in a variety of small, glass-fronted shops. Narrow streets lined with two-story buildings led to the south, north, and east. Several dozen pedestrians, a few horses, and a half-dozen two-wheeled carts were in motion. The dolphin is that way, said Tavish, pointing up the street that led away from the sea. Go on and settle in. I'll be there before long. So saying, the bar turned back to her boat. She uttered a single word. Tristan couldn't quite hear what she said, and for a moment it looked as though she had destroyed the vessel. The keel of the boat bent double as the bow and stern rose to meet each other. The craft, thus raised, did not sink, but instead the raised fore and aft sections folded downward again to half the boat once more in size. Tavish now pulled the thing. It looked like a wide board, about eight feet long, from the water. It continued to fold up on the shore until it had reduced itself to a box that would have strained to hold a pair of heavy boots. See you in a little while, she called, striding purposefully toward the northern avenue. There's more to the lady that meets the eye, mused Dareth, staring after the bard. I'm glad we'll see her again. Let's find that inn and get something to drink, then, said the prince. I'm thirsty. I shouldn't doubt it said Pontswain sarcastically. Although, a hot meal would do me good. The streets of Llewellyn were crowded, at least by Corwellian standards, but the folk they passed seemed unusually quiet. There was none of the friendly banter that the prince was used to. The diving dolphin stood a short distance from the park. The whitewashed façade was weather-beaten and faded, and the wide steps leading up to the front door showed signs of many repairs. "'No dogs!' grunted a huge black-bearded man as Tristan started through the door. The fellow stood in the shadows but moved forward quickly to block the entrance. The prince stopped, annoyed. Dareth spoke before Tristan had a chance to rebuke the man, however. He'll wait out here for us. Down, Canthus. The houndmaster pointed to a corner of the wide porch, and Canthus walked to it, flopping heavily onto his belly. He lay his head upon his forepaws and did not move. The man stepped aside, and Dareth prodded the prince through the door. Tristan turned upon his friend as soon as they had entered the huge inn. What did you do that for? He had no right. Actually, it's the custom in most places, said the Kalashite. Corwell's the only place I've lived where dogs are treated as well as people. Tristan felt sick. His naivete had almost caused him to make a fool of himself. Some future king he was. Don't worry about it, laughed Dareth. You've got me along to look after you. Now let's get something to eat. The seven sat about their wide table again. Six black hoods rose in fascination, absorbing the words that came from the seventh. 
the wizard in the center of the group. The assassin will be here shortly. We shall give him his task, and the last of the heroes among the folk shall presently be eliminated. Then we shall be able to direct our energies to more productive tasks, such as bending the other lands to the will of our liege. The last word, thick with irony, lay heavily in the air after he spoke. Alexei, seated to Sindri's right, sat quietly. He watched his master through narrowed eyes, thinking deeply. How much he hated Sindri. How he craved the power that the master selfishly kept for himself by dolling out small tastes of it to those mages who pleased him. He looked beyond, to Cryphon, and his hatred grew, threatening to choke him. The worm, he was certain that Cryphon tried to manipulate the master in an effort to unseat Alexei himself from his place at Sindri's right hand. Alexei daydreamed of a time when he would watch them both squirm, rot, and die. But Doric, the slender woman just beyond Cryphon, would be his again, and she had once been, and as she was meant to be. The thought of Cryphon's pleasure, as he gratified his lust upon the woman that was Alexei's by right of conquest, fueled the flames of jealousy into a white heat. The other three, Talra, Wertam, and Karinau, were the weaklings of the council. Alexei was certain that the three mages, barely beyond their apprenticeships, would follow the strongest leader. His heart pounded at the thought of his revenge, of the pain and humiliation he would inflict upon his former master. Alexei, the soft voice called him back to reality. Master? The word almost caught in his throat. Sindri turned his head slightly, fixing his assistant with a gaze of cool interest. Alexei, you have raised many questions about the cleric, about my judgment. Why? Do you doubt my abilities? The blood drained slowly from Alexei's face, and a knot of panic built in his stomach. No, it was too soon. He was not ready yet. He looked into Sindri's eyes, pools of pale blue as harsh as the Arctic sky. And he could not answer. He struggled to speak, but no words came forth. Can you give me some reassurances, Alexei? Some proof of your trustworthiness? He knows. The knowledge burned Alexei's face, and he could speak no reply. The truth would doom him, and he could summon no lie to his lips. Very well, said Sindri his voice dripping with regret. The wizard gestured and streams of colored lights rushed from his fingertips to swirl about the recalcitrant lieutenant. Alexei's hood flew back, his stark features outlined in terror. The mage was tall and thin, but the eerie shadows from the spell gave his face a gaunt, emaciated look. His mouth opened in a soundless scream, or perhaps the noise he made was masked from the council by the filtering curtain of lights. Alexei's long, thin hands clasped the arms of his chair, but already his image grew blurry. In moments, he had faded from view, banished, the other wizards knew, to a lonely imprisonment in a place known only to the master. A few hours later, the assassin and his band dashed through the courtyards of Ker Kaladir on galloping black steeds. Racing through the night, they thundered along the streets of the town and soon disappeared along the king's road. They rode to the south.
Chanti heard Behal's challenge and saw the game of the evil guard. She briefly pondered her response. The moonshades were a small realm, unimportant in the vast scale of her domains. Were they worth the trouble of a conflict? Yet the Isles had shown some promise. The people there, the folk, were a good people, strong and devout in their own way. It saddened her to think of them falling under the thrall of Bahal's evil. And two, the acts of the evil god needed a counter, or they would grow too powerful and arrogant for the safety of all the plains. Since Bahal had chosen the moonshays for his game, and Chanti, alone among the gods of good, had power there, should she not resist him? Chanti, like Bahal, had clerics among the folk, though perhaps not as powerful and certainly not as deadly as the minions of Bahal. Her clerics had skills of their own, healing, beneficial powers. Perhaps one of them could aid the players in this game. She selected several of her worshippers, not certain what the future would hold. Perhaps one of them might have the chance to do her bidding. Chanti made her wishes known to these clerics in the guise of a dream. Chapter 7 The Scarlet Guard Robin took a deep breath and felt her body relax as she exhaled. She felt weak but immeasurably better than she had upon first awakening. Whatever the nature of Acorn's black rock, it had been far mightier than her ability to protect herself. Her fingers were blistered and hot, though the damage did not look permanent. She splashed one more handful of cool water against her face. She stood up and stretched slowly, trying to shake off a sense of guilt over Acorn's death. She had had no choice. Angrily, she wondered about the sudden transformation. Certainly, he had made her nervous before, but what had driven him to attack? Why, when she would have spared him, had he been driven by such bloodlust? And a deeper, even more frightening question arose within her. How had he come to learn druid magic? What did you do with that thing, that rock? She asked Newt who buzzed worriedly at her shoulder. Oh, that awful stone? I hated it, and I took it away from here. It was no good for you. I hope you're not mad at me. I only wanted to help. The little dragon shivered at the memory of the rock, peering hopefully at Robin. No, you did the right thing, she said reassuringly. Poor Newt. You worry too much, like an old nursemaid. Well, I just wanted to see you awake again, and I must say, getting rid of that nasty fellow doesn't bother me at all. Maybe it should, but it doesn't. I think we're all better off with him lying dead over. Ack! Newt squealed in terror and zipped past Robin, hovering over the stream and pointing speechlessly over her shoulder. Robin spun around and thought immediately that her senses had deserted her. The stranger was dead. She knew this, for she had checked carefully. So what was this thing lurching toward her? The body was only ten feet away, shuffling forward with an awkward gait. The neck was still broken, for the head hung grotesquely over its shoulder. A swollen black tongue extended from its gaping mouth, and the two eyes were dull and glazed, though still open. But the hands clutched for her eagerly, each finger like a living snake thirsting for her blood. The thing took another step forward, and another, as she stood transfixed, too shocked even to scream. Run! Newt cried. 
Somehow, the little dragon's warning restored her self-control, and she turned and sprinted down the riverbank. Gasping and shaking with fear, she turned to look. It came ahead slowly, shuffling awkwardly but steadily toward her. She wanted to cry out her fear, but she bit her tongue and used her mind. How could she fight this thing that was already dead? Run, Robin! cried Newt, buzzing in a tight circle around him. He darted forward to hover in the air between her and the animated corpse, wringing his forepaws in agitation. No, Newt, she shouted, seeing by his concentration that he was preparing to cast a spell. Newt's magic, although unpredictable, had saved her from bloodthirsty enemies before, but she feared it would be of little use against this nightmare. Multicolored flames exploded from the ground in front of the shambling figure, quickly surrounding it in a ring of fire that covered the spectrum from bright red to deep purple. The corpse hesitated, but only for a moment, and Robin knew that it would not be daunted by Newt's illusion. The body lurched through the curtain of fire, its fingers still twitching eagerly. Robin stumbled backward, desperately trying to think of something, anything to stop the unnatural attack. She looked around for a stick or a rock, but the field mocked her with wildflowers. Sprinting again, she dashed away from the thing, stopping to gasp for breath at the edge of the forest. Tireless, it marched forward. Trying to slow her breathing, Robin marshaled her faith in her goddess. She felt the body of the goddess under her feet. Carefully, she pulled a leaf of mistletoe from her waist. She let the leaf spiral lazily into the breeze as she chanted one of her most powerful spells. Plants erupted from the ground around Acorn's body. Shoots of grass and thick-leaved weeds curled upward, clasping toward the undead thing. But the plants withered and curled away as they made contact with the creature, falling to either side and opening an unobstructed path to Robin. Once again, she turned to flee, darting underneath the low limbs of a tree behind her. In her haste, she did not duck low enough, and pain flashed through her skull as she cracked it against the heavy bow. Dazed, she staggered against the tree, squinting through blurry eyes at the monster only ten feet away. She watched as Newt swooped into the thing's face, and she saw the dead man's hand slash through the air with stunning speed. With a low squeak, the fairy dragon flopped to the ground. Robin tried to run, but the encircling branches of the tree cornered her. The monster moved in, and she crouched like a cat, determined to fight to the last with her bare hands. Suddenly, a shape moved behind the creature, and Robin heard a loud growl. The body lurched to the side, half-turning, and now she saw a brown form, Great teeth bared, swathed the creature's outstretched arm. The limb snapped loudly and dropped to the monster's side. Robin watched Grunt smash the monster to its knees with a blow to the hip and then stretch it upon the ground with a vicious cut to the already broken neck. She watched as the bear seized the corpse in his powerful jaws, shaking the thing like a rag doll before tossing the body casually to the ground and tearing at it again with his long, curved claws. The corpse stopped moving, but Grunt savaged it further, tearing pieces away and tossing them aside until the corpse was unrecognizable as a human body. Limply, Robin stumbled to the bear and leaned against his broad flank, trying to draw strength from him. Her shock gradually gave way to uncomprehending terror. Finally, for the first time in many years, she sobbed uncontrollably. 
Hobarth crouched among the branches of a thick bush, ignoring the thorns that pricked him. He dared not move for fear of alerting the druid across the stream. He had watched her battle the zombie. Although disappointed with the outcome, he had other plans. He squeezed the black rock in excitement, his eyes never leaving the woman. The stone, like the heart of evil that it was, seemed to answer his pressure with a warm caress of its own. He watched Robin stumble weakly from the clearing, leaning against the bear until she disappeared from his sight. The cleric remembered his surprise as he had cast the spell to animate the corpse. Such a spell normally called for the discipline of Hobart's faith, coupled with the might of Bahal. Once cast, the spell would vanish from Hobart's memory until a suitable period of praying to his deity would restore it to him. But somehow the black heart had changed that. The power to raise the corpse had arisen from the stone, not from Hobarth. The memory of the spell remained with him. He felt that he could immediately recruit another corpse from the dead. In fact, as many bodies as he could find. Hobarth squirmed from his position in the bush, his mind alight with possibilities. Bodies, hundreds of them, raised into an army of undead. He needed bodies. The cleric was unaware of Bahal feeding him these images. He knew only that he wanted such an army under his control. Common sense told Hobarth to look for bodies at the site of a battlefield. He was not a historian, but he knew a little local history. A year earlier, a battle had been fought not many days' march from here. Quickly, eagerly, the great cleric turned his steps back toward the south. He would call upon the wisdom of his god to show him the exact route, but he knew that this was the general direction to Freeman's Down. Jenna opened her eyes and studied Robin with a look of great tenderness and understanding that the people had not seen for many weeks. She rose to her feet, and the young woman saw again the sturdy muscle of the stout druid's body. Trying to banish her lingering sense of horror, she embraced Jenna in relief. The cottage door was securely bolted behind her, and Grunt sat just outside but even the cozy fire in the stove and the lace curtains filtering the afternoon sunlight could not entirely soothe her. What could it have been? she asked Jenna. A creature animated from death. A zombie, Jenna explained. But how it came to be here, I cannot imagine. I felt so helpless. Robin said, my magic was useless. The powers of the druid are the powers of life and growth. We have no power over death or death's creatures. Jenna looked warily across the grove, probing the waters of the pond and the flowers of the garden with her eyes. Whatever the source of this abomination, she said, we must take great care that it does not happen again. The results could be disastrous. And it's genuine crystal from the famed glasskins of Thay. Note the detail, the colors, and the shapes. The old sailor leaned in, burping discreetly to examine the shining object. The diminutive salesman pressed his pitch. This one has come thousands of miles by galley across the Sea of Fallen Stars, by camel across Anorak, the Great Desert. It passed through the hands of pirates and bandits and traitors. Why, it's certain to be the only one in the moonshades, perhaps along the whole Sword Coast. Crystals of Fay, huh? mumbled the sailor intrigued in spite of himself. He looked through bleary eyes at the little fellow who held the glass ball in his hand. A halfling he was, one of the little folk, 
half the size of man. Why'd you bring it to Llewellyn? He asked suspiciously. A shrewd fellow you are, to be sure, said the halfling with a conspiratorial wink. To tell you the truth, I had no intention of stopping in Llewellyn, much less selling the crystal. I've become quite attached to it, you know. The halfling, his large brown eyes sliding furtively around the room, leaned in close. I had a little trouble up in Caladir. I have to get off the island in a hurry. The money will make that possible. Who are you? Where's your home? The name is Paldo of Lowhill, said the halfling easily. I hail from Corwell. Oh, it's nothing serious that has me in a hurry to leave. It involves, if you must know, a young lady. The sailor chortled knowingly and went back to examining the bright crystal sphere. Five gold, eh? The old sailor mumbled, turning the fascinating sphere in all directions, watching it catch the light from a nearby lantern, diffusing it into a million colors and patterns. He had just been paid, and though the price represented half a season's salary, the object was like nothing he had ever seen before. I'll take it. A fine deal. I'm grieved to part with it, but the crystal's yours, said the halfling in a voice that almost dripped with regret. The sailor fumbled across the coins and lurched unsteadily to his feet. He clutched the sphere covetously to his breast and staggered out into the street, looking to show off the object to his mates. Paldo counted the money, biting a slightly tarnished coin to satisfy himself that it was indeed gold, and smiled to himself. He hoisted the duffel bag he had placed under the table, careful not to jostle its contents. It contained several dozen more of the crystals, each of which he would sell as the only one of its type. He worked his way through a crowd and climbed to a stool, carefully placing a silver piece upon the bar. He would not pay with gold. The little folk had long ago learned to conceal their wealth around humans, particularly drunk and disreputable ones. This tavern was filled with both types. The old sailor was an ancient establishment in one of the most run-down sections of Llewellyn. Fights and theft were common, but the halfling knew that his trail could easily be buried here. And in case two of his customers should chance to meet up after a sale, Paldo needed quick anonymity. He sipped at a mug of ale and looked around at the other patrons. A pair of Northmen were engaged in an arm-wrestling contest in the center of the room, and most of the patrons had gathered around to place bets and cheer on their favorites. Paldo could see little of the match. The hulking forms of the humans formed an effective barrier for one of his stature. Instead, he saw the door open and a heavy-set woman entered. She had a broad face and round cheeks, but she was very attractive, in a large sort of way. She stepped confidently up to the group around the wrestlers, and the halfling saw that she carried a lute upon her back. Interested now, Paldo watched her join the onlookers. She obviously knew them, judging from the familiar tweak she gave one man. She talked for a moment, and then left. Halflings are nothing if not curious, except about magic, and Paldo was compelled to see what the barred lady had said. He hopped to the floor, hoisted his bag, and strolled over to the sailor she had tweaked. Any idea where I can find some music? he asked. Huh? Oh, sure, there's a party at the Diving Dolphin tonight. Seems the Prince of Corwell's in town, and... Damn! The sailor's attention jerked back to the wrestler's. One had just crushed the other's brawny arm to the table. 
Muttering a stronger curse, he counted out three silver pieces and passed them to a sailor to his left before turning back. He was surprised to see no one there. No, where'd that little fellow go? To Roger. Tristan solemnly raised his mug. Roger, echoed Dareth. Ponswain ignored them, seizing another massive boar's rib and biting greedily into the succulent meat. Red juices ran into his beard, but his hair, brushed again, had regained its elegant curl. Moments later, they slammed down the empty stoneware next to the empty pitchers. Tristan felt vaguely guilty. This was the first time he had thought of the fisherman who had given his life to carry them to Alarone. I didn't even find out if he had a family, he said. He was a widower, his children grown, replied Dareth. He told us that in King's Bay. Tristan felt another twinge of guilt. He had drunk so much beer that night that he barely recalled the conversation. I'll see that they're provided for, he said, raising his head. The thought made him feel slightly better. He looked around the diving dolphin. The inn was pleasantly crowded with a steady buzz of conversation. Pretty maids bustled about replenishing pitchers, mugs, and platters. Heavy beams of dark wood crisscrossed the ceiling, and bright lanterns showed the place to be clean and well-maintained. The huge skin of a cave bear served as a rug before the vast fireplace, and the head of a leering sea monster was mounted above the hearth. Dareth showed his companions the gloves he had found in the castle, and told them how he had found their weapons in the treasure room. "'Where did you find your sword?' he asked Tristan. The prince smiled. The rush of alcohol made his secret seem even more pleasant. He felt better than he had in days. He leaned back in his chair and lifted a booted foot to the table. "'Magic,' he said smugly. They found the beer to be a bit watery to their palates, but that hadn't stopped them from finishing four pitchers. Actually, Tristan had had most of it. Dareth had filled his mug a few times, but Ponswain was still on his first. "'Another gentleman,' said a freckled barmaid. A great spray of red hair fell across her shoulders. She had a pretty face though Tristan was barely aware of it. He was more consumed with the ample shape of her figure, straining against the tightly laced stays of her bodice. Even in his fog, though, Tristan caught Ponswain's warning glance. The Lord obviously disapproved of his consumption. That alone was enough to make him want to order more, and he was about to signal the lovely maid to bring it. Not for now! announced a voice. Tavish marched up to the table, bearing a pitcher in each hand. She ignored the barmaid, smiling at Dareth as he rose to offer her a seat. So, how do you like this place? she asked, as Tristan watched the barmaid flounce away. He thought wistfully of Robin, and turned back to his companions. It was rather empty earlier, but it seems to be filling up, observed the prince. Oh, it gets pretty crowded, said Tavish with a secretive little smile. Especially on nights like this. What's so special about tonight? asked Dareth. Music, for one thing, she smiled, but would say no more. A screeching sound drew their attention to the hearth, where several pipers were tuning their instruments. "'I love the air pipes,' shouted Tavish over the noise. "'The audience is always ready for something different when they stop.' 
Tristan observed the pipers through a thin fog as they played a fast jig, drawing several dancers, including Dareth and Tavish, to their feet. A few more songs followed, and after each, Tristan noticed more and more of the patrons looking over at his table. Finally, one of them shouted, Tavish! In moments, the room vibrated as everyone called for the bard. Hometown girl! Tavish smiled at her companion's looks of surprise. Grinning easily, she took her loot and stepped to the makeshift stage, vacated by the pipers. Twanging a few soft chords, she assured herself that the instrument was tuned. With the first chord, Tristan recognized the song. My tales of far Corwell, on Gwyneth so wild, of heroes and demons and druids and war, and the beast that rose darkly from waters deep black, and socks all of Corwell in times old and new. Tavish's clear voice carried the song of Karen to heights Tristan had never before heard. She sang almost without accompaniment, using the lute only to establish an occasional harmonic chord. The song took him back to the war, and with it, as background, he remembered the summer of battle in a dramatic, almost poetic light. He saw but one image, Robin, her black hair flying in the breeze, standing alone atop the high tower of Care Corwell, using the staff of her mother to call upon the powers of nature itself, bringing lightning crackling into the ranks of the blood riders that would otherwise have slain them all. Thick sky spit forth death's fire. The riders fell, black, while the white steed's charge rumbled. Hold! The sharp command cracked through the room like a thunderclap. All eyes turned to the doorway. A tall man stood there, arrogantly looking about the room. He was dressed in a heavy red cloak with gold braid decorating his shoulders. His head was protected by a steel helmet that did not cover his face. In his upraised hand, he clenched a shining steel longsword. I arrest the Prince of Corwell in the name of the King, he announced. He is charged with treason against the crown. Paldo raced down the street, almost forgetting to cushion his bag. Tristan, he thought to himself, in Llewellyn, how they would celebrate the two old friends. Of course, the prince had probably brought that Kalashite along, but even Paldo had grown to trust Dareth, so that was all right. A long year of traveling was coming to an end, and the halfling was eager to think about home and old companions. He found the diving dolphin and dashed up the steps, only to bump into a massive figure. He recoiled, quickly, as he looked into the tusked face. An ogre! Closed! muttered the monster, giving the halfling a casual shove that knocked him across the entryway. Stunned, Paldo looked around to see a dozen ogres, all clutching weapons and standing ready to charge through the door. His gaze rested upon a familiar shape in the corner. Can't this? He whispered. And the great moorhound thumped his tail in greeting. He did not raise his head from his paws, however, instead shifting his brown eyes to stare mournfully at the door to the inn. The cleric of Chanti slept soundly, secure in the warm embrace of his goddess. His breathing was deep and slow as the night reached its deepest hour. Finally, the goddess sensed that he was ready for her dream. The cleric dreamed that he awakened to find a sword on the steps of his chapel, 
Though unskilled in weaponry, he recognized the blade as a wondrous piece of work. But the weapon had been damaged. Its silvery blade was tarnished, chipped, and bent. The tip had been broken off. Its smooth, leathery hilt was worn away by rot and decay. The cleric took the weapon into his chapel, which had suddenly become a forge. Though he knew nothing of smithing, he took a hammer and fired the forge. The handle of the hammer was smooth and comfortable in his hand. He stroked the weapon across the anvil, caressing it with gentle taps of the hammer. Slowly it regained some of its former shape. The metal was straightened, and the tip gradually sharpened into a point. The hilt healed itself. The rot fell away, and the leather grew once again sturdy and thick. And then the blade was done, and it was a glorious thing to behold. The cleric held it up to the sun, and the light of it nearly blinded him. Patriarch Trevor awakened suddenly and sat up in bed. His breathing was ragged, and his heart pounded. Elated, he sprang to the floor and knelt in reverence before a statue of his goddess. He had received a vision. He did not know what the dream meant, but he had no doubts about its nature. And so he would wait. Tristan saw anger in the faces around him. Not anger directed at him, the alleged traitor, but toward the officer who stood at the door. Grumbles of displeasure came from many throats, and he saw men fingering their weapons. Mercenary scum! cried one huge man, lunging to his feet. How dare you speak for a king of the folk? The captain made a slight nod to his left, and a window exploded inward. Shocked patrons turned to see a leering ogre's face, its yellow tusks gleaming over a huge crossbow. A huge bolt punched through the chest of the standing man, knocking him over two tables as it killed him. More of the ugly ogres crowded in the door behind the officer, while others broke into the room from the kitchen. The rest of the windows crashed inward, and at least a half-dozen of the massive crossbows were sighted on the crowd. For a quick moment, he looked up into the heavy rafters and the shadows beyond. Escape! He pictured a quick leap, a grab of the beam, and they would be off into the darkness beyond. But then he stumbled drunkenly backward, and only Pontswain's strong arm held him from falling to the floor. The look of utter disgust on the Lord's face burned its way into Tristan's bowels, and he jerked away. More of the folk were rising to their feet now, and startlingly, clear vision burst through the fog in Tristan's brain. He saw a massacre of these brave but outmatched folk, a massacre for which he, at least indirectly, would be responsible Shaking off Pontswain's supporting arm, he forced himself to stand up straight. The charge is untrue, he announced, somehow managing to keep his words from slurring. He addressed the soldier. I will accompany you and refute it before the High King himself. For a moment, he thought that the patrons of the bar would still fight, but gradually the tension eased. The three visitors walked over to the sneering man. The captain's black eyes glittered at them above his sharp, hawk-like nose and neatly trimmed mustache and beard. I must have your weapons, he announced, holding out his hand expectantly. Tristan momentarily regretted his decision, but he saw again the brutal crossbows leveled at the innocent bystanders. Reluctantly, he ungirded his belt and handed it over. The Prince of Corwell would hold the sword of Simmercu again, Tristan vowed. The heart of Kazgaroth provided all of the strength and endurance that Hobarth needed. 
His path carried him up a rocky pass and through winding gorges, yet he never wavered in his course toward a place he had never seen. Some of this confidence came from his faith in Bahal, for the god showed him visions of his destination. But another part of it came from the black heart, as if that stone wanted him to find the battlefield for its own reasons. After several days without food or drink, but also without pause, he came down the center of a broad, forested valley. Before him lay a wide field with a rounded hill upon the far side. That hill, he knew, was Freeman's Down, and it had given its name to the battle fought here the previous year. The huge cleric made his way to the top of the burial mound, fondling the black rock as he approached. He held the heart to the ground and remembered the spell that allowed him to animate the dead. As before, the knowledge of the enchantment came from his mind, but the power to enact it came from the black rock. It was a far greater power than any one cleric could hope to generate. Hobarth suppressed a shiver of delight as he felt the ground tremble beneath his feet. The earth was rent by great cracks that ripped across the grass. The scent of moist dirt arose, but was quickly extinguished by a stronger smell. The stench of dead, decayed flesh. In the bottom of one of the fissures, Hobarth saw movement. Skulls gaped upward at him, and bony hands clawed at the dirt, pulling whole skeletons jerkily from the earth. Bones clicked together as the creatures crawled from the soil like a swarm of insects emerging from a narrow hole. They crawled over each other, mindless of those that were dragged down or reburied. More and more of the things emerged as the fissures deepened. The skeletons lurched away from the graves to collect in loose ranks of dirty bone. Next came the zombies. The flesh on these bodies had not entirely rotted away, but hung loose in great flapping folds of carrion. Clutching the lip of the fissure with sinewy, skinless fingers, the zombies dragged themselves from their graves in answer to Hobarth's command. Empty eye sockets gaped dully from swollen, misshapen faces. Black tongues thrust from lipless mouths, hanging stupidly from torn and rotted jaws. Like the skeletons, the zombies formed careless lines, moving off the desecrated burial mound and spreading across the field. And still, Hobarth's army rose from the earth. Chapter 8 The Crystals of Thay Wide-eyed Paldo watched from the shadows as Tristan, Dareth, and another prisoner were prodded through the door of the diving dolphin. He kept one hand on the neck of the moorhound. One of the brutes cuffed the prince roughly, and Canthus growled deep within his cavernous chest. Paldo pressed reassuringly against the bristling neck and whispered soothing sounds into the dog's ear. In another moment... The prisoners had been shoved down the stairway, and their escort moved them quickly up the street. Soon the captives disappeared into the night. Another dozen ogres remained around the inn, staring belligerently through the doors and windows. They poked curiously at anyone who attempted to enter or leave. Finally, the ogres grew bored and moved on, but the halfling remained still for several minutes. As the customers began filtering out of the inn, he stood up and dusted himself off. Paldo had some things to do. He found some old rags and quickly repacked his duffel, burying each of the crystals of Thay in several layers of cushioning cloth. Next, he pulled out a sturdy leather tunic that fit snugly over his shoulders. Lastly, he took a slim blade and girded it to his waist. That blade, no more than a long dagger to a man, had sipped the lifeblood of more than one foe. 
Finally, he turned again to the moorhound, who had lain motionless while he completed his preparations. Tristan, said Paldo, inclining his head to the street. The huge dog instantly sprang to his feet and bounded from the entryway, pausing only to give the dirt road a cursory sniff. He trotted in the direction the ogres had taken, and Paldo had to jog in order to keep up. Canthus, for his part, lopped as quietly as a shadow through the streets of Llewellyn. The dog's path carried them to the fringes of the town. He circled anxiously for several minutes at an intersection, allowing Paldo to catch his breath while the dog sought his master's spore. Finally, he picked up the trail again, turning to the left and bounding up a gradual hill. Paldo followed him, still puffing. Suddenly the dog darted toward a gatehouse in a high wall that ran several feet back from the street. A huge ogre stood carelessly within the gatehouse. No! Paldo hissed, pulling the huge dog aside just a moment before he would have reached the circle of light created by the ogre's torch. This way, he whispered. Sprinting away from the gatehouse and cutting sharply into a lane that ran along the property. Here he found a large oak tree. No gardener had removed the lower branches. The halfling found a nearby clump of bushes and ordered Canthus to lie there, hidden from casual view. Paldo then had no difficulty scampering up the knotty bowl until he reached a point where he could see over the wall. He saw a huge manor house within the yard, surrounded by formal gardens and placid pools. Several ogres wandered around, patrolling the area. Somewhere in there was the Prince of Corwell. It's about time you woke up. Ponceswain's biting tone blasted through Tristan's weariness. The Prince sat up awkwardly, trying to ignore the heavy manacles that bound his hands and restricted his movement. His head pounded. Dareth, similarly restrained, looked at him morosely. What happened? groaned the prince. You don't remember? Ponswain stalked from the barred window to stand before the prince. Tristan sat on a hard bunk and looked up at the lord in anger and chagrin. Of course I remember what happened, he snapped. I mean, how did the guards know we were there? Were they waiting for us to come ashore? We hadn't been here for more than a few hours. Just long enough to get drunk. All right, Tristan growled, standing up to face the Lord. The chain binding his wrists clanked noisily. I made a mistake. For what it's worth, I'm sorry. Now drop it, or by the goddess I'll force your teeth down your throat. He expected Ponceswain to strike at him. In fact, he would have welcomed the physical release. He wanted to hit something, and the arrogant lord seemed like a good target. To his surprise, Ponceswain shrugged and walked away. I'm beginning to understand, said Dareth quietly. Will you explain it to me then? asked the prince. The Kalashite stood and paced across their small cell in frustration, joining Ponceswain at the lone window. Finally, Tristan joined them. They looked across the well-tended gardens of a large manor house. Don't you see? Our arrest, maybe even the sabotage of the lucky duckling. It's all been an attempt to stop you from seeing the High King. So, you think the High King is afraid of me? countered Tristan. Why? The other rulers, Marais, Snowdown, all killed or vanished, as your father was killed. You are the only one left. 
"'What threat does a country prince offer to the High King?' asked Tristan. "'Certainly, with your victory in the Darkwalker War, you could seem like a threat, "'especially to a weak-willed ruler,' Dareth said. "'The soldiers here were waiting for you, not just any outlaw lord or king, "'and somehow they knew you were coming.' All fell deadly silent as each realized the implications of the Kalashite's words. Tristan nodded his agreement. He wondered as he did so if the walls were listening or watching. These feathers steady and steer her in flight. The muscles in the wings are strong enough to allow her to lift a large rabbit from the ground. The young eagle sat calmly in Jenna's lap as the great druid stretched out its long wing. Robin watched attentively as her teacher lifted the graceful bird. Of course, this one is still small, added Jenna. She must grow before she can attempt anything so ambitious. They sat upon a bench in the garden, amid red and purple flowers, and the stately boles of a few ancient oaks. Fat bees buzzed lazily from blossom to blossom, sipping nectar. She has the keenest eyes of any of our creatures, continued Jenna, and speed. Her form is one of the most useful when one must travel from one place to another in hurry. I would love to try that, exclaimed Robin, imagining the joys of flight. To see the whole valley, the whole world. Soon, child, said Jenna, surprising her. Your lessons have progressed very well despite my recent lethargy. You are almost ready to learn the secrets of the animals, to assume their forms when the need is upon you. Teacher? Robin asked, hesitantly voicing a question that had been concerning her. Your lethargy. Had it to do with the stranger's presence in the grove? Jenna paused a long time before answering. For a while, Robin wondered if she had heard the question. My ailment cannot be blamed upon the stranger, at least not entirely, explained Jenna at last. You see, I am getting old, quite a bit older than I look, if the truth be told. The infirmities of age sometimes weigh heavily upon me. At first, I thought that was all that was wrong with me. After the stranger's coming, however... I felt something much more sinister, the presence of an ancient and powerful enemy, one whom I had hoped I was done with, at least in this life. That presence brought a kind of madness upon me. She raised a hand at Robin's look of surprise. No, not the stranger himself. I know him now. He was a powerful druid in Mirlock Vale. Traherne of Oakvale was his name. I thought that he was killed during the war. No, it was not Traherne that caused my ailment. It was a presence that came along with him, something that wore me down and frightened me. Perhaps it had inhabited his body, or maybe it was something that he carried. Why didn't you tell me? I couldn't explained the great druid. The madness that infected me kept me silent. I dreaded that presence, but I could not articulate the words to warn you. It's gone now, or at least lessened greatly in strength. The black rock! Robin exclaimed. What? What black rock? Why didn't you tell me about this? Jenna demanded. I didn't know about it, at least not until he died. The first time he died, I mean. She proceeded to explain about the ragged bundle Acorn had carried, and described the rock that fell out of it after his death. 
Where is it now? asked Jenna. Newt took it away after I was stunned. I don't know exactly where he put it. Newt? The little dragon blinked into sight a dozen feet away. He had been buzzing about the garden, invisible, shaking the stems of flowers as bees attempted to land upon the petals. Is it lunchtime already? he cried. Eagerly zipping over to the bench, it's been a long and hot morning. You two are being very, very boring today. You know what's for lunch? Hey, where's the food? I don't see any food. Wait! Cried Robin, holding up her hand. We'll eat soon. First, I need you to tell me where you took that black rock. Newt shuddered nervously. Twisting his agile neck to look in all directions, as if he expected savage enemies to burst from the woods at any moment. I hid it, he explained in a stage whisper. I took it into the forest and dropped it. But where? persisted the young druid. Over there, somewhere. Replied the fairy dragon with an irritated gesture to the south. Now can we eat? Robin couldn't help but laugh and agree. She turned to go to the cottage to gather some bread, cheese, and fruit. Only then did she notice Jenna's eyes, squinting warily into the woods in the same direction as Newt's gesture. Paldo was about to jump from the tree back into the narrow lane. The sound that froze him was little more than a faint scuffing, indistinguishable from wind in the grass or a dozen other common noises. But the halfling strained his ears, cursing the clouds that blocked the moon. There it was again. He was not alone in the lane. A crease between clouds dropped a slow wash of illumination, and the halfling saw dark shapes moving toward him. Men on horseback, he suddenly realized. But why could he not hear the horses? The riders pulled up at the base of the very tree concealing Paldo, and he counted six men shrouded in black. Each rode a midnight black horse, whose hooves were shrouded in thick leather bags. Paldo did not like these characters, not that he knew who they were or what they wanted. His dislike was compounded by fright as he saw the riders dismounting below. As quietly as possible, the halfling moved upward, certain that the pounding of his heart would give him away. Paldo could only watch as the man leaped into his tree and started to climb upward. One stayed behind, holding the horses, but the other five swung into the middle of the tree. Paldo lay headlong upon a wide limb, no more than ten feet above the sinister figures. Shaking with fright, he squeezed the branch as tightly as he could, hoping to blend with the darkness. He'll be in one of the tower rooms, hissed a man. How do you know? Questioned another. Ogres," answered the first speaker. "They always store treasure and prisoners up high if they can." The men wormed their way outward along a pair of stout limbs, looking over the manor. Baldo felt certain that they were talking about Tristan. "Rasper, you take this," said the first speaker, apparently the leader of the band. Baldo couldn't see the object that changed hands, but he heard more. Drink that before we cross the wall. You'll be the lead man, but invisible. Let's stay out of the paths of those ogres. But if we run into trouble, the four of us'll keep 'em busy. Follow. You know what to do then. Don't worry," said Rasper. "The prince is a dead man. Assassins." In his fright, Paldo squeezed a piece of bark from the tree. The flake of wood broke with the tiniest of cracks, but the conversation below him ceased immediately. Paldo discerned slight movement and realized that some of the men had moved to the bowl of the tree, while several more remained below him. 
In utmost silence, the assassin spread out to close the net. Clenching his teeth so he wouldn't cry out in fear, Paldo wormed his way farther out on the limb. The tree's branches thinned above him. He would gain nothing by climbing. The men were below him, and between him and the trunk, so it seemed that out was the only way to go. The branch narrowed as he moved and began to bend under his weight. Now he heard whispered commands in the depths of the tree. He swung his feet into space, tightly clasping the end of the bow, and felt it swing down under his weight. His feet touched a lower branch and he let go, trusting his sense of balance. Tumbling free, he barely grabbed the lower branch, but this one also sagged. Suddenly, he saw movement in the lane below him and remembered the sixth assassin, who had remained below with the horses. He saw a shadowy figure moving to meet him as he landed. Can't this! he cried, dropping to the ground and sprawling headlong. The assassin loomed over him and then suddenly lurched to the side. Paldo saw the form of the giant moorhound bearing the man to the ground. Canthus's long, white fangs were buried in his shoulder. "'Let's go!' cried the halfling, jumping to his feet and running to the horses. The dog followed, leaving his victim moaning softly in a spreading pool of blood. Paldo darted among the nervously shuffling horses. hee he shouted, slapping one of the steeds in the rump. He grabbed the stirrups of two more and yanked them sharply. Spooked, all six horses galloped down the lane and raced into the street, the halfling swinging widely from one stirrup. Canvas raced behind, urging any stragglers ahead with sharp barks. Any more ideas? asked Ponswain. For once his voice was not laden with sarcasm. Tristan had tried to bend the bars on the window. I can't do anything about the lock without my tools, announced Dareth, turning from the door. They took my picks and probes before they tossed us in here. Tristan paced back and forth, while the other two flopped onto the mattresses. The prince truly hated confinement, a thing he had never experienced before. The room seemed to grow smaller with every passing minute, and tension threatened to consume him. He felt that he might soon be driven to beat his brains out against the iron door in a quest for freedom. Forcefully, he suppressed the primitive urge. Faint starlight was visible through the window, and the tiny specks of light seemed to mock his plight. "'Do you think the High King is eager to hear your petition?' asked Ponswain. He certainly has taken great pains to see that you waste no time getting to him. Tristan whirled on the Lord, but then halted. He didn't know if the man was baiting him or asking an honest question. Judging by the curious, slightly amused look on the man's face, Ponswain didn't know either. That's not too likely, said Dareth quietly. Why? asked the prince. After an assassination attempt, two, if you count the sinking of our boat, they're not likely to haul you all the way to Caladir. If they want me dead, why didn't they kill me already? Perhaps because they didn't dare do it in a public place, interjected Ponswain. Remember the mood at the inn? Dareth nodded and stood, nearly tripping on the chain linking his manacles. Cursing, he pulled his hands apart and stared in shock as one of the iron rings slipped over his hand to clink to the floor. "'How did you do that?' asked Tristan. "'I don't know.' Dareth was obviously mystified. He tugged on the other hand and it, too, slipped through the tight and rusty bond. He looked at Tristan as he threw the manacles to the bed. 
Suddenly, he laughed. These gloves are from the sea castle, he cried, holding up his hands. I knew there was something special about them. They're magical. He pulled one of the gloves off and looked at it. Let's see, said the prince, wondering if the gloves would work on his hands. He tried to pull one of them on, but it was too tight. But what's this? He asked as he examined the glove and noticed a tiny pouch inside. What's what? asked the Kalashite, taking the glove. He looked inside and pulled out a thin piece of stiff wire from the hidden pocket. A picklock, he announced. I'll have you out in no time. Dareth knelt beside the prince and pushed the thin probe into the keyhole of Tristan's right manacle. After a minute of delicate probing, the lock snapped open. In another moment, both of the prince's hands were free. That's great, said Tristan, jumping to his feet. Now we... Shh! Dareth hissed suddenly, holding up a hand. The faint, scraping sound of metal against metal reached his ears. He looked anxiously toward the door. Nodding in agreement, Dareth pantomimed a probing gesture. Someone was picking the lock to their cell. Haldo crouched next to the gatehouse, telling himself he was crazy. His wild plan didn't have a prayer of success. To the contrary, it virtually assured that he would be killed, no doubt squashed like a bug beneath some ogre's boot. The Prince of Corwell was a decent friend, but nowhere was it stated that friendship meant senselessly sacrificing one's life for a comrade who was probably already dead. And Tristan's no-good friend, Dareth, deserved whatever he got. At least, these were the arguments raging through the halfling's brain. But it was no use. Paldo decided that he had no choice but to go through with it. It would be the last thing he ever went through, but do it he would. He would try his plan. He tentatively hoisted one of the crystals of Thay, tossing the spear up and down a few times until he had captured the right degree of jauntiness. He tried to whistle cheerily, but only after licking his lips repeatedly could he call forth a few faint notes. Finally, he was ready. He emerged from the shadows and sauntered into the street, whistling a little jig and tossing the crystal into the air as if he hadn't a care in the world. Canthus followed at his heels. He smoothly approached the ogre, standing at the gatehouse, blocking entrance to the manor grounds. The monster regarded him in surprise, blinking its wide, dull eyes. The yellowed tusks, jutting upward from its lower jaw, looked very deadly. Paldo hoped that the look held more curiosity than belligerence. He stopped whistling as he reached the ogre. Hi there, he beamed. How'd you like to buy a crystal? It's the only one of its kind in the moon chaise. The army of undead crawled like a living organism across the land, needing neither food nor drink, completely tireless and insensitive to pain. The creatures trampled beds of flowers and thickets of thorns with equal impunity. But the plants suffered from more than just the shuffling footsteps. As each of the undead stumbled forward, each blade of grass, weed, and flower stalk that lay in its path simply turned brown and shriveled. It died before the monster even reached it. The bushes and trees that the army walked past gradually dropped their leaves. Slender branches drooped lifelessly. The zombies moved in the vanguard of the army. The dirt had been washed from them by a sudden downpour, and their rotting flesh hung in great folds of gore. Some of them carried rusty weapons. Others had no weapons except their bare hands, 
but even these were formidable. For most of the skin and flesh on the fingers had rotted away, leaving twisted claws of bone extended. The eyes had rotted from the sockets of most, but the lack seemed to make no difference. All of them moved with the same shuffling gait, tripping and stumbling often, but climbing to their feet to march forward. Often they left a piece of rancid flesh clinging to a thorny branch or sharp rock. Curiously, the zombie's hair remained in full, except for patches where the flesh had torn away. Thus, some of the males had tufts or beard, and many women retained long tresses that hung in careless disarray. The skeletons were gradually cleaned as a succession of rainstorms washed the dirt from their white bones. Like the zombies, some of the bear skeletons carried weapons or wore tattered bits of rusty armor. But they had no flesh to be scraped away by thorns. Empty eye sockets stared ahead as the unearthly force stumbled forward. The army moved without rest, for the undead suffered no fatigue, nor did they feel the need to sleep. And in Hobart's case, the heart of Kazgaroth had become his sustenance. The army marched, and the ground beneath it blackened and died. It left a swath of death running up the valley from Freeman's Down, across the high pass, and finally streaking down the mountain slopes into Mirlock Vale. The vanguard of the army, two score ghastly figures that had once been Northmen, shuffled into a shallow pond. Flies buzzed around the zombies, landing and feeding greedily, but the creatures took no note. Some lumbered forward, their faces so covered with flies that they appeared to grow black, buzzing beards. As the undead feet slurped into the mud of the pond, the water grew stagnant and black. Then wisps of pungent steam rose into the air with each footstep, and fish floated belly up to the surface. These first zombies crossed the waist-deep water and trudged through the muddy shore on the far side. They moved into a field, bright with flowers, and the petals fell like snowflakes. As more of the army crossed the field, more of it died. The force left a muddy wasteland of death in its wake. One zombie, who had nearly lost her leg to a Northman battle axe, suddenly collapsed as that leg gave way beneath it. Those behind, the bodies of friends and foes alike, trudged mindlessly over the twitching corpse, trampling it into the mud until only a clasping, clenching hand could be seen above the ground. The animals of the Vale sensed the approaching horror and fled upon hoof, paw, or wing. The army marched through a lifeless forest. Soon, now, Hobarth dreamed. The girl would be his. Tristan and Dareth stood to either side of the door. Ponswain, still manacled, sat upon a mattress facing the door. He nodded at the other two, and they understood. He would try to distract whoever it was that tried to enter their cell. The faint sounds of the picklock indicated a thief of considerable skill. There was no wasted motion or clumsy probing or an assassin trained at the Academy of Stealth, thought Tristan. In a moment, the lock released. The men held their breath, tension rising as they waited to see who was breaking into their cell. With a low creak, the door began to slide open. Dareth moved like a striking snake, reaching through the widening crack to grasp at the shirt of whoever stood outside. But his hand closed upon air. Stunned, he pulled the door open to reveal the intruder. But they saw no one standing in the hallway until they looked down. Poldo, cried the prince, reaching down to clasp his friend warmly. How did you get here? You'd never believe it if I told you, replied the halfling in a tense whisper. He threw an anxious look over his shoulder. Come 
on now. We've got to move. Just a minute, said Dareth, passing Paldo to look cautiously into the hall. He darted back to Ponswain and slipped the wire probe into one manacle. After a moment's hesitation, Paldo joined him and worked on the other. Thanks, the Lord said, briskly rubbing his wrists. Let's go, hissed Paldo, turning to the door. Tristan sensed a note of panic in Paldo's voice. What do you mean? What do you know? Assassins, Paldo whispered. They're here to kill you, in this building, maybe coming up the stairs right now. Wait, cried Tristan. I've got to find the Sword of Simmer Q. I can't leave without it. Paldo looked like he wanted to argue, but he finally turned with a sigh of exasperation. All right, I've got an idea where they might be keeping it. They've got an ogre on guard outside one of the rooms downstairs. Damn, cursed Tristan. How are we going to get past it? That's the least of our problems, said Paldo. He took the lead, his little short sword drawn as they slipped quietly down the spiraling stairway. They circled three times to reach the ground level, where a door led to an alcove off the great hall of the manor. As Paldo reached for the doorknob, they heard the unmistakable snort of an ogre coming from the other side of the door. How are we going to fight that thing? whispered Dareth in exasperation. With nothing but that little pig sticker between the three of us. This little blade has stuck some pretty big pigs, declared Paldo. Now shut up and follow me. Before the men could react, the halfling pushed open the door and stepped past the hulking ogre who stood outside. Tristan and Dareth were about to lunge after their friend. At the very least, they could not let him die alone. But the ogre didn't move. Paldo turned after a few steps, gesturing them forward, and kept on moving. Stunned, Tristan watched the ogre for a reaction. The monster clutched a glass ball in his huge and hairy palms, staring intently at the object as he turned it this way and that. He did not look up as the unbelieving trio tiptoed stealthily past. Tristan looked back to see the ogre still in the thrall of the shiny spear. Paldo, meanwhile, had pushed aside the curtain screening the alcove and stepped boldly into the great hall. Here, two were ogres, three of them. Each of the monsters sat upon the floor, legs outstretched to either side, and each stared intently at a glass bauble that seemed to be a match for the one in the alcove. Amazed at their good fortune, the men followed Paldo across the hall to a wooden door. Although the halfling boldly stepped over the outstretched log of one of the ogres, the men could not bring themselves to test the limits of their good fortune further. Instead, they slipped quietly along the walls until they reached Paldo. The halfling had already removed a wire probe from a slim leather case. He handed his sword to Dareth and knelt, carefully concentrating as he began to pick the lock of the huge oaken door. This one was guarded, he whispered. I'll bet it's where they put your sword. In a second, the lock clicked free, and Dareth raised his eyebrows in admiration. Paldo shrugged, unsuccessfully trying to conceal a smile of pride. With a cavalier gesture, he pushed it open. You miserable oaf! I ordered you to knock! The hawk-nosed captain shrieked as he rose but the tirade halted as abruptly as it began when the speaker realized that the intruders were not clumsy ogres. The officer's hand went to the hilt of his sword, but not before Dareth could act. The Kalashite sprang over Paldo and through the door, landing in a cat-like crouch halfway to the man's desk. 
Paldo's blade quivered overhead as Dareth held the tip in his fingers, poised for throwing. Stay where you are or die, he snarled, his voice low. The captain appeared to consider drawing his sword, but his eyes flicked to the slim dagger. He lifted his hand from the hilt of his sword. Tristan ran to his side and drew the sword himself, turning it against its owner. Where are our weapons? The officer nodded to a cabinet against the wall of the room, and Paldo hurried over to open it. He pulled out both swords and the scimitar and was about to close it when something else caught his eye. He lifted out a leather sack, hoisting it a few times to hear a satisfactory clink before closing the cabinet and handing the sword of Simmer Q to Tristan. Here, said the halfling, handing the other swords over to Ponswain and Dareth. Of course, he told the Kalashite. It won't do for throwing, but it'll give you a better reach. Dareth laughed. I couldn't have thrown this clunky thing either. I just had to make him think I could. He smiled at the captain as he handed the weapon back to Paldo. Check the hall, said Ponswain, walking to the desk. The captain stood behind it, hatred burning in his eyes. The Lord met his gaze squarely, stopping before the man. In a lightning-quick gesture, he drew his sword and thrust it through the man's chest, squarely into his heart. The officer fell instantly, blood spurting from the mortal wound. Ponswain turned and stalked toward the door. "'What did you do that for?' demanded Tristan, enraged. "'He wasn't going to stop us.' "'Not until we were gone, but as soon as we were out of his sight. "'He would have had every ogre in this town on our trails. "'Now we'll have a few minutes head start.' "'You took a man's life to buy us a few minutes? The prince was still incredulous. He had killed in battle before, but his companion's action had seemed so... ruthless. I did, Ponswain snapped. And it will be worth it if we use that time to escape instead of argue. He's right, said Dareth, opening the door. Follow me. The ogre still sat, bemused, as the halfling trotted into the entry hall adjacent to the great hall. Here a pair of huge doors stood shut. Do you have a plan? The prince asked the halfling. Plan? Paldo snorted in amusement. I was sure I'd be dead by now. Why would I need a plan? I did, however, make the precaution of securing and hiding six fast horses around the corner. This is the way I came in, explained the halfling, lifting the latch and pushing open one of the doors. They walked across a wide stone veranda, thankful that the moon remained hidden by clouds. An ogre sat upon the front steps, staring in rapture at his crystal. They descended and started on a path that wound through the huge formal garden, moving stealthily among tall hedges. There, I left Canthus at the gatehouse, said Paldo, pointing at the large structure looming before them. They didn't see the movement until it was too late. One moment, the pathway to the gatehouse lay open before them, and the next, four black figures had materialized from the bushes to block their way. Silken cloth of darkest black covered their bodies, but Tristan nonetheless recognized the hulking form that stepped ahead of the others. The Prince of Corwell and Dareth of Kalimshan, said Rasfalo in a soft, cultured voice. Rarely, perhaps never, have two deaths given me more pleasure than your shall. The leader pulled his silken mask aside as the moon broke from the clouds, washing the garden in milky light. The half-orc's beastly features leered at them, 
but his voice continued smoothly. And that little fellow who spied upon us. What a delightful surprise. See how nicely he waits for us, Rathbur? Didn't I tell you we'd find them here? One of the assassins nodded agreement. The little crossbow in his hand did not waver from them, however. The weapon was identical to the one that had killed Tristan's father. Tristan saw another of the crossbows held by a second assassin. Those bows could kill two of them before they could move. So, Raz Fallow, said Dareth pleasantly, still whoring for the highest bidder, I see. Indeed, replied the Hathor. And you could have joined me and lived to a ripe old age. You were good back then. I would have made you my lieutenant instead of my victim. Working for the likes of you is no choice, Dareth stated simply. Rasfalo shrugged, uninterested. He turned to the assassin with the bow. Now, Rasper, who should we kill first? The strength of the goddess was centered in Mirlock Vale. Nowhere else was her power so concentrated. Nowhere else were her druids so strong and the forces of disruption so weak. Yet even that strength was not sufficient to withstand the plague of death that marched into her most sacred realm. Each unnatural footstep, and there were thousands every minute, brought fiery pain to the soul of the goddess. Each of the undead creatures was a blasphemy against life itself a chaotic disruption of the balance of all things. She recoiled and suffered, for she had no power over the army of death. She withered and flinched beneath the footfalls, fearing the approach of the cleric and his evil god. The goddess was not without allies. Her children were her staunchest defenders, to be called in time of direst need. But the oldest of her children, the Leviathan, had been slain by the beast. The vast wolf pack she was capable of summoning might have been some help against the army, but the pack was spent, dispersed to a hundred dens across the isles. There remained only one of her children, one who had suffered grievously in the war with the beast. Yet that one she could not afford to leave to his rest. And so the goddess once again summoned Cameron the Unicorn. Chapter 9 Fugitives The assassins raised their crossbows, and Tristan could almost physically feel the dart focus on his chest. He was about to make a desperate dive to the side, almost certain to get himself killed, when Dareth surprised him with a long, Low whistle. I've just gotten you figured out, Rasvalo, said the Kalashite smoothly. He repeated the whistle again. The silver dart in the crossbow shifted slightly to point straight at Dareth. Rasvalo, the half orc, spoke. You have been amusing, Kalashite. He snorted a soft chuckle and actually seemed reluctant to give the order to kill. In fact, I shall have you killed last to show my gratitude. Tristan had been puzzled by his friend's whistle, but he suddenly remembered something Paldo had said. Instantly, he understood Dareth's plan. Time! They needed to stall the assassins for a few more seconds. I'm a dead man anyway, said the prince, devoutly hoping he was wrong. Tell me then, why are you doing this? Where do your orders come from? Rasfalo laughed, a sound like a crackling fire. You are indeed a dead man, and I do not waste my breath talking to dead men. 
the half-orc nodded to his men, and the pair raised their silver crossbows. I grow tired of this game, said the assassin. Laryl, you kill the one with the curly locks. He sneered at Ponswain. Rasper, you put your bolt into the prince. Aim low. Tristan saw a flash of movement in the moonlight behind the assassins. Dareth slowly raised his hand, as if in supplication, but the prince saw that his companion's finger was pointed directly at the archer. Again he saw the motion in the road. Closer now. Canthus, kill! Dareth's sharp command was timed exactly with the great dog's leap. The well-trained moorhound attacked silently and savagely. Rasper stumbled forward from the brutal impact, and though he tried to shoot the deadly dart into Tristan, the hound's attack had thrown off his aim. The missile flew harmlessly into the night as the man turned in desperation to grapple with the mighty jaws that eagerly sought his throat. The one called Laryl turned slightly in surprise. Ponswain dropped to his stomach in the path as the assassin released his dart. The prince could not see if it struck home. At the same moment, Tristan, Dareth, and Paldo leaped forward, drawing their blades. The three assassins crouched to meet them, Laryl dropping his bow and drawing a slim short sword. The assassins backed slowly away as Rasper screamed in pain. He twisted and struggled as the moorhound's teeth tore at his face. Locked in mortal combat, they rolled from the path, leaving the two trios faced off, a dozen feet apart. Dareth looked sharply to his side at Tristan, behind the prince, actually. Tristan cast a quick glance behind him and saw only Ponswain in the bright moonlight. The lord stumbled to his feet, dazed but uninjured, and the Kalashite turned back to the assassins. Look out! cried the Kalashite, suddenly whirling toward the prince again. Tristan twisted in surprise and then shouted in pain as he felt a sharp blade slicing through his back. But there was no one there. The prince lurched forward and crashed to the ground in agony. He coughed and choked with fright as he spit up blood. Dareth leaped at the source of the attack. Through a thickening haze, Tristan saw him strike at... Air! Dareth's blade snaked forward, and then the tip disappeared. He saw it again as the Kalashite pulled back, and now it dripped with blood. He heard a groan as something heavy but invisible fell across his legs. Tristan clenched his teeth to keep from crying out and he struggled to remain conscious. The invisible sword had stricken deep into his back. It would almost certainly have killed him had not Dareth's warning caused him to turn at the last minute. Dimly, he realized that one magically invisible assassin had crept up behind them. Paldo rushed forward to keep the three assassins at bay. Now, the Kalashite leaped forward to stand at the halfling's side as Paldo stumbled rapidly back before three slashing attackers. Ponswain climbed to his feet and charged forward, waving his long sword before him. Dareth sliced savagely at Razfalo's face, but the assassin ducked the blow easily and almost took off the Kalashite's ear with the counter-thrust. One of the others tried to follow up his master's advantage with a lunging stab, but this one overstepped his reach. Dareth's downward cut loped off his arm at the elbow, and the man stumbled to his knees, holding the bleeding stump in shock. Paldo attacked aggressively. The Kalashite crouched and jabbed at Razfalo, but neither of them could gain an advantage. Ponswain ducked about the edge of the melee, looking for an opening. Suddenly, the halfling shouted in alarm. His attacker had just knocked the blade from his hand. Paldo ducked as the assassin took a wild swing at his neck. 
the attack was the man's last mistake, as Ponswain leaped into the fray and stabbed the man in the throat with a single lightning thrust. Rasvallo slashed immediately after Dareth, but the Kalashite parried smoothly. The two blades clashed again and again as the fighters hurtled themselves at each other. Paldo scrambled to regain his sword, and rage twisted Rasvallo's face into a hideous mask of hatred. He spit in Dareth's face and sprang backward, snarling. I will see you again, Kalashite. His voice was a rasping, inhuman growl as he turned and raced into the darkness. I'll get that baboon faced, growled the halfling, at last finding his sword. He lunged after the half-orc, but Dareth caught him by the collar and pulled him back. I admire your courage, he said sincerely. But he would kill you, or me. The darkness is his element. He wants us to come after him. Besides, our companion needs our help. Tristan saw his friends coming toward him, and then nothing more. Come here, little fellow. You know I won't hurt you. To most listeners, Jenna's voice would have sounded like an assortment of chirps, squeaks, and clicks. Robin, however, had no difficulty understanding her teacher's speech. Neither did the small red squirrel, obviously, for the little creature bounded to the end of a long limb and then hopped lightly onto the great druid's outstretched hand. The creature jumped to her shoulder and sniffed curiously at her ear as Jenna smiled at Robin. I really think the mammals are the most fun of them all, she said. They are the most like us, of course, and I think they can be friendliest of all our creatures when they want to be. Food? The squirrel chirped. Oh, you little beggar, sighed Jenna in resignation, nevertheless reaching into a pocket of her loose gown to draw forth an acorn. Robin looked up suddenly as the limb next to Jenna sagged slightly. Don't you dare, Newt. Scowling, the dragon became visible. Perched over the squirrel, he had been about to squeeze the animal's tail, a prank that certainly would have sent it shrieking in terror to the highest branches of the tree. You should be ashamed of yourself, rebuked Jenna. I can't help it, whined the dragon, his wings and tail drooping pathetically. I'm so bored. You two never have time for anything fun anymore. It's always lesson this and teach that and learn the other thing. And you're always yelling at me, too. He pointed out defensively. Newt, where are you? Or don't do that, Newt. Or stop eating that, Newt. Or something else. We have been working hard, said Jenna, with a look at Robin. I suppose I have been trying to make up for lost time. Why don't we have lunch at the pond? We can share a bottle of wine and have a quiet afternoon. Yes, 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 shrieked Newt, blinking into invisibility in his excitement. A second later he was back, buzzing happily. I was going to introduce you to the bats today, said Jenna as they started toward the cottage. But that can wait till later. They're more talkative at night, anyway. Robin walked thoughtfully back to the cottage. She felt at peace for the first time since the stranger had come. When Newt had removed the heart-like rock from the grove, it seemed as though a whole world of trouble had vanished. But another thing bothered her, and now she felt she could talk about it. Teacher... I'm troubled by a dream I have had several times in the past weeks. I'm certain it is a vision from the goddess. Jenna looked at her quizzically. It's about my father, the king. And Tristan, too. I'm afraid something terrible has happened. They need me. You wish to cease your studies, 
Jenna asked softly. No, but I must learn what has happened. I must go to them. Can you forgive me if I leave you for a while? Jenna smiled sadly. There would be nothing to forgive. You are a capable and accomplished student, able to make your own decisions. If you must leave for a time, so be it. I only hope you will return. Jenna, I will, Robin pledged. And thank you. She felt a giddy sense of relief and anticipation. She would travel to Corwell as swiftly as possible. The women had almost reached the cottage when they heard a pathetic bleeding in the distance. They paused and heard it again. The sound originated to the south, near the edge of the grove, and seemed to be coming closer. That sounds very bad, frowned Jenna, turning to run toward the cries. Robin joined her and quickly outdistanced her teacher. She raced through the garden and into the oaks, where she almost ran headlong into a terrified doe. She grasped the trembling creature around the neck and stopped its flight, muttering soothing sounds. Kneeling beside it, she felt the animal shaking subside, although it did not cease entirely. In moments, Jenna joined them. What's the matter, brown-eyed one? She whispered in a voice so soft that Robin could barely hear. The deer bleated again, a sound that Robin could not understand specifically, but she easily recognized the deer's sheer terror. Burrs matted the animal's sides and belly, and its legs were covered with many small scratches. Jenna looked at her student, and the lines of concern around her eyes deepened. She stroked the deer a few times, and gradually it settled down. She did not rise until the creature began to graze contently on the sweet grasses of the druid's grove. I do not understand what frightened her, she explained. But never have I seen such lasting terror. She has obviously run many miles. What should we do? asked Robin. The deer's panic aroused deep feelings of anger within her. She wanted to punish whatever had tormented the creature so. I must go and have a look, said the druid. Let me come with you, pleaded Robin. No, you cannot yet. I will call upon powers you have yet to learn, though your abilities grow daily. Her teacher smiled at her, and patted her shoulder reassuringly. While I am gone, I want you to remain in the grove. We may have other creatures coming here to seek our help. As she finished speaking, a huge flock of blackbirds squawked into sight. Thousands of feathered figures raced through the sky until they were all safely within the confines of the grove. There they settled, still agitated, into the highest branches of the towering oaks. Robin and Jenna both noticed that they, too, had fled from the south. Death reached out with cold fingers to seek the Prince of Corwell. Tristan only vaguely felt the chill presence beside him, for all of his feelings were blanketed in a gray fog. The pounding cadence of the galloping horse penetrated his consciousness only barely, and he did not sense Dareth's arms around him holding him in the saddle. The pain of his wound had long since vanished. His only discomfort now came from straining for air in his wounded lung. For a time, the prince was ready to yield to the dark figure that rode beside him. The struggle to breathe was too exhausting to continue. The blessed relief, promised by the one who held those arms outspread, seemed the most pleasant recourse. Tristan, look to me, my prince. For a second, he didn't react to the distant voice. 
When he did, it was as if his body was mired in thick mud. He couldn't open his eyes or turn without expending great effort. But finally he saw. An ocean of mist spread around him, muffling the sounds of the horse's hooves. The jolting gait became smooth, even comfortable. He could see that they were racing across the plain of fog, and then the mist parted to reveal a wide, smooth lake. It seemed to him that they were galloping along the shore, though he couldn't see any ground below him. In truth, he did not look down. Tristan! The voice again reached seductively for his mind, and he struggled to see who was speaking. Then he saw the white figure, standing serenely on the waters of the lake. Her arms were spread wide, beckoning. Queen Allison stood some vague distance away. It seemed that she was very far, yet he could see tears welling in the corners of her eyes. He could hear her voice, though she spoke in the softest of whispers. How beautiful she was! Her blonde hair billowed like a flag in a gentle breeze, while her snowy gown seemed more like water than cloth as it flowed across her body. She looked very sad, and the prince wanted to hold her, to comfort her. And then he understood her sadness. His quest had failed. He had disappointed her. A black sense of despair grasped him, and once again he saw the specter of death seated beside him. Desperately, he struggled to reach the queen, but his body would not move fast enough. A sob forced itself from his throat, and already her image grew dim. My queen, he croaked. He struggled to hold out a hand to her so that she could pull him to her side. Stay there, she cried, her voice growing stern. Do not come to me. You must not come to me. He made no reply, but his throat choked with sorrow, and tears flooded his eyes. The agony of watching her slip away was more than he could bear. Yet somehow, though his ghostly horse raced like the wind and the queen stood still upon the water, she remained beside him. You must go on, my prince. Again he heard her. She began to fade from view, but her voice was stronger than ever. Go to Care Caladir. Only from the high king himself will you learn the secret of your destiny. And prince... Beware his wizard! Beware Sindri! She had almost disappeared from his sight, and despair threatened to drown the prince in his well of self-pity. My lady, he moaned softly. No, she said, and suddenly her image was clear again. Your lady is another, a woman who needs you, and who can help you. Call to your lady, my prince. Do not call to me. And then she was gone, and in her place stood a green-eyed druid with flowing black hair. Her beauty brought a lump to his throat. By the goddess, how he needed Robin! He must see her again. He must live. Robin, he croaked, quietly and the sound became a sob. But then his companions slowed the pace of their flight as the black horses grew winded. The pain returned, lancing through his chest and throat in fiery agony. The taste of blood was bitter in his mouth. But with the pain came awareness, an understanding that he did want to live that he had a mission to perform. With this understanding, he banished the specter of death from his side. The prince was unconscious to his surroundings. He did not feel his companions lift him from the saddle, 
nor see them enter the battered door of a frail country chapel. But he was aware of his life, and he was determined to keep it. The courtier timidly approached the great throne, his powdered wig trembling as he walked. Your majesty, the man began, his voice cracking. The, um, the wizard cannot be found. Imbecile, barked the king. Out of my sight, fool. Do not return until you have found him. The king rose and stalked down the stairway leading to his throne. He reached the bottom of the staircase and turned to the side in agitation, wrapping the robe about his legs and almost tripping himself. Out! he screamed. All of you, go away! The courtiers, gestures, and ladies in waiting in the huge chamber all turned and fled for the doors. In seconds, the vast room was empty except for the king. And one other. Sindri stood beside the throne, his black robe billowing and swelling around him. The king turned back, pacing, and suddenly saw him. He gasped and clapped a hand to his mouth, but quickly straightened to march purposefully up the steps. Where have you been? I have had every messenger in the palace searching for you. Why can't you be where you're supposed to be? I came as soon as I could, sire. I was in the midst of some arcane meditation. To interrupt it would have been extremely dangerous. The wizard made a slight, almost imperceptible gesture. The king's shoulders sagged as he turned to flop wearily into his throne. I have been so worried, he whined. Has there been any word of that upstart from Corwell? We have had word of his arrival at Llewellyn. A strong garrison of the Scarlet Guard is posted there. I am certain that we will hear of his capture very soon. The wizard's voice was soothing, and the king began to relax. I'm sorry I shouted at you, Sindri. My nerves are not what they used to be. The wizard did not reply, and his thin smile of amusement was masked by his robe. When he is captured, continued King Carathal, I want him brought to me immediately. I am curious about this prince. I wish to learn why he pretends to my throne. At the earliest opportunity, sire, I will have him delivered to you, replied Sindri, silently adding, His corpse will not tell you much. You will protect me from him, won't you? Of course, sire. You know that you have nothing to worry about. Perhaps you need something to take your mind off this little distraction. An execution, perhaps? Is there a prisoner you would like to put to death? Perhaps that sister of the outlaw O'Rourke? No, not yet, the king spoke firmly. I still hope to make him see reason. I will never be able to do that if she is dead. The wizard gestured subtly and whispered to the king. Very well, sighed Carathal. Have her put to death in the morning. For a moment, a look of stark horror flashed across the king's face. Once again, he saw the ghosts arrayed against him and sensed their number growing. But then he yawned listlessly. Thank you, Sindri. Sometimes I wonder what I would do without... The king could not finish his sentence, for he had already fallen asleep. I shan't be gone for more than a day, explained the great druid. Her manner was solemn. Try to keep them from fighting. Talk to the leaders. They will help you. 
Robin nodded, trying to conceal her doubts. The grove of the great druid had, overnight, filled with terrified animals. Many deer, rabbits, wild pigs, squirrels, mice, and other little mammals were overrunning the place, nervously trying to avoid the few wolves, foxes, badgers, and weasels that had also come here for protection. But protection from what? They still knew very little about whatever menaced the grove save that it had caused an unprecedented fear among the wild creatures. "'If you have to, ask Grunt for help,' said Jenna. "'He will complain a lot, but he could be your best ally.' "'I will,' said Robin. Indeed, the old brown bear was a cantankerous and surly fellow, but she knew him to be an unusually steady and reliable animal.' I will hurry, added the druid. Take care, my child. Jenna turned toward the south, and her short body shifted and blurred before Robin's eyes. She grew smaller, and her brown robe slowly became a coat of golden feathers. Her arms became wings, and her nose became a beak. The smooth head, no longer even vaguely human, turned to look at Robin and the young druid saw the blessing glittering from the small black eyes. Then the wings struck boldly downward, and the great eagle that was Jenna Moonsinger sprang into the air and climbed steadily skyward. She rose without faltering, circling over the grove, until she was no more than a speck in the southern sky. A heavy sense of menace began to bear down on Robin as the day progressed, removing any joy from her daily tasks. At first she thought that the feeling was produced by the threat to the veil, and indeed that must have been a part of it. Yet more and more she found her mind drifting to thoughts of Tristan. Instead of the usual ripples of pleasure that his memory ordinarily gave her, her thoughts of the prince actually increased her anxiety. This feeling grew every time she thought of him, which was nearly every minute. She could not escape the feeling that he was in terrible danger. She wrestled with a strong temptation to flee the grove, abandoning everything in a headlong dash to reach him. Yet, even if she had known where he was, and she felt certain that he was far from Corwell, she could not have brought herself to renounce her trust with the goddess. And so, once again, she turned herself to her many chores. But the work had a hollow, meaningless quality today. She was certain that it did not come from within herself. Then she felt a strange peace fall over the grove. The squeaks and squawks of the animals quieted as she looked up. Something had already entered the grove. It was a presence mighty, yet serene. Robin walked quickly through the oaks, finally breaking into a run. She suspected the visitor's identity even before he stopped from between the oaks to regard her. She thought she saw a benign smile upon his face as she shouted with joy and ran to clasp her arms around his neck. The smile was in her imagination, of course, for although he, too, felt great joy, Cameron the Unicorn could not be expected to smile. A cool, strong breeze flowed steadily northward, lashing the waters of the strait into rolling gray swells. Tavish fought the wind, tacking back and forth, but she still made only slow headway toward Corwell. For the hundredth time, she wondered if she was doing the right thing. After all, she reminded herself, what could she have done to rescue the prince? Painfully but pragmatically, she knew that she was no fighter. A daring escape from the heart of the enemy stronghold was something she could never hope to accomplish. The only place that seemed to offer the chance of help was the prince's homeland. She didn't know what kind of help the lords of Corwell could offer, but she had nowhere else to turn. And still, the wind blew, 
and the gray waves rolled. Put him in here, said the short cleric, pushing aside a wool tapestry to reveal a small room. The only furnishing was a narrow bed, but Dareth and Paldo were grateful for the chance to lay Tristan upon even that tiny platform. Ponswain remained outside, sword held at the ready, looking up and down the long ribbon of darkened, empty road. The cleric ran back to the doors of his chapel and saw that the road was empty. The deepest hours of night were just beginning to yield to morning. Cowan, he called. Come here. Moments later, a lad of about fifteen emerged from a small alcove, rubbing his eyes and yawning. He blinked curiously at the visitors, and his eyes widened as he saw the blood-stained prince stretched, pale and death-like, on the bed. "'See to their horses, lad,' barked the cleric. Cowan hurried from the chapel as the man turned back to them. "'I am Patriarch Trevor, a cleric of Chaunty, he said moving quickly to Tristan's side. The man moved with a smooth and easy grace. He took the prince's hand in one of his while pressing the other to Tristan's forehead. He is very near death. A few more miles on horseback, I'm certain, would have killed him. The patriarch closed his eyes, still touching the prince's wrist and face. He whispered softly, a ritual sound that lasted nearly a minute. A warm glow seemed to surround the prince, visible as a faint light to the watchers. Dareth had a feeling of deep reverence and wanted to drop to his knees. He stubbornly resisted the urge, instead staring, spellbound, as the cleric worked his healing magic. Chaunty, said the cleric reverently. Tristan winced and thrashed on the narrow mattress. A sudden shocking spurt of red blood burst from his mouth to spatter the cleric, but the patriarch ignored it. Dareth's hand leaped to his sword. He feared for the prince, but the cleric held a steadying hand up and the calishite relaxed. The prince groaned and twisted on the bed. His eyes opened but the pupils rolled so far back in his head that only the whites were visible. The cleric whispered again, and the soft glow brightened and then slowly faded away. As the cleric finally opened his eyes, Tristan's chest began to rise and fall with deep, regular breathing. Slowly, color began to creep into his face. He sleeps explained the cleric. Now, let us talk. Dareth and Paldo followed him into another small room. Here, Trevor pulled a bottle of wine from a wooden chest and gestured them to sit at the small table. You are fugitives, he said finally. But from what? Paldo and Dareth exchanged quick looks, obviously surprised by the blunt question. Finally, the halfling spoke. The High King's ogres took the pr- Ah, uh, my friend, on false charges. We helped him get away, but he was wounded during the escape. Ogres of the Scarlet Guard, growled the patriarch with surprising venom. The mercenary scum! Seeing their startled looks, he explained, The guard is just another example of the blight that seems to have fallen across our land. We watched them march through Grady. That's this little town. Some days passed. The sight of the people huddled in their homes, shivering in terror, broke my heart. Remember, these are the troops of their own king. I ask you, what kind of king would bring such terror to his own subjects? Those kings are more common than you'd like to believe, said Dareth. 
though this is the first I've heard of such a ruler in the moon chase. In my experience, the Fofolk have been ruled with freedoms that far exceed the norm. True, agreed Ponswain, coming through the door. The road is quiet. How is the prince? He will live, said the patriarch. The Lord did not respond as he moved to sit in the only vacant chair. Dareth wondered whether Ponswain considered the news good or bad. Why haven't the lords of Caladir stood up to the king? asked the Lord. I can't imagine that we, in Corwell, would stand for such behavior. They have tried. Several have disappeared. Others have gone to the dungeon. Those that disappear have had their lands confiscated and their holdings assigned to allies of the king. One, the former Lord Roark, has become an outlaw in the forest, railing bitterly against his fate, but helpless to do anything about it. Why hasn't there been a rebellion? pressed Ponswain. I don't know, shrugged the cleric. Perhaps because they lack a strong leader, or more likely, because the Fofolk are frightened. The patriarch seemed to consider his statement and his situation. He was silent for a moment. I am glad that I could help you, but you have powerful enemies. I can hide you here until nightfall, but then you will have to be on your way. It is not for myself that I fear, but this entire village would doubtless be destroyed were you discovered here. We understand, said Dareth, and thank you for what you have done. But you must decide where you will go from here, the cleric reminded them. Or do you already know? To care Caladir to see the High King. The voice drew their attention to the doorway, and they turned to see the Prince of Corwell standing there, watching them grimly. Tristan! Paldo jumped to his feet as the men looked in astonishment at the Prince. He leaned against the door, his face drawn with pain, but the color had returned to his skin, and his eyes glowed with determination and anger. You should be asleep said Trevor, rising to offer the prince his chair. I shall be soon, but we need to plan first. Are you certain you want to go to Care Caladir? asked the patriarch. Yes. Very well. The king's road, the highway you took from Llewellyn, is certain to be patrolled in strength. It would mean almost certain capture for you to travel there. But there are other roads, trails really, that lead to the west of here, and then north, through Dernal Forest. The soldiers of the king do not venture into the forest much, but the forest has its own challenges. For one thing, the trails are few and difficult to follow. We have some woodcraft, said the prince. We'll travel the forest roads. I can give you a map and some directions. You will have to trust to your good sense for the rest of your guidance. The cleric proceeded to sketch a spider web of winding trails onto a sheet of parchment. You will be very weak for several days, he warned Tristan. That wound would have killed most men, I'm certain. So have a care for yourself and rest when you need to. Thank you, friar. We shall, said the prince. I have but one question. Why have you done all of this for us? The ways of my goddess are not for mortals to understand, not even her clerics. I but do her bidding. Remember this, if you think of nothing else. Chaunty is your ally. She hopes for the success of your mission and she will aid you as much as lies in her power. Now that you are here, I understand. Your mission to care, Caladir, no. Don't tell me any more about it. 
but I understand that a king who hires monsters to protect himself from his own people cannot work for the good of those people or their land. This king is offensive to my goddess, and therefore her blessing falls upon your mission. May you ride like the wind and be as difficult to catch, concluded Patriarch Trevor. The cleric's words seemed to have a pleasant effect. Tristan felt warmth spread through his body, and a feeling of benign goodwill descended upon him. Thank you for everything, he said, clasping the patriarch's hand firmly. You have given our mission new hope, as you have done for mine also, said the cleric quietly. Then they slept and when darkness fell, the men mounted their black horses and slipped into the night, the great moorhound trotting watchfully ahead. Behal wallowed in the fire pits of Jahana, luxuriating in the sensual feel of lava fueled with fresh blood. The god of death, lover of all murderous acts, was in fine fettle, his devotees, and even those opposed to him, were acting in concert to provide entertainment. But even more than entertainment, each act of killing strengthened Behal, increasing his influence among the gods and enhancing his ability to interfere in the affairs of men. And so Behal watched the events unfolding before him. He thrilled at the sight of the dead army, that was defiling Mirlock Vale. They would be his mightiest achievement when he was done, creating a legion of death that would bring the entire land beneath his baneful rule. Bahal drooled at the thought of the young druid's blood warming his belly as Hobarth performed the ritual sacrifice. He watched the events upon Alaron with less interest but took mild note of the occasional body left in the wake of the fleeing prince. More than once he had thought that the death of the prince himself was imminent, but each time the mortals had managed to fend it off. Just barely. But Behal was patient. Chapter 10 Shapeshifter the unicorn nuzzled Robin's shoulder affectionately. The druid said nothing, but the weight of responsibility she had borne this day seemed to grow lighter. She leaned back and looked at the great creature, child of the goddess herself. Cameron's white beard hung in a thick tuft from his jaw, and his ivory horn jutted proudly before him, more than four feet long. His large eyes were bright and clear, and Robin whispered a soft prayer of thanks for this miracle. Only a year earlier, the great unicorn had been blinded, his skin and eyes scalded by the power of the beast. But his healing seemed complete, and his broad nostrils snorted as if to belittle the hurts he had suffered. Cameron, you big horse! Newt shouted with joy as he buzzed into the oak grove and saw his old friend. He darted like an arrow to the unicorn, perching proudly on Cameron's long horn. Thank the goddess you're here, he chattered. Robin has been having an awful time with the animals. Oh, she tries, you know, but she's still so young. Now that you're here, I'm sure we can get all of these. Cameron turned his broad head to the rear interrupting Newt's explanation, and the dragon was forced to grasp the moving horn tightly to retain his perch. The bushes behind him parted very slightly, and a tiny face looked timidly at Robin. The unicorn gestured with his horn, and the little creature stepped forward. Robin saw that it looked like a small man, about two feet tall, except that it had gossamer wings sprouting from each shoulder and long pointed ears. As the little creature bowed, she noticed two long things, almost like the antenna of a bug, growing from the fellow's forehead. She knew then that this was a wood sprite. 
He was dressed in a green tunic and cap, and he carried a small bow and quiver in his hands and a dagger at his belt. Welcome to the grove, she said, extending her hands. Yazili click, cried Newt, diving from the horn to hover before the sprite. You're here too? We should have a party. He turned to Robin, hovering up to her eye level. Can we have a party, Robin? Can we have a party, please? No. Can't you tell there's something serious going on, Newt? She felt genuinely angry at the dragon. He had been no help at all as she had struggled to control the animals. Newt looked piqued for a second before zooming back to Cameron's horn to watch the proceedings with interest. I, I must tell you of the danger, said the sprite in a high and musical voice that sounded an odd contrast to the seriousness of the missive. Robin understood his nervousness. Sprites were among the shyest of the creatures in the vale. Though there were many of them in the surrounding woods, she had never seen one. She knew that it must have taken great courage to bring Yazili Click here. There is terrible, to terrible danger abroad. We have seen the army that defiles the veil, said the sprite. It is coming here. An army? gasped Robin. That is not the worst of it, not the worst, added Yazili Click. It is not an army of men or Luir or even Furbolgs. It is an army of corpses. Corpses? But how? Robin was too stunned to think. Certainly the little sprite could not be telling the truth. Yazili Click nodded his head, his tiny antenna bouncing. He looked like he was about to start crying. I d don't, don't know. He wailed. But they come this way, this way, and they are evil, evil. None of them saw the great eagle dropping silently from the twilight skies until it settled to the ground beside them. The eagle shape shifted and suddenly Jenna Moonsinger stood beside them. Even in the dim light, Robin saw that she was pale. She started to speak, and her voice was strained, as if she struggled to control it. She had obviously heard the sprite's last remark. They draw nearer with every minute. They will be upon us in two days at the most. I have sent the sparrows to summon the other druids of the Vale. We will gather here as quickly as possible. Perhaps together our might will daunt this force somehow. The druids of the Vale, several dozen in number, each tended their own sacred groves scattered across the face of Gwyneth. Here, at the grove of the great druid, they gathered occasionally for councils, but for the most they were solitary men and women, seeking little human companionship. Jenna turned to look at Yazili Click, and her eyes softened. Thank you little one, for coming here. I know how hard it was for you. I'll s stay to help, blurted the fairy, looking immediately as if he regretted the offer. Next, the great druid raised her chin and looked her pupil squarely in the eyes. Robin, you must remain here a while. I know of your concern for the king and for your prince, but you are needed here. Robin sensed the command in her teacher's words, but that command was not necessary. She knew where her duty lay, and she nodded in response. There was nothing else that she could do. The patriarch's map proved invaluable as the black horses carried the riders through the night. They alternated mounts frequently, allowing two of the steeds to run free, while the others carried Tristan, Dareth, Ponswain, and Paldo. Keeping the mounts fresh, they made excellent time. The hours in the saddle wore heavily on Tristan, 
However, as the pain of his wound grew into a throbbing ache across his entire back, he said nothing, fearing that his companions would slow their pace, but he was nonetheless relieved as dawn approached and they began to look for a place to hide during the day. There were few likely spots along the winding country lanes. Alarone, at least this portion of it, seemed devoid of wilderness or even of large tracts of forested land. They eventually left the road, riding across several fields and crossing numerous stone fences before finding a little clump of woods in a secluded hollow. Here they dismounted, ate some of the bread and fruit that the cleric had sent with them, and prepared to rest. Pardo left the three men to fill his water sack in a nearby stream, and they sat quietly for a time. I suppose you've realized that our original mission no longer has much relevance, said Ponswain, lounging. Tristan looked at him suspiciously. He could not help but suspect the Lord's motives, but he nodded now. Indeed, there's not much point in petitioning approval from a man who has ordered me arrested and killed. Then let's go back to Corwell and leave this madhouse to its inmates, said the Lord. What can you hope to accomplish here? I can gain a measure of vengeance for my father's death. I can force the king to admit his crimes against the Fofolk, perhaps even to make some of them right again. You're mad. He's tried to have you killed already. Now you want to travel to his very stronghold and tell him you don't like what he's done? You don't have a chance. On the contrary, I think I have a good chance. We have avoided his pitfalls thus far. And besides... I have to try something. I cannot let my father's death go unavenged. Your foolish vengeance will get us all killed. You are free to return to Corwell whenever you want. We can go on without you. Tristan challenged. Ponswain slumped silently, scowling. Paldo returned with a dripping goatskin of water and passed the bag around. Silently, they drank as the halfling flopped to the ground beside them. How do you propose to gain entrance into the castle? asked Dareth as they settled into their makeshift beds. I don't know, admitted the prince. But if there's always a way to escape from a place, as you've told me, then it follows that there's always a way to get in. The opposite of escape is capture, announced Paldo. We have to get there before we worry about getting in, observed the Kalashite. And from the looks of this country, that's far from guaranteed, especially if there are troops out looking for us. On the other hand, the troops of the High King seem to be none too popular in this part of the country. If the Fafolk in the Diving Dolphin or the Cleric Trevor are any indication, said Tristan. Still, let's try and stay hidden, warned the halfling. I don't want to have to rescue you again. I've been meaning to ask you about that, said the prince. How did you pull that off, distracting the ogres? Paldo chuckled. Not a little proud, he told the story of the assassins in the tree and his entry into the manor house. For once he embellished the details only slightly. It was our good fortune to have a friend like you lurking in the shadows, laughed the prince. Paldo grinned, enjoying the praise. Now tell me, asked the halfling. What did you scoundrels do to get in trouble with the law? Were you stealing milk from a baby, or perhaps you got enthusiastic about the young daughter of some local lord? Nothing so straightforward, said Tristan. He explained about the assassination of King Kendrick and their mission to Alarone. 
After a long hesitation, he described the castle of Queen Allison and the prophecy he had received there. I'm sorry to hear about your father, Paldo said. Tristan felt a moment of sorrow. It came suddenly and then passed. He realized with a twinge of guilt that it had been many days since he had thought of his father. But now he could feel some sense of atonement. We did more than a little avenging in Llewellyn, he said. I'm certain that the men with Rasfallow were the same who accompanied him to Corwell. I wish that bloodthirsty devil hadn't gotten away, said Dareth bitterly. But we've certainly trimmed down the numbers of his band. It's too bad we couldn't have put an end to his killing, said the prince. But we'll have another chance, I'm certain. Especially with your subtle plan, snapped Ponswain. He had been listening to their conversation, using a saddle to keep his head off the ground. But now he sat up. I didn't ask you to come along, retorted the prince, his anger kindled. No, that was my decision. And now that I'm here, I'm wondering what kind of madness you're planning next. My lord Ponswain, this is my fight, and it has become a personal matter. I neither seek nor welcome your involvement in it. If you have concerns that can better be addressed elsewhere... Indeed I do, Prince. I want our kingdom to prosper, to see some of the glory it had ages ago. If I am king, I think it will. Perhaps the same thing can happen under your rulership, but I haven't seen any proof of that yet. Tristan flushed, instinctively reaching for his sword. Anger blazed from his eyes as he met Ponswain's level gaze. The Lord's face was curiously unemotional. Oh, you wield your blade well, certainly better than I do, continued Ponswain. But I wonder how well you can wield your mind. Tristan forced down his rage, but the remark cut him deeply. In a dark corner of his mind, he realized that Ponswain was too close to the truth. What ideas did he have to offer? What kind of a plan had he assembled? Perhaps under the tutelage of your wisdom I'll learn, he snapped, trying to turn Ponswain's sarcasm back at him. But the challenge sounded hollow, even to himself. On that cheerful thought, I'm going to get some rest, said Dareth. The others, too, rolled into their blankets. Tristan was still livid. His mind coughed up numerous sharp remarks that he regretted he had not thought of at the time. But as his anger cooled, a strange thought struck him. For the first time, he saw Ponswain not just as a rival for the throne— but as a man who truly cared for the kingdom. The knowledge was disturbing, and he took it with him to sleep. That night they rode again, gradually turning north. They found themselves entering wilder country now, though still tame in comparison to Corwell. The prince's wound still hurt, but did not seem to have gotten worse during the last day. This time they found it easy to find a secluded place to spend the day, and on the following night they rode into Durnal Forest itself. At least we're a bit more secure here, remarked the prince, as they trotted down a dark forest lane. Canthus, as usual, lopped along before them. We should have no trouble finding a place to hide during the day. All of them felt more relaxed among the thick, sheltering branches. Though the moon was half full, the canopy of leaves made the road almost black. That changed very suddenly. Their only warning was a low growl as Canthus froze, staring into the darkness. Harsh words in a strange language barked from the night. 
Magic! cried Paldo in alarm. And even as he spoke, the ground itself suddenly glowed with cool, bright light. The little party halted, clearly outlined by the bright spell, and blinded from seeing anything beyond their circle. Do not move, strangers, said a voice from the darkness. The voice was strong, filled with the authority of command. Tristan's eyes finally adjusted to the brightness enough that he could make out forms moving toward them from all sides. He saw men, armed with the largest longbows he had ever seen, in a circle around them. He counted several dozen with his first glance, and he saw that each member of his party was in the sights of a weapon. The prince hauled back on his reins, searching for escape, but the ring of archers was solid and very menacing. There was something frightening in the lack of emotion he detected among them, as if this was simply in a day's work. Yes, he realized now. They were captives once again. The Black Rock is gone, said Newt miserably. Yazili Click nodded in agreement. Somebody must have taken it. This is all my fault. The fairy dragon was on the verge of tears. His wings drooped miserably when he landed on the bench, returning from the mission Jenna had given him. You helped us very much by removing it from the grove, said Jenna. You are not to blame for the evil that has befallen us. Robin stroked Newt's head and long neck, surprised at his contrition. She had never seen the fairy dragon expressing anything approaching remorse before. Now, continued Jenna, addressing the creatures that had gathered before her cottage, you must all listen very carefully. Around her were arrayed Cameron the Unicorn, the great brown bear Grunt, and a hundred or more of the animals, the strongest and wisest from among the teeming throngs. The great druid sought to calm the fears and soothe the tensions of the gathered wild creatures. She needed them to remain peaceful throughout the night, for she and Robin would not be able to watch them. Finally, she finished, and the animals drifted away to rejoin their kind. Now, Newt, Yazili Click, said the great druid, I must ask you to care for the grove while we're gone. The other druids should be arriving soon. You must tell them where we have gone. Will you do this? The sprite nodded. Can't I come along? pleaded Newt. You will get into... We need you here, soothed Robin. You must help us. I will, said the fairy dragon with a resigned sigh. He darted to Cameron's horn and looked away from them. Now, my dear, it is time, Jenna said quietly, turning to Robin. The two druids entered the cottage. There, Jenna opened several clay jars and removed pieces of holly and mistletoe. Robin picked up her long staff, the legacy of her mother. She handled the smooth ashwood staff reverently, grateful for the potent magic it contained. It alone provided her a weapon that might slow the unnatural army approaching through the veil. Come along. Her teacher walked outside again, with Robin following. They crossed the now silent grove to its heart, a sacred place where even the animals did not go. Here the moon well illuminated the surrounding ring of stone columns with a soft milky glow. Here the power of the goddess was most accessible to her druids. Woman, you must concentrate like you never have before. You must realize that your youth and lack of experience make this even more dangerous than it must be. 
I understand, teacher, said Robin solemnly. I would not even allow you to consider this action were it not for our dire emergency. And I admit, the fact that you have displayed an inherent talent gives me some reassurance that you are capable of this feat. Now, hold your staff and listen to me. Robin planted the staff at her side, grasping it firmly in her right hand. She heard Jenna whisper something, private words to the goddess. Remember your lessons, intoned the great druid, her voice taking on the cadence of a chant. Remember the bright thighs, remember the long light bones and the feathers. Think of the beak and the claw so hard. Concentrate. Robin remembered well. She pictured the powerful bird upon her teacher's lap, and she saw every detail of its graceful body. She didn't feel the magic of the Earth Mother wash over her, or even notice the sudden change in her body. So intently was she focused within her mind. She only noticed as she stretched to keep from falling. Driving powerful wings downward, she felt her feet lift from the ground. She looked around, and her eyes saw the moon well in minute detail, falling away below. Again and again she extended her wings, aware of Jenna soaring beside her. But only slowly did she understand. She was an eagle. She was flying. Alexei endured days and nights of black silence, chained to the wall of a stone cell. Madness came closer, daily, and the mage had few weapons with which to fight for sanity. Only hours after Alexei's imprisonment, Sindri and a cruel pain master had paid a visit to the cell. The pain master was an expert from Kalimshan, who had gleefully broken Alexei's hands, taking care to shatter every bone. For a time, the agonizing pain of those wounds had served to give him focus, but gradually the bones healed, freezing the appendages into twisted claws, useless for the delicate spell-casting gestures required by Alexei's craft. And as they healed, the pain lessened, and Alexei had only the darkness and solitude to comfort him. Now that the pain was gone completely, he had only his hate to keep him going. And so he nurtured that hatred, caressing it in his mind, building it, and storing it for the moment it could be released. He hated the king and Cryphon. He was certain that they had betrayed him, and he hated the pain master who had broken his hands. But most of all, he hated Sindri. The mage thought over and over of ways to destroy his former master. He relished thoughts of the sorcerer's death, a lingering death utilizing a variety of methods, most of them magical. But even had he been able to use his hands, he could not have cast a spell, for Sindri had encased his cell within a cone of silence. Neither a chip of stone falling to the floor, nor a hoarse scream from a terrified throat made any noise in that awful stillness. For a time, the mage wondered why Sindri had kept him alive instead of slaying him outright. But then he remembered the lurid god of the cleric Hobarth and his bloodthirsty altar. Blood of high magic flowed through Alexei's veins, and when Hobarth returned from his mission, the altar of Bahal would welcome Alexei to its eternal night. Welcome, travelers! A tall man jumped smoothly from a tree limb into the pool of magical light. He was dressed in brown trousers and a long green shirt, and his face, 
through his flowing red beard, was aloof, though not openly hostile. He spoke again. You really should take more care, you know, traveling the ways of Dernal Forest on a night so dark. Tristan looked at the ring of archers surrounding them. None had moved a muscle. Perhaps you would be good enough to provide us with an escort? He asked. Ha ha! The man gestured broadly, as if inviting his men to join the laughter, but they remained poised to shoot. An audacious one! I like that in a man. Perhaps you'll be allowed to hang onto a coin or two. Tristan felt a small measure of relief. These were bandits, and this encounter would certainly cost them money. But they were not soldiers, and thus were not likely to turn them over to the king's mercenaries. Still, this was no ragged band. The discipline shown by the bowmen was worthy of a veteran company of warriors, and they were supported by one or more magic users, as evidenced by the light spell. These men could be very dangerous, he was certain. Now, gentlemen, if you'll be good enough to hand over your purses, we can conclude this little interview. Don't be stingy now. Tristan saw Paldo scowling to his right, and he realized that the halfling was probably carrying a heavy pouch of coins. Neither the prince nor Dareth had much to lose by paying the bandits, but the halfling had no doubt assembled a tidy profit from his year-long endeavor. Then, too, Tristan remembered he had lifted a pouch from the officer of the Scarlet Guard. May I inquire, sir, whose coffers are being fattened by these ill-gotten gains? asked the prince. Ill-gotten? The bandit chief looked distressed. Sir, you wound me. Consider it a toll, if you will, a toll for keeping these paths free of the king's scum. Your contributions will go to the coppers of Hugh O'Rourke. That is, myself. The name meant nothing to Tristan. We are no friends of the king ourselves. We ride these forest paths expressly to avoid the scum you refer to. Could it be that you are fugitives? O'Rourke's expression was mildly curious. It could. In fact, we have a small pouch of the king's own gold that we would happily contribute to your cause in exchange for passage through your domain and perhaps information that may aid us in our mission. Hey! Paldo hissed. That's mine! You can't be still! Growled the prince out of the side of his mouth. Travelers with a mission, eh? Let us have a look at this pouch, and perhaps we can talk. My squire has it in his pack. Paldo. Pay the man. Muttering curses, Paldo drew forth the sack he had lifted from the officer's cabinet and tossed it to O'Rourke. As he did so, Tristan realized that they had never checked to see that the pouch contained gold. But the gilded metal was clearly visible in the bright light, and even some of the archers wavered their attention as the bandit ran a glittering stream into his hand. Very well, he said, smiling broadly through his red beard. You will enjoy our protection for a time. He looked at their weapons and apparently liked what he saw. It may be that there is a place for you among our band of cutthroats. His last remark worried Tristan more than anything else the bandit had said. The prince wondered if they would ever get the chance to leave. 
The wizard turned from the mirror and stalked angrily across the council chamber. His cool detachment had vanished the moment he had learned of the events in Llewellyn. The prince had escaped. Forcefully, Sindri brought his emotions under control. The sorcerer knew that only through calm reflection could he hope to devise an effective plan for dealing with the young upstart. Not until the prince was out of the way would Sindri have any opportunity to expand his own power. Already, Kaladir seemed too small, and Corwell was the logical next step in the wizard's dream of conquest. For a second, he wondered if the prophecy of Behal, warning of the danger inherent in the Prince of Corwell, had meant more than he suspected. Could it be that the prince was destined to defeat all of the council's plans? Of course not. Sindri knew that the young man had been very lucky several times, and that the assassin Rasvalo had failed him for the last time. The half-orc was marked for death, though this task must take a low priority than the slaying of the prince. There would be time enough to deal with the assassin. Cryfin! The wizard's command was spoken softly, and its target was sleeping soundly in a distant part of the castle. Nevertheless, within seconds, Cryphon had materialized beside his master. Cryphon's black eyebrows were raised inquiringly, and his tight, narrow face betrayed a look of interest as he waited for his master to explain the summons. The thin, black, beard encircling his jaw twitched nervously, and he licked his thin, almost non-existent lips. Cryphon, our friend Rasfallow has failed us again. We shall have to take matters into our own hands. Yes, master, the young mage said. He tried unsuccessfully to conceal a thin smile of anticipation. Absently, he stroked one of the bright diamond brooches he was prone to wearing on his robe. The prince escaped from the scarlet guard in the wellin, so you should start there. I shall continue to seek him in the mirror. When I find him, I will let you know where he is. I should like to take Doric with me. Her powers can be a great asset in a task like this. Cryphon said. Indeed, agreed Sindri, although he looked carefully at his subordinate. I sense it is more than her fire magic that you want. Very well, Dork shall accompany you. But Cryphon, Sindri added. His voice was very quiet. Master? The wizard met Sindri's gaze evenly, but his heart chilled at the look in those pale blue eyes. Take care that you do not fail me as well. Chapter 11 Dawn Castle The exhilaration of flight lasted all too briefly. Robin quickly gained control of her avion body, soaring and gliding on currents of wind. She observed that while Jenna climbed with little effort, she herself was forced to flap her wings steadily in order to gain altitude. Gradually, she saw how the great druid took advantage of every rising eddy of air, and she was able to copy the movements of her teacher. She delighted in the sensation of flight. But then she looked down. They had flown miles in the few moments since taking wing, or so it seemed to the young druid. And now they saw before them, trailing off into the hazy distance, a brown pathway of blight and decay. Dead trees stood barren, their leaves gone. The grass across a wide belt had withered to brown. Even the air grew heavy with the foul stink of rot. 
The route of the army was easy to see, for they had murdered the land as they moved. The swath crept northward, and Robin could see that its path took it directly toward the great druid's grove and the moon well. Directly below them, hundreds of tiny figures crawled methodically forward. Even from this height, she could see the inhuman nature of the creatures. The skeletons gleamed a ghastly white against the withered ground. All the undead moved with a lurching, shambling gait that reminded her vividly of the zombie that had attacked her in the grove. The spirit of the forest itself seemed to cry out in agony as the undead advanced, stretching the boundaries of the wasteland, moving ever northward. Robin watched hundreds of remarkably human-like figures plod purposefully northward. Her keen eye saw several huge forms among them, and she bristled at the sight of the furbolg bodies. The army entered a grove of quaking aspens, their white trunks and silvery leaves glistening brightly in the sunlight. Horrified, she saw the leaves turn brown and fall like a blizzard of dead snow. The white bark turned brown and curled away from the trees. The grove seemed to sigh sadly as it died. Thick fumes rose into the air, threatening to gag Robin. The stink of the bodies, the stink of death that arose from the land itself, made the air both heavy and poisonous. She swirled through the foul stuff, seeking a breath of freshness, but there was none to be had. As the army moved on, it left the grove barren and defiled. Robin saw Jenna tuck her wings and plummet toward the earth. In another moment, she did the same, falling with dizzying rapidity. She spread her wings desperately as the ground rushed toward her, surprising herself by gliding quickly forward. She had to circle to land beside the great druid, a half mile from the army of the undead and directly in its path. The rocky knoll Jenna had chosen came up fast, and Robin twisted desperately to avoid a thrusting boulder that threatened to end her flight abruptly. The air slipped from beneath her wings, and she crashed heavily to the ground, feeling a sharp pain in her left wing. Slowing her breathing, she willed her body to become her own again. She was certain that her arm was broken— but as she stretched and grew, the pain in her limb vanished, and she felt a smooth transition back to her human form. She once again held her staff in her hand and slowly climbed to her feet. Jenna, too, had changed to human form and now stood looking to the south. Robin saw that the great druid had selected a rounded, rocky hilltop, almost barren of trees. The undead would be slowed by the rugged ground, and the spells of the druids would be unlikely to do serious harm to the forest here. Remember, said Jenna, do not use your staff unless it becomes absolutely essential. Its powers are best held for our final defense. Our goal tonight is to delay and harass. And when we have delayed them, then we escape. You are to change upon my signal. When you have done so, I will follow. We must then return to the grove with all possible haste. Jenna turned to the south and Robin followed her teacher's gaze. Gradually, through the widely spaced trunks of the oaks that spread away from the base of the hill, they began to see the vanguard of the horrible force. 